Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The story I bring you is one of the most curious I've ever encountered. For what happened to pretty little Amy Prentice shouldn't happen to, well, to you. Put yourself in Amy's place. You arrive one day at the home of the fiancé, Jack Morton, and... Jack. Jack, darling, I'm here. I beg your pardon? I'm here. I, I mean, here I am. You're here, all right, but who are you? Who am I? Look, if you're some kind of saleswoman, Jack, you're really not... please. Please stop kidding. I'm Amy. Amy Prentice. Your fiancé. You're crazy. That's what you are. I've never seen you or heard of you in my life. Our mystery drama, The Bride That Wasn't was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Janet Waldo and Anne Seymour. We've all had odd, unexplainable things happen to us. Sometimes we put them down to tricks of memory, a curious combination of circumstances, or an occurrence that was simply inexplicable, and have then dismissed them from our minds. Perhaps Amy Prentice should have done that, but alas, didn't, when she arrived at the home of her fiancé, Jack Morton, all set to get married, only to have Jack tell her, I've never seen you or heard of you in my life. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Now, wait just you a minute. You heard me, sister. Beat it. Sister? Beat it? Jack Morton, I don't know what this is all about, what but... What is it, Jack? What's wrong? Yes, what seems to be the trouble? Well, this girl claims she knows me. Claims I know you. We're engaged. Engaged to be married. Married? Oh, my dear young lady, you're suffering from some sort of delusion. You bat or you're playing some sort of game. Now, you just get along out of here. Oh, now, now, mother. I mean it, Florence. I'll call the police if she doesn't. No. The poor girl, whatever her problem, looks terribly tired. You'd be tired, too, if you'd come all the way from Midvale in a day coach. Come in. And... Come in and at least have a cup of tea. Oh, I don't think so. Not now. Not after this reception I just got. Well, that's just fine with us. Take off. Jack, how can you act this way? Oh, honey, I don't know what this is all about, but you come on in and have a cup of tea with no. us. No. You get out of here. Go away or I'll call the police. Now, Mother, you know you'll do no such thing. This young woman is obviously in some sort of trouble. And it's up to us to help her if we can. Jack, you pick up her bag and bring it in. And, honey, you come on along with me. I... I, I don't know. Oh, I... nonsense. Come on, dear. All right, Jack, bring the suitcase. Close the door. And now let's all go into the dining room and have some tea. You too, Jack. And you, Mother. Now, what's your name, honey? Amy. Amy Prentice. Well, you sit right there, Amy, and I'll pour tea, and you tell us what this is all about. Tell you... We... You, you act... You all act as if you'd never heard of me. We haven't. Anyway, I haven't. This is some kind of trick. Confidence game. Mother, you... please. Here we are, honey. Nice cup of tea. Now, there's milk and sugar right there if you want them. And a plate of cookies. Now, let me introduce ourselves to begin with. This is Mother Morton, Jack's, that's him, Jack's mother. And I'm Florence Morton, his wife. Wife? Yes, dear. So, you see, you're thinking he's your fiancé. Well, you see, that just can't be so. Is she your wife? Of course she is. Let me tell you once again, I don't know you. I never saw you before in my life. You, you did. You did. We met just two weeks ago at the conference at State Teachers College. Now, what in blazes would I be doing at a teacher's college? Well, you're an English.
English teacher, aren't you? English teacher, my foot. I'm an insurance salesman. But you can't be. You can't be. Uh, unless you don't have a twin brother or, or a double or something. No, Amy, he doesn't. Yes, she very well knows. Mother, Amy, why don't you tell us what you think this is all about? I mean, start at the beginning and, well, tell us the whole story. Perhaps we can help in, I don't know, in some way. But he knows what happened. Whether he... he does or not, you just tell us in your own words. Well, I'm an English teacher at Midvale High School. And I attended the conference of English teachers at State Teachers two weeks ago. On the third day, when I was having lunch in the cafeteria... Look, excuse me, uh, there, there seems to be a shortage of tables. Do you mind if I sit down here? No, no, of course not. Please. Thanks. I'll just put my tray down here. There we are. Or rather, here I am. <laughs> uh, my name's Mort, Jack Morton. Amy Prentice. Where are you from? Midvale. Newark. High school English. You know, Chaucer, Shakespeare, and all that. <laughs> well, we, um... Have a lot in common. Mm hmm. Including food. I see you got a BLT on whole wheat, toasted. <laughs> you too. <laughs> uh, mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. <laughs> hey, are you uh, enjoying the conference? Oh, yes and no. Well, what's the no part? Well, quite honestly, I, I, I don't go for some of the new teaching methods they're recommending. Yeah. Like letting your students read what they want to read instead of holding them to the curriculum. You too? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a lot in common. Yeah, I should say we do. Sure glad I asked to sit at your table. Uh, so am I. Uh, Amy, uh, do you mind if I call you Amy? <laughs> no. And you call me Jack, okay? <laughs> All right, Jack. Well, uh... What I was going to say, it, it's kind of early to ask you for a date, but... Well, look, the barbecue tonight. I'm not looking forward to going alone, and I sort of wondered... I wasn't looking forward to it either, for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about two minds with but a single thought, two hearts that beat as one. Well, how about it? How about what? Going to the barbecue with me. Look, the steak is going to be New York cut, my favorite. Oh, mine too. I'd love to. It's a date then, Amy? It's a date, Jack. And that was our first date. We saw each other from then on every chance we got every day. And just before the end of the conference, Jack asked me... Jack, you know you did. You, you asked me to marry you. Look, will you make sense? I'm married to Florence. I've been married to her for ten years. Would I ask you or anyone else to marry me? But you did. What do you think I'm doing here? We we arranged for me to come today to meet your mother and, and stay here till we got married over the weekend. What? This is the engagement ring you gave me. Now, wait a minute. Cool it, lady. You could have gotten that anywhere. You could have bought it yourself. Amy, I know you're sincere in thinking you met Jack at that conference and that he asked you to marry him, but, well, it's a, it's got to be some sort of delusion. If it is, how did I know his name and address? That you could have got out of any phone book. I don't care what you say, Florence. This girl is playing some kind of game. I don't think so, Mother. I think she really believes what she says. I believe it because it happened. No, Amy, as I say, it's some sort of delusion. Is the Rose Garden a delusion? Yeah. The, the Rose Garden? Your Rose Garden, Mrs. Morton. Jack told me you love roses... And that you're an expert at growing them. That you even exhibit them and have won prizes. Is that true? Well, yes, but... That window there, that, that picture window, do, does it look out on the backyard where the rose garden is? Why, good heavens, it does, yes. I'll describe it for you. Just as Jack described it for me. There's, there's a brick walk down the center, dividing the yard in half. You enter the walk through a white trellis that's covered with red and white roses. At the far end of the walk, there's a tall French fence to screen you from the neighbors. And in front of the fence, there's a fountain with a large statue of the god Pan. Is that right? Perfectly. It's unbelievable. I don't see anything unbelievable about it. 
She could have gone out back and looked at my garden before she rang the front bell. Well, yes, that is true. How would I know that Jack's mother exhibits her roses, wins prizes? Oh, that's true, too, Mother. Well, there are plenty of ways she could have found out. Name one. You just named me one. I could name you half a dozen. You could have asked questions around the neighborhood. And there is a record book of prize winners with stories of their backgrounds, their lives. You could have just made an educated guess. You Personally, I don't think this poor child did any of those things. Then you explain how she knows. I can't. No more than she can. I have. Jack told me about that garden and all about his mother, but... Well, it, it doesn't matter now. Well, what do you mean, Amy? I mean, I don't understand it, but obviously Jack doesn't want to marry me. Can't marry me. And regardless of what I think, what I believed happened, and it did, I know it did. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, where are you going? Back where I came from, of course, Midvale. Thanks for the tea. I'll be happy to take your bag to the well, door. Now, just and... one minute, just one minute. Amy, you can't go back to Midvale today. Why not? There's only one train from Newark to Midvale. I happen to know because I have a friend I visit in the asylum there. And that leaves at 9.30 in the morning. Well, I'll stay somewhere. At a hotel. You do no such thing. You'll spend the night here. With us. I can't have that. I won't have it, Florence. I'm not letting some tricky little character like her stay the night under my roof. Mother, we can't put her out. That simply wouldn't be decent. Human. No, I insist. She's got to spend the night, have a good, refreshing sleep. And then I'll drive her to the station after breakfast in the morning. I, I, I really can't put you out like this. Not another word, Amy. I won't take no for an answer. Now, let me show you to the guest room. Bring her suitcase, Jack. Okay. You come along, too, Mother. You don't need me. Oh, yes, we do. What for? Why, uh, I think it's going to be a chilly night. And you know where the extra blankets are. So do you, Florence. Please. Come on, Mom. I'm... I, I'm really sorry to bother you like this. And, uh, look, you, you needn't trouble about an extra blanket. The weather's warm, really. Here we are. Oh, wait. Wait, before you open the door. Yes? Jack described the room where I'd be staying, the, the guest room. I can tell you exactly what it looks like. Oh, you couldn't possibly. There's a big dormer window, like all old houses have, and, and chintz curtains. Good heavens. A big easy chair with an ottoman. The bed has a canopy, and the rug, it's a woven rug, oval, with a design of roses. But this is, this is incredible. Oh, Jack, you didn't meet Amy at State Teachers, did you? You didn't propose marriage? Oh, come off it, Florence. Well, this is the strangest thing, because... Well, Amy, you've described the room perfectly. Now, here, see for yourself. Yes. Just as Jack described it. Well, there's no understanding this. I, I, I just can't fathom it. You must have second sight. Or something. No, I... No more talk now. You're tired and upset. And what you need is a good nap. Dinner won't be for several hours. I'll call you when it's ready. Thank you. And you can look forward to dinner. We're having steak. New York cut, no less. Jack adores steak. New York cut. Amy. Jack. Quiet, I said. Just listen to me, darling. Darling? The dearest, most darling girl in the world. But I... Look, there's no time to explain. It's two o'clock in the morning, and I've got to get you out of here fast. I, I can't take a chance on my wife waking up and finding me gone. You are married. Florence is your wife. Yes, but we did meet, you and I, and I do love you and want to marry you. Oh, marry me when you're already married? Please, stop talking. Get this robe on. We've got to move fast. I... Where are we going? Out of this house. In Robin's slippers? Look, I'll explain later. Come on now, let's go. Where? Go where, Jack? Florence. Your wife, standing in the doorway. And, 
Jack's in her hand. Oh, Jack. Jack, what does this mean? What indeed does it mean? Why does Jack want to get Amy out of that house as fast as he can? What is Florence, his wife, doing with an axe in her hand? One thing is virtually sure. However incredible events for Amy have been up to now, they are as nothing to what lies ahead. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. G.K. Chesterton was fond of saying that an adventure was merely an inconvenience viewed in the right light. Perhaps then, one may say that the incredible is merely the credible viewed in the wrong light. However that may be, to come to the home of a man you expect to marry and to discover him already married, and on top of that, to find yourself facing his wife at two in the morning with an axe in her hand. Really, Amy? Mother was right about you after all. You are playing tricks. Oh, no. No, I, I assure then you... Then what I... is my husband doing in your room at two o'clock in the morning and you in your nightgown? I, I, I can explain. Do that, Jack. Please do. First, give me the axe, Florence. Tempted to ask where you'd like it. Just explain your presence in Amy's room, Jack. Well, I, I thought I heard her cry out. I thought she might be in trouble. I, I came to see if she was all right. It's just a nightmare, Florence. I, I had a nightmare. That's hardly surprising with all you've been through. Well, I, I guess so. Could I have the axe now, Florence? Oh, of course. Here. You see, I heard you cry out too, Amy. You, you did? Yes. And I thought there might be an intruder in the house. Burglar, something like that. You keep an axe in your bedroom? Well, it's an old house. Very old. Our bedroom, Jack's and mine, has a fireplace in it. We keep a small supply of wood there. And sometimes it has to be split. You didn't think I was going to chop you, did you? No. I... Well, Jack and I will go back to our bedroom now. Come, Jack. Oh, and Amy. Yes? Try not to have any more... Nightmares. The more toast and marmalade, Amy. Oh, thank, thank you. No coffee. Then. No. Uh, frankly, I'm I'm anxious to get started. Get get that train for Midvale. I I don't want to miss it. You won't miss it. Plenty of time. Well, there really isn't, Florence. There's just under half an hour, and it takes fifteen minutes to reach the station. I know. I know. So, uh, I, I think we'd better get started, Amy. Your bag's packed and in the hall. So let's go. You. Well, I'll drive her to the station. I was planning to do that. No, I'll do it. No, Jack, no. Waste of gas. I mean, waste. You take her or I take her. What's the waste? I have to go into town shopping to do for the weekend. And you don't. I see. I can do my shopping at the same time. Yes, I see. So that'll mean only one round trip instead of two. I said I see, Florence. Saves gas. Yes. Well, uh, if we're going to get started... Oh, but first you must see the Rose Garden. No, no, I... Oh, but I... yes. I mean, how can you even think of leaving without seeing it? In some unaccountable way, you do know what it looks like. But, well, if I were you, I'd want to see it for myself. But there, there isn't time. Of course there is. Take a moment. Let's all go to the Rose Garden. And aren't these lovely? Hybrid teas. Yes, but, uh, you know, time... And this rambler. Isn't it gorgeous? Yes. Well, yes, you're, you're certainly to be complimented, Mrs. Morton. Thank you. Oh, but this isn't her garden, you know. It's mine, really. But Jack said... Jack said. Jack couldn't have said anything. Now, could he? Since you didn't meet him till yesterday. Or did you? Did you meet her at State Teachers, Jack? I've told you I never saw her before in my life. Yes. But I've been thinking. You know how I am? Oh, it's thinking. Sometimes... My head aches terribly. Oh, please, uh, we're going to miss my train. I think about so many things. 
I know you take this rose garden. She gets the credit for it. Always has got the credit for it. But I'm the one who designed it, created it, planted it. Even your father had to admit it was beautiful, Jack. Remember? Yes. Oh, how that man hated me, reviled me, scorned me. But even he admitted that my rose garden was a thing of beauty. Florence, we've got to go. Now. If Amy's going to get her train. Yes. Oh, yes. But first, I wanted to see these Florabunda. Aren't they gorgeous? They are, yes. Note the deep, dark red of the blossoms. Very dark. Very deep red. Lovely. Do you know why? Uh, cultivation, I suppose. Blood. Blood? Mr. Morton's blood. Jack's father's blood. This is where we found him. Hacked to bits. Oh, Jack, easy, I Mom. Can't easy, Mom. His blood had Florence, poured Florence. onto the soil, into it, saturating it. Would you believe that before that day, these roses had been rather weak, skimpy, subject to all sorts of diseases? But afterwards, they'd literally burgeoned with health and beauty. Would you believe that? Now, look, whether I believe it or not, we can't stay here another second. Why not? My train, that's why not. The only daily train to Midvale. Are, are you deliberately trying to make me miss it? But of course not. What a thing to say. I only wanted you to see the Rose Garden. Well, now that I've seen it, let's go. Please. Whatever you say, whatever you say. Uh, I'll go along too, Florence. You, Mother? Whatever for? Some... Uh, shopping for myself. Well, why not? We'll all go together. You too, Jack. Well, no. I, I'll i stay here. <laughs> not a chance, Jack. Not a chance. Oh, excuse me, but uh, while we're doing all this talking, time is slipping by. I don't want to miss that train. Of course you don't. But before we go, I do want you to know, Amy, what a pleasure it's been having you stay with us. Thank you. Of course, you haven't enjoyed it. Poor dear. But never mind. You're sure to find a husband so attractive, so pretty. Could, could we go now? Come on. Come on, Jack, Mother, Amy, get in the car. We just have time to make the Midvale train. Luckily, as you see, Amy, the garage fronts on the street. Luckily. Well, we can drive right out into the street and not waste time. Drive right straight out. Yes. Now, if the garage was in the back of the house, waste time, a minute or two, and we don't have it to waste. Could could we get started? Oh, you are in a hurry. Well, you said yourself we don't have any time to spare. That's why you don't have to tell me. I I'm sorry. I should think you would be. Well, here we go. Something wrong? Damp, I guess. Suppose you let me drive, Florence. How can you drive, Mother, if the car won't start? Mm. By the time the spirit won't start. Look, I I'll get a taxi. By the time the taxi gets here, your call and everything, you'd miss the train. But uh, we're certainly not going to get anywhere this way. The battery's wearing down. Correction. It's worn down. Oh, no. Well, that means I'll never make the train to Midvale. Well, now, I resent that, Amy. You sound as if spending another night with us here would be most unpleasant to you. Oh, no. No, no, I, I didn't did mean... We did try to make everything as pleasant as possible for you. Back in the house, all. Look, uh, if I went down to the corner and got a cab... Amy, yes? do as Florence says. Of course, Jack. Of course. Out of the car. Back in the house, all. Oh, look. Uh, a taxi. A taxi pulling up right in front. Oh, Oh, good heavens, I, I forgot. Joe. Joe? Who's Joe? Oh, my brother. All the excitement and all, I, I forgot. He he was coming to give me away. Okay, driver, thanks. Oh, no, Joe, wait. Keep that cab. Driver, don't drive off. Wait. It's all right, driver. Go on. No, no, wait. Please, wait. Joe, hold that cab. Amy, Amy. What driver, in the world is... Driver, wait. Go on. Driver, go on. We don't need you. For criminy's sake, go stay. Go stay. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Amy. Oh, 
blaming him. Baby, sis, what is this? Oh, she's all upset. All upset. I'm Florence Morton. How do you do? Oh, uh, Joe Prentice, Amy's brother. <gasps> Amy, Amy, what's... what? You understand, Joe. I may call you Joe. Oh, yeah, yeah. But... Amy's all upset. You know how it is getting married for the first time. Nerves. <laughs> oh, sure. Joe! You Jack Morton? Yes, I am. Ah, oh, glad to meet you, Jack. Great pleasure. And you're, uh, Jack's sister, huh? She's Let's all my... go into the house. Come on now, come on. Have you had breakfast, Joe? I have something on the train. Well, you want more than that. Eggs, bacon, toast, and marmalade, hot coffee. In the house, everybody. No, no. Amy, in the house. Amy, what's going on here? You're all acting like... Well, I, I don't know. You're... Wedding plans, Joe. Wedding plans. Everybody uptight. You understand. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, Florence, is it? Florence. Everybody in. Everybody in. Well, now, here we are. All together once again. Joe. Yeah, Amy? Joe, there's something crazy going on in this house. Something real crazy. Now, Amy, honey. Joe. Joe, listen to me. There's something wrong. I don't know what it's all about. I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but Jack says he never saw me before in his life. What? And never proposed marriage to me, and then he did. And she, her, his wife, she came to my bedroom with an act in Hold her it, hand. for Jiminy's sake. Hold it. Amy, you're not making sense. Oh, I know I'm not, because what's happening here, what, what, what's happened to me, it doesn't make sense Look, either. will somebody explain this? I'll explain it. Mr. Prentice, Joe. A mistake of some kind has been made. A mistake? Your sister, she... Well, I, I haven't wanted to spell this out in so many words, but since you're here now and can take care of her... Joe, I'm afraid your sister is crazy. You're afraid my sister is crazy? Well, she... She came here yesterday afternoon, arrived just out of the blue, out of nowhere, saying she'd come to... Marry my husband. You don't mean him? Yes, him. Jack. My husband. He's your... My husband, Jack, yes. Somehow your sister has got into her head that they met at teacher's conference. And he proposed marriage, but... Well, it's ridiculous. You, Jack. You say you never met Amy? No. Jack. Last night in my room, Now, hold said... it, Amy. Just hold it. Let me try to get this thing straight. You didn't meet her at a teacher's conference? State teacher's college? Not me. I'm an insurance salesman. This is plain screwy. Amy, if you say you met him and he asked you to marry him, I say you met him and he asked you to marry him. But he says... I that... never saw her, talked to her, knew anything about her until she arrived here yesterday. I see. Well, either you're a liar, Mr. Morton, or you're crazy. If anybody around here has lost his marbles, you have, not her. Now, Amy, what do you want to do about this? I just want to get out of here. And that's what we'll do. Where's the phone? Over there, but I'm afraid Let you're... me just call a cab and we'll blow. You can't. You going to stop me? The phone's out of order. Now, we'll see about that. That's dead all right. No wonder. The wire's been pulled out of the box on the wall. Now, what is going on here? Who pulled those wires out of the box and why? Come on, damn it, answer me. Who and why? You're like Jack's father, all male. He was a Taurus, a bull. Strong, masculine, like you. He thought, like you. What are you, some women's liver? I'm me, I'm Florence Morton. And I don't take anything from you or anybody else. His father learned that the hard way. What do you mean, the hard way? She killed him with an axe. Killed him. Killed him. Hacked him to pieces. He had to be killed. I certainly wasn't going to live out my life with him dominating me. Stupid, he called me. Stupid. Like that. One day I said to him, you call me stupid once more and I'll kill you. We're in the garden. Maybe you notice there's a wood pile in one corner, Amy. Yes. And there was this axe he used for splitting wood. You know what he did? No. Guess. Please. He picked up the axe and handed it to me. Go ahead, he said. Kill me, stupid. 
Was he surprised? Hacked him to bits. <laughs> to bits. Amy, come on. We're getting out of here. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Amy. Goodbye. This door's locked. It's bolted on the inside. Oh, I thought you knew. You didn't see me bolt and lock it when we came in? All right, give me the key. So you can unlock it? What else? Uh-uh. Now look, you... Joe, please, don't cross her. Please, don't cross her. She'll kill us all. Joe, Joe... Take it easy, Amy. We're not dead yet. Not yet, Joe. Not quite yet. Ever been face to face with a homicidal maniac? With everything stacked against you? Happily, I never have, and hope you never have either. But Amy and Joe are. And so are Jack and his mother. What I can't figure out is why Jack, with a homicidal wife at home, ever proposed marriage to Amy. Well, We'll have the answer to that when I return shortly with Act Three. Terror can be a thing so palpable you can feel it. Clammy to your touch. Ice cold in your veins. A taste of brass in your mouth. Certainly, this is what Amy Prentice feels, along with the Mortons and her brother Joe, as Florence Morton makes all too clear the fact that they are not going to leave the old house on Hilliard Street alive. Look, Florence, I don't get any of this. I don't get any of it except all this hate you got in you. You can't blame my sister for it, and you can't blame me. So we're leaving now. No. Joe, she's got a gun. I can see that, Amy. Question is, will she use it? Yes, yeah, she'll use it all right. You better understand something, Joe. She's a killer, a homicidal maniac. Then what the hell is she doing here? Why isn't she in an asylum? She was. She escaped just a day before I got back from the teacher's conference. Jack! Amy, I am sorry. So sorry. I pretended I'd never seen you before, tried to get you to leave before you set foot in this house because Florence was right there behind me all the time and I knew she'd kill you sooner or later. Kill you. Nine years. Nine long years. They kept me in that place. But I knew. I always knew someday I'd get out. But, Jack, if you're married to her... No, I'm not. Not anymore. I had the marriage annulled a year ago. The authorities agreed Florence would never be cured. So where are these authorities now? Didn't they figure she'd head straight for this house? They telephoned to let me know she'd escaped. Asked me to notify them if she did come here. And all the time I was talking on the phone, she had a gun against my head. You're going to die. You're all going to die. Not if I can help it, lady. You can't help it. There isn't a thing you can do. We'll see about that. One thing I don't believe in is just standing here waiting for you to kill us. Me, I fight fire with fire. Oh? And just how do you think you... Fight fire with fire? Fire! Oh, Florence, what do you think? Be quiet, saying? Jack. I'm thinking, thinking. Fire. Fire. You know, Joe, you've given me the idea I was looking for. I gave you... I've been wondering how to kill you all, all at once. And now I know. Into the kitchen. What for? You see, Mother. Into the kitchen, all. And now, Jack. Dear, loving husband, open the cellar door. You're taking us down to the cellar? Putting you down in the cellar, Jack. Open the door. Now, down into the cellar with you. You lead the way, Jack. Look, Florence. Don't you... argue, Jack. Just go. No, we're not... <laughs> My leg. You all right? Oh, Joe. If you may Joe. be able to fight fire, Joe, but you can't fight bullets. Oh. Now, Amy, help your brother down into the cellar. Oh, Joe. Take, take it easy. Oh. oh pain is... You're bleeding. I'll be okay. Oh. She hit me in the side. Fleshy part. Oh. You better let me have a look at that wound, Joe, okay? Okay. Oh. Let him bleed to death, Jack. 
It'll be easier for him. <laughs> Sorry I can't make it easier for you all. Oh, oh, she's locked us in down here. Is there another door? No, there's not even a window. We're trapped. Absolutely no way out. Is there any way of breaking that door down? Prying it open. Oh, no, Joe, this is an old house. It's built when they really build them. Break that door down. No way. Oh. Look, try, try to hold still. It's it's not that bad, but it's bleeding quite a lot. I've got to stop the bleeding. Look, Amy. Yes, dear. Just around that corner, you'll find a desk. A uh, uh, desk? Yeah, I have my office set up there. Oh. In the bottom drawer on the right, you'll find a first aid kit. Now, bring it here, will you? Yes. yes. Oh, Jack. Jack, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of here? Mom, if I had the answer to that. Jack, there's a telephone here on, on your desk. Yeah, with the wires pulled out of the wall box. Florence didn't miss a trick. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, they are pulled out. Look, hurry with that first aid kit. Here it is, Jack. Here. Thanks. Have you patched up in a jiffy, Joe? Though, much good it'll do you, I'm afraid. Don't lose your nerve. Me, I've been in worse binds than this. Vietnam, for one. My work, for another. What do you do, Joe? I'm a cop. New York City Police Force. Man, I've been in spots that make this look like... Hey, wait. She's up there. That's not the kitchen. No, it's the living room, right above us. <gasps> what was that? She put something down on the floor, something <gasps> heavy and made of metal. What could it be, Jack? I don't know, unless it's... Wait a minute. What, Jack? What? Uh, metal? Fire? I, I keep a can of gasoline in the garage for the lawnmower. How big a can? Two gallons. Was it full? I'm afraid so, and I'm afraid I'm right. I smell gasoline. Oh, it's dripping down through the floorboards above us. She's going to set the house on fire. She's going to burn it down around our heads. And kill herself, the poor crazy woman. Florence! Florence, listen to me! Florence, you'll kill yourself! Strike a match and the gasoline fumes, the fumes, Florence, they'll explode. You're right. She lights that stuff. She'll never get out alive. Florence, will you listen? Will you please listen? Oh, oh God, she's done it. The house this old. It'll go up like a haystack, a dry haystack. It's all going to die. First alive. Oh, no. We gotta try that door. We gotta see when we break it down. Jack, give me a hand. We'll both get our shoulders against it. When I give the word. What? What? Let's forget it. The door's hot already. Flames on the other side. <coughs> Even if we got it open, we'd never get out. There's gotta be something we can do. It's got to be. What are the neighbors? Neighbors? Well, they'll see the house burning, call the fire department. Well, what could let to us? They'll rescue us. Get us out of no, here. Amy, honey, they don't know we're down here. Oh. Oh. Wait a minute. There's one chance. Just one chance. What, Joe? The telephone. No, no, no. I told you. Florence pulled the wires out of the wall box. We gotta see can we connect them again. You think you can? Or do you? Jack. Uh. What? Thank God you set up your office down here with a phone. Uh. If we can reconnect those wires. Let's get this wall box open. You got any tools down here? Yeah. Top door of my desk. One of those little kits. Here. What do you want? <coughs> oh. Screw yeah, here you go. <coughs> Now, oh. get this lid open. Right. Easy, easy. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, right. hurry, Joe, hurry. Yeah, yeah. off of the lid. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, no. What, what? Three wires. Red, blue, and green. Three poles to attach them with. So attach them. Yeah, but which wire to which pole? Oh, it's Joe, 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 try something. What do you think I'm doing? Let's see. Red to this pole. Blue to this one. Green here. All right, see if you can get a dial to him. Got nothing. Try again. Joe, move it. Let's see. Put the red here. Blue. There. Green on this pole. Okay. Anything, Jack? <laughs> That's it. That's it. I got a dial tone. Well, use it. Get the operator. This is your operator. May I help you? Operator, I'm calling from a burning house. 37 Hilliard Street. <laughs> the fire department's just arriving, but they don't know. We're in the cellar. We're in the cellar. Stand 
Right. Amy. What? Here. Oh. Fire chief just gave me another thermos of coffee. Have some more. Oh, thanks, Jack. Joe? I've got Joe in the ambulance unit over there. Oh. They're really patching up his leg. Isn't he wonderful? I-, I think I've got the most wonderful brother in the world. Well, I think he's got the most wonderful sister in the world. I'm, I'm sorry about Florence. Lord knows I am, too, but it's better this way. Mom, Mom, are you okay? Even the rose garden's gone. The heat killed everything. Maybe that's better, too, Mom. Oh, how could it be? How? I'm going to see to it you have another house, another rose garden, without the memories that went with this one. Memories we're all going to do our best to forget. So, what began as mystery, created by Florence Morton, ended as tragedy for Florence Morton. And uh, perhaps for the best, as Jack said. She is at peace now, and if in death she has not found a better world, as we very much hope she has, she's at least out of this one, which brought her so much unhappiness. I'll be back shortly. Jack and Amy Morton are happily married now. Amy no longer teaches, at least not in school, because she has two youngsters to keep her more than busy. The boy is named Joe. The girl, Florence. As for Mother Morton, she has another garden. But not roses, vegetables. Well, everything costs so much these days. Our cast included Janet Waldo, Ann Seymour, Lorene Tuttle, Bill Quinn, and Bernard Barrow. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The Couple Next Door, written by Peg Lynch and starring Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce. Even if you brush in a rush, new Brisk toothpaste starts instant action against tooth decay. Brisk helps protect you from decay, starts instant action right away. Even if you brush in a rush, Brisk fluoride toothpaste. The instant it touches your teeth, Brisk toothpaste starts to destroy most bacteria that cause tooth decay and mouth odor. So even if you brush in a rush, use Brisk, B-R-I-S-K, new Brisk toothpaste. Come on, honey, come on. Will you stop yelling at me? I'm never going to be ready if you don't stop yelling. Well, hurry up. For Pete's sake, that wedding will be over and the reception, too. Tom and Helen will be back from their honeymoon before we even get to the church. Oh, what is your mother doing up there? Putting on nail polish. Oh. 
Look, there's no point in going at all if we don't leave right away. Did you hear what I said? Get Betsy dressed in her snowsuit. Now, we're dropping her off at the Cunninghams. She needs her snow pants and her jacket, fasten on the hood and put a sweater on underneath and a scarf around her neck. Now, she needs heavy socks over her shoes because she'll be playing in the snow. And don't forget two pair of mittens and her overshoes. Oh, all right, all right. Look, will you step on it? Golly, if once, just once, we could go somewhere and be on time. <laughs> Got your throat, got your coat. There's a simple way to relieve it. Get a box of candies, pleasant tasting candies. Try one and you'll believe it. So let us scratch your throat, get your coat, get can get. Yes, in seconds, delicious orange-flavored candets go to work to stop pain of a raw, irritated throat, while two tested wonder drugs begin killing throat germs on contact. No other throat medication gives you this amazing modern candet formula. It eases, it soothes, it brings astonishing relief almost instantly. So next time your throat is raw and inflamed, get fast-acting candets and get relief. Don't let a scratchy throat get your coat, get... Can, get. Yell at your mother to come on, will you? I'm hoarse. Mommy, come on! I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Honestly, I cannot figure women out. You have had all day to get ready. Now, just what have you been doing? I cleaned the house. I did some washing. I did some ironing. I mended your shirt. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. That's what I've been doing all day. All right, all right, all right. Are you ready now? No, I'm not ready. I've got to change purses, put things in my blue purse. Did you get my coat out? Yes, yes, right here. My hair looks terrible with you yelling at me every two seconds. I rush like mad. I just feel half put together. You look fine. You look lovely. Come on, now, come on. Get your coat on here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Stop it. Now, just stop it, Well, look, there is poor Betsy so bundled up to the teeth she can hardly move. I'm well, you just have to wait, that's all. Your mother isn't ready. Oh, I didn't put any lipstick on, either. Oh, well, can't you put it on in the car? Yes, yes, I guess so. All right, yeah. I'm ready. Come on. Coat, 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 coat. I can't believe it. You mean you are finally ready? Yes, yes, come on. You going to zip up your skirt? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, well, what's uh, the matter? Well, it's stuck, wouldn't you know? Oh, yeah. Well, let me have it. No, let no, me no, help wait, you. no, let wait, me wait, wait, let wait. Me, no, Will you let yeah. me do well, it? Don't rip it now. I, there? I, I, all right, all right. Uh, well... Oh, I can't get it. I, look, let it go, let it go. Just keep your coat on. It won't show. Well, I can't have my skirt falling off in church. Well, get a safety oh, pin. Oh, safety pin. We're going to reception afterwards. I'll have to take my coat off. Let's go. I'm hot. Yeah, well, let me try it again. Let oh, me don't try rip it, it now. No, don't no. Don't rip it, just, dear. Well, you hold still. Just hold still. Dear? Uh, I got it. I got it. Something I got ripped. It. Well, all right. I got it anyhow. Oh, it's my good slip, too. Why is it zippers never stick unless you're in a hurry? Now, my coat. Yeah, coat, here, coat, here, coat. here. Come on. Let's here. Go. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Come on. Yes, dear. Well, they're not even here. Who? Elsa and Chuck. I thought they were outside waiting. That's why you were yelling at me. Thought we were going in our car. No, Elsa and Chuck are picking us up. Well, Honestly, you get so excited. Now relax. Elsa's never late to anything. You know that. Betsy, come on back in. Come on. Why? We're waiting for the Hutchinsons, dear. Gally, she waddles in that snowsuit like some man from Mars. Isn't that too big or something? Well, she's got to get at least two years out of things. Now sit on the hall bench, Betsy. We'll leave in a minute. Uh, <sighs> you look nice. Well, me, do oh, I? Yeah, very handsome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my hair looks just awful. None of your hair looks very nice. I don't think so. Yes. Where do you suppose they are? Well, they'll get here. Honestly, every time we go to a wedding, you get so nervous, you think you were the bridegroom. Yeah, well, I know how I feel. What do you mean? Trapped. What? Oh, honey, I, I just teased you. Ah, no, you're not. I felt that way, too. I didn't want to marry you that morning. <laughs> I didn't. I remember driving to the church, and I thought, oh, I don't want to marry him. I don't even know him. You've known me for two years. What do you mean you didn't want to marry me? <laughs> Let's go! Yeah, very soon. We will, dear. Look, I went to a lot of trouble chasing after you and taking you away from that, 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 what's his name? Claude. That Claude. Boy, what a dope. <laughs> oh, he had a convertible. Yeah, but I was cuter. Yes, <laughs> you were, as a matter of fact. Now, just stop that. Now, Mr. Pete, look, she is so bundled up. Do you want to go outside, Betsy? No. 
Well, let me undo you a little bit then. Come here. Come here to Mommy. Well, I'm Come just on. sitting here. Shall I shall I call them and see if they've started? All right, Ken, if you want to. Yeah, what's their number? Primrose uh, 7886. Now, you can take your mittens off too, sweetie. Primrose 7886, please. Ask Elsa what she's wearing. I'm most certainly not going to ask Elsa what she's wearing. Have you race upstairs and start changing? Mm. Nobody answers. Well, they're probably on their way. Oh, I don't know why we don't go in our car anyhow. When you go somewhere like this with other people, you're always at their beck and call. you got to leave when they want to leave. You know Chuck. He always wants to stay until the last dog is hung. Well, since we're going to a wedding, I hardly think that's an appropriate expression, dear. <laughs> Nobody answers. Mm-hmm. I'm hot. I want a drink. Oh, honestly, would you get her one, dear? I want to put my lipstick on her. Yeah. Uh, what the heck? What What'd you... What did you have on this chair? What's the matter? I sat in something. In what? I don't know what. It, 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 well, turn it's around. Gold. Turn around. Let me look. Oh, oh, honest. What have I told you, young lady? I just want what to is like it? bubble gum. Bubble gum? Now, Betsy, what has Mother told you? Look bubble at the seat gum? of Daddy's pants. Haven't I told you time? Never time mind again. that. Now, get the stuff off. Well, with what? What takes gum off? I don't know what takes... Oh, look at that. Well, where's that book on household hints? Oh. Tell us about removing spots and stains and things. Well, look for it, will you? My oh, golly. What does she do? Chew five sticks at a time? Here it is. Here's the book. Now, just a minute. I suppose uh, any minute they'll arrive and start honking. But I'll tell you this much, young lady. If you put bubble gum on the furniture one oh, more I time... I didn't put the bubble gum on the chair. If you didn't, who did? Uh, I don't know. Probably the fairies. Yeah, the fairies. Why is it the fairies get blamed for everything that happens around here lately? They're naughty. I tell them to be nice, Daddy, but they want to be naughty. Ah, uh, just let me tell you One something, young... One is supposed to encourage the imagination. Well, I'm going to encourage more than the imagination around here. I'll tell oh, you Oh, wait a minute. Here, I hear you. Here, here, I've got the book now. Household hints. How to repair loose plaster, no, insulation, no. how to paint a radiator. Oh, but give it to you. Well, just a second. Well, well, you're stain and spot removal. Iodine, fingernail polish, oh. ink, bar- chewing gum, chewing gum. Here we are. Yeah, yeah. all right, all right. What's it say? What's it say? Removed by soaking with carbon tetra... tetra uh, carbon tetrachloride. Tetra that's cleaning fluid. No, we don't have a speck. We don't. I meant oh. to get some. I put it on the... Li- we have turpentine. I can't go to a wedding smelling of turpentine. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It says here also, chewing gum, if stuck to cloth, can be removed... By holding a piece of ice against it for a few seconds, this makes the gum brittle, and you can scrape it off with a knife. Ice cubes. We need ice cubes. Oh, well, That's what we need. Well, uh, well, there they are, and you're not ready. Yeah, I, I like that. I'm not ready. When you're not, are you? Get the ice cubes out. Go on, dear. We'll be on as soon as we can. He sat in some gum. <laughs> no hurry. Right, you want to go out and get in the car, Betsy, with him? No, I want to stay with you. All right, come on out the kitchen. Oh. Get the ice what? cubes out. What when you're in a hurry? It's What's the trouble? No ice tray. They're all stuck. Try the bottom one. That's usually easier. <laughs> I didn't get a drink of water. Oh. Just wait a minute. What the heck is the matter? Well, I have some in my glass of water, too. Well, now, just wait a minute. He doesn't have any ice cubes out yet. Look what in Sam Hill is holding it. Well, you won't get anywhere attacking it like that. Dear, dear. May I try it? May I try it? May I? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. There you are. Your trouble is you get so excited over things like this if you take it easier, dear. Mm-hmm. Now, here, can you hold this ice cube on the gum? Oh, where, where is it? Oh, bend, bend over the table. Let me no, I... Go on, bend over the table. It is so late now. Oh. <laughs> Dad, he looks funny. He looks like you're trying to spank him, Mommy. Look, if there is any spanking to be done around here, young lady... I... You're the only one around here who chews bubble gum. I didn't put it on the chair. You go to your room. Go to your room. At once, do you hear me? Now, now, go on, march. Go to her room? Are you crazy? We're going to a wedding, and she's supposed to go to a little party at Candy Cunningham's. Tell Elsa and Chuck to drive on. We'll get a babysitter. We can get that genie next door. Betsy is not going to any party. She has got to learn the difference between right and wrong. We'll return to the couple next door in just a moment. What were the holidays like at your house? Hectic? In that case, you'll find settling down to normal a pleasure, especially since you now have good friends like Peter Lind Hayes and Mary Healy on hand to keep you company and keep you amused, even when you are busy with your regular daily tasks. Broadcasting right from their own home, Peter and Mary visit you on most of these same stations five days a week, sometimes 
Just the two of them drop by, but often they bring an interesting friend along. In any case, they always have a cheerful song or two on tap. And since Peter and Mary share an optimistic outlook on life, you can count on their humor to be bright and easygoing, too. Just for the fun of it, join us on CBS Radio each Monday through Friday when it's time for the Peter and Mary Show. Meet their diverting friends. Enjoy their refreshing songs. Any weekday now on CBS Radio, get an extra kick out of life with Peter Lind Hayes and Mary Healy. Yes, yes, it is. Lovely wedding reception. Oh, hi, Bill. Hello. Oh, hello, Eleanor. I didn't see you two at the wedding. No, we missed it. I had to get some gum off my pants, and as a result, we had a little discipline problem with Betsy. <laughs> what a shame. Yeah. Have you seen the wedding present? No, not yet. Neither the bride nor groom drink, and they got enough bar equipment to service a hotel. <laughs> There's always the way. I think we got 23 candlesticks. Oh, excuse and... me. Hello, oh, honey, dear, huh? I just remembered I put the gum on the chair. What? Get in here. Get in the library. Get in the library. Call home at once. Oh, well, what about... Just honestly, terrible. What? Here, call home. Why, you uh, operate? Yes, give me a oh. juniper 2323, please. Just, I made... Why would... I made Betsy give me the gum this morning while I was dusting the phone table. The phone rang, and I had to write something down and eat it both my hands. I laid the oh. gum on the chair, meaning honestly. to pick it up later, you know, and apparently I didn't. Hello. I just... Jeannie, re- let, let me talk to Betsy, would you please? Just feel sick. Oh, well, just that's remember, a fine you know. thing, that poor kid. And I laid her out I cold. I feel I just... terrible. I just forgot the gum, apparently. Hello. Hello, baby. This is oh, Daddy, that's... darling. Honey, Mommy just remembered she put the gum there. Yes. Well, we're both so oh. sorry, darling. Daddy apologizes, sweetheart. Oh. What did she say? What did she say? She said, that's all right. I love you, Daddy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One thing about a child, they never hold a grudge, yeah. do they? Oh, I, I did, huh? <laughs> oh, I'll get even with you when I get home. You wait and say, <laughs> goodbye, darling. Oh, what did she say? What did she, say? She, she said, I still think you look funny bending over that table, Daddy. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, she really has a magnificent sense of humor for a six-year-old. Yeah, she does. <laughs> well, come on, that's the party. <laughs> now, don't bore everybody at this party talking about your child. No, honey. no, no, darling. Uh, hi, Fred. Uh, Fred, let me tell you what my kid just said. Oh, honey, I call her for heaven's sake. <laughs> The Couple Next Door is written by Peg Lynch and stars Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce with Madeline Pierce as Betsy, Dorothy Duckworth as Eleanor, and is produced by Walter Hart. Detective Extraordinary. From the thrill-packed pages of Agatha Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and magnificent mustache, your favorite detective, F. U. Poirot, starring Harold Huber in The Bride War Fright. to get out. A thousand thunders, what does it cause with the lights? Ah, well, there is always the lamp. Oh, 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 please, I'm not a thief. I'll go on quietly. I I didn't take anything, I didn't really. Unless you count a cup of coffee. I I was so hungry, I'll pay for that. Just let me get out of here and please don't say anything about it. Please, mademoiselle, give me a moment to think and let me turn on the lamp and look at you. Oh. Oh, indeed, mademoiselle. Or should I say madame? Inasmuch as you are wearing a wedding gown? No, it's not madame. That's why I'm here. Mademoiselle, I am not a minister. No, you don't understand. I I didn't get married. I ran away. They chased me, so I hid in this apartment. And how did you get in? Well, I ran in here because I saw Peter coming around the corner. I ran into the elevator and told the boy to take me to the top floor. Then I went up on the roof. I knew Peter would come after me, and so I climbed down the fire escape, and your window was open. That was most careless of me. Oh, please, you're not going to have me arrested, are you? 
I, I'm not a thief, really, I'm not. Mademoiselle, we will discuss that question in due time. Just now, there are many things I do not understand. Sir, you are in the costume of a bride. Where is the groom? Oh, why, that's Peter. You mean you were running away from your future husband? Yes. But please, that's something I, I don't want to talk about. May I go now? You may go most certainly, mademoiselle, but have you given thought to where you are going? In that dress, you will most certainly attract attention, and you cannot spend the remainder of the night breaking into strange apartments. I know, but I, I'm trying to get to my aunt. She'll help me. Then you are not returning to your home? Oh, no, I can't. Oh, hide me, please. No, mademoiselle, that is out of the question. Well, I'll run into the kitchen. That is useless, mademoiselle. But don't you see someone's after me? That, mademoiselle, is a possibility. But hiding will not help. Oh, please, please don't answer. I beg your pardon, but did you see anything of a girl in the wedding? Why, there you are, my dear Eleanor. Now, what in the world did you want to run off for? You can't mean to say that I've already begun to treat you badly, even before we're married. I'm not going to marry you, Peter. It's no use. Oh, come along, dear. You're upset. I'm not leaving here. But your father's worried about you, Eleanor. You can tell father to stop worrying. I've made up my mind, Peter. Oh, darling, if you think of the impression we must be making on a, on a complete stranger. Oh, he's no stranger. This is a very good friend of mine, Peter. And that's why I came here. I want you to meet Mr... Hercule Poirot is the name, Eleanor. Poirot? Yes, the famous detective. And it's surprising that he should suddenly have become such a great friend of yours. Monsieur, you have the advantage of me. You evidently know my name. I'm Peter Cheney. Major Peter Cheney. And uh, this is my fiancée, Eleanor Carlin. You mean I was your fiancée? Eleanor, stop this nonsense and come along with me. We've bothered Mr. Poirot enough. I assure you, Monsieur Cheney, it is no bother. There, you hear what Mr. Poirot is saying? I'm not leaving. You don't mean to say that you intend to spend the night here. And why not? Well, <laughs> really, Eleanor, you can't expect your father or me to... Monsieur Cheney, come, come, you flatter me. I am not the man for the ladies, but Mademoiselle Carlin shall be chaperoned. Mr. Poirot, for a man of your reputation, you don't seem to understand the situation. Miss Carlin is my fiancée. Monsieur, it is you who does not understand me. This young lady evidently wishes not to be your fiancée. In addition, she seems to be frightened of you. Ridiculous. Frightened enough to run away from you on her wedding day and break into a strange apartment. She's just upset. Exactly, monsieur. And I think it is your presence that upsets her. I see. Well, I suppose I should have known. This is too good an opportunity for any uh, private detective to pass out. When you saw me and heard my name, you knew there'd be something in it for you. Uh, monsieur, I assure you, you are not very astute. Mademoiselle Carlin, would you be kind enough to telephone your aunt and ask her to stay with you? I certainly will. Now, if I give you a check for $5,000 as a retainer, will you then agree that Eleanor has been acting foolishly and let her come with me? Really, monsieur. You are an intelligent man, but with one weakness. You are evidently under the impression that money can purchase anything. Why not? The check is good, you know. I have no doubt of it, monsieur. Keep it. I am not interested. Mr. Poirot, I am warning you. You're making a big mistake. Mr. Poirot, my, my aunt isn't in. She doesn't answer. In that case, mademoiselle, we shall have to find another chaperone, eh? I'm Peter Cheney, the big game hunter. Does that mean anything to you? Only that you like to kill animals, monsieur. I've spent most of the last years in South America. The war raised the devil with big game hunting in Africa. I imagine the war must have interfered considerably with your pleasure. You have my condolences, monsieur. Excuse me. Police headquarters. Stevens speaking. Ah, monsieur Stevens, I have a favor to ask of you. Oh, sure, Poirot. Anything at all short of murder? Well, this is most simple, mon ami. I wish you to spend the night with me in my apartment. I have a young lady here. And what? A girl? Stevens, you will give yourself bad blood shouting so. I want you to act as chaperone. Oh. All right, Poirot. Anything you say. And now, monsieur, if you have nothing more to say, we shall bid you good night, eh? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's one thing. I have the finest collection of human heads in the world. You refer, of course, to the shrunken heads of the South American Indians? Yes, precisely. I found out how to do the job. It, it, it's fascinating. My collection is very fine. I was... I was just thinking. Your mustaches would add to that collection. Hmm, an amusing fancy, monsieur. When we have more time, I must show you my scrapbook of criminals I have sent to jail. I do not believe there is a big game hunter among them. <laughs> I'm getting a good breakfast out of this, Poirot. What's the matter? You're not eating. I am worried, mon ami. Now, look, Poirot. 
You've done enough for Miss Carlin already. She's going over to her aunt's this morning, and that's all there is to it. I only wish you were right, mon dieu. Monsieur Cheney will not let go so easily. Well, I still don't see what you can do about it. After all, it isn't a crime to want to marry a girl. Good morning, Mr. Poirot. Oh, Inspector Stevens. Good morning. I want to thank you for being so kind to me. Mmm, that smells good. And it is good, mademoiselle. <laughs> come, come, sit down. Okay. And this time you can drink coffee and not worry about being taken for a seat, eh? <laughs> Yes, Mr. Eleanor, I'm surprised at you. To think that my daughter would disgrace me by running away from a wedding and making a public exhibition of herself is shameful. Good morning, Eleanor. Oh, Peter, you too. Oh, well, young lady. Father, I'm sorry. I know that what I did was pretty bad. I, I should have refused to go through the wedding in the first place. But, 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 but why? What possible objection can you have to Major Cheney? Only that I'm not in love with him, Father. And I should think that would be enough reason for any father not to force his marriage into any marriage. I'm sure you'll learn to love me, Eleanor. Oh, nonsense. The girl doesn't know her own mind. She, she's much too young. I'm old enough to be able to make up my own mind as to whom I want to marry. I'm over 21, and you can't make me marry anyone I don't want to. Eleanor, I want you to come home and talk this over with me reasonably. I'm sorry, Father. I know that Peter can ruin you financially, and probably will if I don't marry him, which ought to be reason enough why you shouldn't insist that I do. Eleanor, I want you to come home with me now. I'm sorry, Father. I'm going to live with Aunt Susan. Let Eleanor do what she wants, Roger. I I like a girl with a mind of her own. Uh, don't worry. I'll change it. Well, that's very decent of you, Peter. And as for you, gentlemen, you meddling, interfering French busybody, Monsieur I'll... Cigarin, that I will not tolerate. I'm not French. I'm Belgian. And you, since when do the members of the New York police force interfere between a father and a daughter? Huh? Well, I... I, I Mr. Think Carlin, it... Inspector Stevens spent the evening with me as my invited guest, which is a good deal more than I can say for either yourself or Monsieur Cheney. His presence here was in a friendly, not an official capacity. Come along, Roger. I don't think we're wanted. Oh, by the way, Inspector, if anything should happen to Mr. Poirot, anything violent, I mean, I trust that you will then be present in your official capacity. Good day, gentlemen. <laughs> Good afternoon, Pancho. Is Peter in? Ah, oh, I will see if the major is in. You may as well tell him, Pancho, that I'm going to sit right here until he sees me. I hear you, Donna. I'll be right with you. Oh, darling, take your time. As long as I know you're here, I'm happy. Donna, darling, I'd never keep you waiting. You know that. Oh, Peter, I knew it wasn't true. <laughs> and if you think that was a mistake, here. <laughs> All right, Pancho. <laughs> Down, Murphy. Down, I say. Oh, you've brought Murphy with you. Where I go, he goes. He's well named, Donna. Muerte. You know. I know. Death. Right. I told you not to come here. Oh, Peter, I just had to. I couldn't believe that you were going to marry that girl. I am. And now that you know it, you can go right back to South America. Oh, Peter, why? Why? Why do you want to marry her? I assume you asked me that because I never wanted to marry you. You're just like all stupid women. Donna, I'm through with you. You shan't marry her, Peter, because I'm not through with you. Donna, you don't know what you're saying. No, yes, I do. You're not going to marry her, do you hear? Because if you do, I'll go to the police. I'll tell them about Juan. Remember Juan, Peter? He was tied to a tree and torn to pieces by a dog. That dog might have been Muerte. Poor Muerte. He gets blamed for everything. And what about that Englishman? What was his name? Gibson, that's it. He died of a broken neck. You're very good with a bull with Peter. An expert, aren't you? You'd actually go to the police and tell them, Donna? I will. I swear I will if you kick me out. Donna, you... You really love me. Well, uh, we'll have to be careful, but we can arrange something. Anything, Peter. Anything you say. I'll tell you what. Tonight I have something urgent to attend to. Uh, you meet me in Central Park late. About, oh, say, 2.30, near the reservoir. But why so late? Are you... Because I won't be through until then. Peter, if this is one of your tricks, I'll tell the police everything I know. Oh, don't be foolish, Donna. If you'll just meet me, I assure you that won't be necessary. Easy now, Muerte. Easy. Wait, boy. Wait. 
Oh, Peter, where are you? There she is, Marty. Get her. Get her, boy. Drive her towards me. Peter. Peter, Peter, stop. No, stop. I, 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 I don't know what it is. Somebody awfully powerful must have gotten hold of her. Perhaps, but if that is true, mon ami, where are the marks of fingers? Hmm? Hey, all right, Poirot. She must have been hit with something. Exactly, mon ami, but with what? Tell me, what was her name? Donna Moreno. She just got in from South America yesterday. Oh, good morning, Inspector. Good morning, good morning. Mr. Poirot. Good morning. Well, this is my first visit to a police headquarters. As, uh, the policeman downstairs said I'd find you up here, Inspector. What do you want? Well, I read the papers this morning. I think I may know this girl who was so unfortunately killed last night. And so you came down here to give your knowledge to the police? That's right, monsieur. That was most kind of you, Monsieur Cheney. Oh, not at all. I knew that sooner or later the police would find out that Don and I had been very good friends, and so I thought I'd better trot right over here and tell everything I know. Do you know anything about this killing? Oh, nothing about the killing, of course, Inspector. Uh, Donna had a lot of friends in South America, and... A few enemies, too. Did you know that Mademoiselle Donna was coming to New York? I hadn't the slightest idea of that. We said goodbye in Rio. Did you see Mademoiselle Donna before last night? As a matter of fact, I did. She, uh, she called on me yesterday afternoon. And you had a quarrel? Oh, nothing could be further from the truth. She'd heard about my unfortunate experience at my wedding, and... And she came to sympathize with me. It is terrible, Lester, that such a fine, sympathetic young lady should have met death in such a horrible manner. It's awful that she died at all, but uh, tell me, how did poor Donna die? Her neck was broken by some instrument, snapped like a matchstick. Mr. Cheney, do you know anything about the bullwhips used by some of the gauchos in South America? Oh, I should say I do. Why, I'm an expert with a whip myself. That is most interesting, Monsieur. I'll say it is. Now, this girl died about 2.30 this morning. Just where were you last night, Major Cheney? I thought you might ask me that, so I took the liberty of bringing my servant, Pancho, with me. Oh, Pancho. See me, Joe. Uh, Pancho, tell these gentlemen where I was last night. Uh, Major Cheney, have you been at home and never left the house? I sat with him in the library until midnight. I don't care about midnight. Where was he at 2.30? Major Cheney was in bed, asleep. You have no way of knowing that? You can tell me he went into his room, but you can't swear that he stayed there. If it is permitted to contradict the inspector... Well, go right ahead, Pancho. I'll tell the truth. I sleep in the same room with the Major. I uh, am a very light sleeper. I would have noticed if the Major had left during the night. He did not. You're willing to swear to that? I do not make the statement which are not the truth. Oh, well, uh, gentlemen, I think that's all. Uh, take care of yourself, Mr. Poirot. Evidently, there are some dangerous people loose in this town. For the first time, Monsieur Cheney, I find myself in complete agreement with you. Do you mind if I sit down, Eleanor? Oh, oh. Peter, I wish you'd leave me alone. Aren't you tired of working, Eleanor? You, you don't have to, you know. I like working. And inasmuch as I only have an hour for lunch, I'm sure you'll forgive me if I start with Oh, of course, of course. Oh, by the way, I wouldn't bother about hurrying back to the office if I were you. I certainly don't intend to be late. Oh, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you work for the Lee Construction Company, don't you? Why, yes, I do, but... I have an idea that they're not going to require your services after today. So you managed to get them to fire me? Yes, Eleanor. And I'm telling you that I'll do the same with every job you get or try to get. I, I like a woman who fights, but... I like to show them I can fight, too. Oh, Peter, I don't want to fight. I, I just want you to leave me alone. <laughs> you know this is going to be fun. When I was in South America, I think I enjoyed the thrill of tracking an animal more than the, the actual kill. Peter, this isn't a game with me. I'm not going to marry you, and I'm not going to be tracked like any animal. No? Well, what are you going to do? I'll see that you don't get a job, you have no money, and you're too proud to take any from your aunt. You see, Eleanor... I have the advantage of knowing your weakness. I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll... You'll marry me. Eventually. Poirot, I've sat in your apartment many...
many times when we were working on a case, but I've never known as much as I do now and yet felt as helpless. Then you do know the murderer of Mademoiselle Moreno, mon ami. Sure, don't you? Yes, it is a certainty. And the devil of it is, we can't do a thing. I don't dare arrest that Cheney guy. I haven't got a case. That phony alibi is perfect. No alibi is perfect, mon brat. Monsieur Cheney is a murderer and he must be punished. Yeah, yeah, but how? Poirot, I tell you, the DA wouldn't even take the case to court. What have we got to go on? Well, the fact that Monsieur Cheney knows Mademoiselle Moreno, the fact that she visited him on the afternoon of her death, and the fact that Monsieur Cheney is an expert with a bullwhip, the weapon by which Mademoiselle Moreno was killed. Yeah, but all that's the flimsiest kind of circumstantial evidence. Put all that against his alibi, and we're licked. Uh, in this instance, Monsieur Stevens, I agree with you. Huh? Good afternoon, Mr. Poirot. Hello, Inspector it seems I come running to your apartment every time I'm in trouble. Dear yeah, Mademoiselle Carlin, it is a pleasure to have your company. Although the inspector and myself regret that you are in difficulty. It's Peter again. He won't let me alone. But I, I don't suppose you're interested in hearing about my trouble. But indeed we are very much interested. Now, careful, Poirot. I don't want to get sued for libel. That's something this Cheney guy is perfectly capable of doing. You mean Peter's in trouble with the police? That is just the point, Mademoiselle. Monsieur Cheney is not in trouble, but he should be. Why? What has he done? Well, what has he been doing to annoy you? Well, he's gotten me fired for my job and threatened to keep me from working. And he seems perfectly able to do it. Christy Stevens, this Cheney must be checked. Yeah, but how? What has he done? He's a murderer, mademoiselle. Of that we are perfectly certain. But he is diabolically clever. He has found a simple way of committing murder so that we know he has done it, and yet we cannot prove it in a court of law. Now, please don't tell anybody, Miss Carlin. Oh, no. I can't tell you how we're going to handle him, though. He has an unbreakable alibi. Well, I mean, he has before we must break it. And I think I know how. Well, are you going to let me in on this? Most certainly, mon vieux. Mademoiselle, you say that Monsieur Cheney still wants you to marry him? Yes, and it frightens me. That I can understand, mademoiselle. But that makes me believe that we can start to begin to arrive in the vicinity of somewhere. I, I beg your pardon? What, what did you say? Colin, that means he has an idea. Exactly, mon cher Stephen. The little gray cells have found a way. What are you going to do? First, I am going to the Museum of Art, Monsieur. And if I find what I seek, then I go to pay a call on Monsieur Cheney. May I see Monsieur Cheney? Oh, uh, this way, Senor. Ah, Mr. Poirot, this is a surprise. I'm glad to see you. Monsieur Cheney, you have been a great deal in my thoughts. I'm sure I have, and, and you in mine. Uh, would you care to see my collection of heads? It's, it's even finer than the one in the Museum of Art. But I should enjoy that immensely, monsieur. Oh, uh, they're right in this other room. And while we are examining the collection, we shall talk, eh? Of course, of course. What about? Murder? You have said it, monsieur. Now, now, here's a head I'm particularly proud of. It, it's the head of a man named Juan who died in a most peculiar circumstance. Some animal had chewed him almost to pieces. Yet you can hardly see the trace of a scar. Perhaps he was murdered, monsieur. Well, now, what makes you say that? Uh, uh, down, Murphy. Stay back. It seems that so many things about you, monsieur Cheney, bring murder to my mind. Even your dog is named Death. That's because he's dangerous, Mr. Poirot. I always think people should be warned. Don't you? But of course. And did you warn poor Mademoiselle Donna, monsieur? Well, now, why should you think I had anything to do with Donna's death? I, I, I do admire the way it was done, though, quickly and efficiently. I understand you have been annoying Mademoiselle Carlin. I thought we were going to talk about murder. Oh, now, now here's another fine example of the art of shrinking human heads. Murder in... and marriage, monsieur. I just thought it fair to warn you that I will not allow Mademoiselle Carlin to marry a murderer. Good for you, good for you. I wouldn't want Eleanor to marry someone like that either. Monsieur, I am saying that I know you are a murderer. Oh, yeah? I am also saying that I will not permit Mademoiselle Carlin to marry you even if she wants. To. And I am telling you that it's none of your business. And Monsieur Cheney, I shall do everything in my power to help Mademoiselle Carlin, financially and otherwise. You will persist in sticking your neck out. And you break necks that are in your way. Let's pass. For some time... But listen, Mr. Poirot, I have too much respect for you to, to want to quarrel. I, I'd like to get together when I've had time to think this over, and maybe we can talk more reasonably. Anytime you say, monsieur. Well, frankly, I'm too upset now to be able to think clearly. Shall we say, um, tonight at 11? Consider it said, monsieur. Shall we meet here? 
No, I'd rather not. Oh, come, come, come. Surely you are not going to ask me to meet you in the park. Oh, no, no, of course not. I don't think you would anyway. Not without being followed by a good number of police. And you would not like that, you say? I think our meeting place should be uh, private, don't you? By your means, monsieur. And um, I haven't. There's an old hot dog stand out on Long Island, been abandoned for quite a while, just a few miles east of Bayville on Route 19. It's in the middle of a vacant lot, nothing around for miles. You can see anyone coming miles away. How about meeting me there? Monsieur Cheney, you have an appointment. <laughs> I don't like it. I cannot say, mon ami, that I am pleased at the idea myself, but it must be done. But you won't even let me have Collins trail you. It is useless, mon dieu. This must be done this way or not at all. Okay, okay. Tell me what you want me to do. It is simple but vital. You must go to the house of Monsieur Cheney and tell his servant, Pancho, that Monsieur Cheney has been hurt. Badly hurt. But will he believe me? It is essential that he must. If he needs convincing, tell him that he was hurt because of his appointment with me. That Pancho must come with you immediately. That Monsieur Cheney needs him. Yeah, but suppose he won't come. He must. Or you will be in the terrible situation of having to solve murders without the assistance of Hercule Poirot. Mr. Poirot, I'm glad to see you came alone. Uh, don't stay so far away. Come up a little closer. I do not like the actions of your dog, monsieur. No? Well, I don't think he likes you either. Get him, Wesley. Get him. <laughs> come, come, Monsieur Jenny. That was stupid of you, eh? Did you think I would come unarmed to meet you? I'm glad to see the pistol in your hand. Hey, suck. May I congratulate you, monsieur? You are most expert with that wit. Thanks. Start running, Mr. Poirot. I always like to give the ones I hunt an even break. In this case, monsieur, you are doomed to disappointment. I shall not run. If you think you can break my neck with that whip, I am unable to stop you. But I warn you, Monsieur Cheney, you will die for it. <laughs> and that takes care of you, Mr. Poirot. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Cheney, and sit down. Oh, thank you, Inspector. I <laughs> I seem to be spending a good deal of time at police headquarters lately. I'm warning you, Cheney. I'm holding you for the murder of Hercule Poirot. And anything you say may be used in evidence against you. Oh, don't be ridiculous, my dear Inspector. Well, what is this, a joke or something? If it is, it's in very bad taste. Stop stalling, Cheney. I've got you dead to rights. <laughs> I, I begin to see. This is evidently a trap of some kind. Mr. Poirot pretends to be dead Cheney? while you... I've arrested a lot of cold-blooded killers in my time. But I tell you, I've never been as vindictive towards any of them as I feel towards you. You not only killed a great detective, but the best friend I ever had. Before you go any further, Inspector, I'd like to warn you that I'm going to sue you for false arrest and libel, or else have you put in an insane asylum. I suppose you're going to tell me you were home all night and your servant, Pancho, was prepared to swear to That's him. exactly what I'm telling you. Okay, that's it. That's all I wanted to hear. Come in, Pancho. Oh, Pancho. Will you please tell the inspector where I was this evening? Well? Pancho, what's the matter with you? Tell the inspector where I was. Uh, please do forgive, Pancho, Major. I, I cannot. Have you lost your mind? Tell him, Pancho. No, it's not Pancho's fault, Cheney. He can't tell me because I was with him every minute this evening from 10.30 on. What? Yes, that's it. Poro knew you'd try to kill him the same way and create the same alibi. Took a chance and laid down his life in order to trap you. Well, it's too bad I didn't foresee that. But at least I got Poirot. Well, I'm glad you see it that way. Here's a confession on the Moreno killing, too. Yes, I did it. Just too bad, Pancho, that you weren't a little smarter. Or I'd have gotten away with the Poirot killing, too. Pardon, uh, Monsieur Jenny. Pardon? What? what? That is one murder you would never have gotten away with. But Poirot, I thought... You thought I was dead, mon ami. I intended you should. In no other way could you have played your part so convincingly. I never miss with that whip. And you did not miss this time, Monsieur Cheney. 
However, you neglected to find out whether or not I was wearing a steel collar. A steel collar? A steel collar. The Museum of Art has one of the finest collections of 15th century armor in the world. I was fortunate in finding a collar that fit me. It was most uncomfortable, but most effective. Poro, I'm certainly glad that you're alive, but don't ever do that again. What, mon ami? Make believe I am dead? No. Hide in my office without my knowing it. It would make me look like an awful fool in front of the commissioner. When Agatha Christie, America's favorite mystery writer, brings you her favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, starring Harold Huber in The Letter and the Mad Woman. <music> Music for Hercule Poirot is composed and conducted by Sylvan Levin. The program is directed by Carl Eastman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. Stories calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves. Tonight, for instance, as we begin, you may want to ask yourself, how could a young lady, a bride, walk out on a balcony alone and vanish? Completely vanish. We trust that while you are wondering how and why it was done, we shall keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense, tonight CBS presents The Bride Vanishes by John Dixon Carr. Italy in springtime. Italy as we used to know it before the jackal struck. And the island of Capri, 20 miles out across the Bay of Naples. Blue water a dazzle under the sun. Behind you the bone-white beaches and Vesuvius dull purple in a heat haze. Ahead, as the little steamer from Naples chugs out across the bay, rises Capri. Olive trees and white roads and vineyards above the cliffs. Could young Americans find a better place to spend their honeymoon? While the guitars sing and the warm winds blow and the little steamer carries them. Well, Mrs. Courtney. Well, Mr. Courtney. <laughs> I can't keep it up, Lucy. I'm going to break down and ask if you're happy. Oh, I'll break down, too. I want to walk up to everybody I meet and say, we... Oui just like that. What I want to do is turn somersaults myself all along this deck here. I want to say I've been married to Tom Courtney for practically two weeks. And now we're going to have a villa at Capri for a month. Oh, Tom, I ought to be the happiest woman in the world. Only... Uh, you shivered. What's wrong? Well, ever since we got aboard this ship, people have been staring at me. I can't blame them for that, dear. No, no. I, I mean in, in a funny way and, and muttering. Even your American friend, uh, what's his name? Uh, Granger. Mr. Granger. When you introduced him to me at Naples, I thought his eyes were going to pop out. Be careful. He's standing over by the rail now. Oh. He lives at Capri. <laughs> I like to see him wearing that white ten-gallon hat in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Before Granger made money in oil wells, he was a real old-fashioned cow puncher. And he's proud of it. Good fellow, too. He's too polite to say anything, but 
She keeps looking around at me, just the same as the rest of them do. Well? Uh, well, Tom, they... They look scared. You know, Lucy, this isn't the time to start imagining things. I know. Well, maybe I'm just so happy I'm afraid it can't last. Oh, don't say that. But wouldn't it be pretty awful if something did happen and we weren't together any longer? Wait a minute. Hasn't this ship stopped? Yes. Well, it is Capri ahead of us, isn't it? It can't be anything else. But it seems a funny place to stop. No sign of a harbor. Only rocks and little gray cliffs. Oh, Mr. Granger. Uh, Mr. Granger. Yes, young fellow. Do you happen to know why we're stopping here? Oh, yes, that's an easy one, son. <clears throat> we're stopping so that uh, you and your good lady and anybody else who's curious can get a look at the Blue Grotto. Oh. The Blue <laughs> Grotto, of course. Now, just uh, shave your eyes with your hand, ma'am. Uh, you see that, that tiny little arch under the cliff? Yes. And all the little white rowboats are coming out towards us? Yes. Now, when the first boat comes alongside, you climb down that iron ladder and get in. The boatman will row you out and through the arch into the grotto. It's a great big dark cavern. The water in there looks as though it's lit up underneath with blue fire. Mm. Like to go out and see it, Lucy? Oh, I'd love to. But let me give you a little tip, though. The current's pretty fast out there. You'll go shooting under that arch like 60. Are we likely to upset? Oh, no, no, but the arch isn't as high as your head. When you see it come and lie back flat in the boat. That is, unless you want your block now, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Mr. Granger. We'll remember. Come along, Lucy. Easy on the ladder, Lucy. Don't look round yet. Oh, I'm all right, darling. And just as good a swimmer as you are. I'm in the boat now. Take one more step. Steady. Yeah. Hey, now turn around facing the boatman and sit down here oh, beside me. Oh, oh. What's the matter with the boatman? Easy, man. Do you want to upset us? Sit down. You come back, yes? Come back? Well, I've never been here before in my life. Push off, man. Start rowing. The other boats are piling up behind you. You come back. Start rowing, can't you? And Ali Subito. Basta. He can't take his eyes off us. I wish he'd watch out where he's rowing. You come to live at the Villa Borghese, yes? Tom, how does he know that? He's the lady. She is not dead. Dead? Of course she's not dead. What are you talking about? She never come to Capri before? Never. Then I tell you, she will disappear just like the other one. Disappear? I rest my orders and I tell you. Tom, aren't we moving rather fast? Yes, that's the entrance to the grotto ahead. Oh. I tell you, there was a lady so much like your own, coping back, oh, it scared me. Now, look, old man, I don't want to teach you your business, but you've got your back to that grotto. Uh, take a decent lady back where she come from. Do not take her to the Villa Borghese. Down, Lucy, flat on your back, down! Signore, signore, I am sorry. I almost make you get hurt. You know you nearly got your own head knocked off. Uh, excuse me, Nor. I am used to it. Now, I will row you round the blue grotto. I don't think I like it much, Tom. Neither do I. Dark. Except for that blue light under the water. It's transparent. You can see the fishes swimming. Uh, just a minute, Boatman. This lady who disappeared from the Villa Borghese. Two, three years ago, she disappeared. You say she looked exactly like my wife? Si, signore. She was uh, going to be married. She was trying on a, what do you call, her wedding dress. Her mother and sisters, they were in the room with her. She walked out on a balcony over the sea. You know what I mean, on a balcony over the sea? Nobody ever hear of her again. You mean she jumped over into the sea? Oh, a young girl going to be married. Kill herself. No, 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 no. And what did happen? Over the back of her, I do not know. But sometimes they say you can meet her ghost in the here. She float just under the water where you can see her and turn over and over. And the wedding veil is still round her face. Tom, 
Let's get out of here. You want to go, yes? Lucy, if this fellow's stringing us along... He's not stringing us along. Then somebody ought to know what this means. If we've inherited a haunted balcony where people disappear like soap bubbles, I say it's too much. Let's get back to our ship and talk to Granger. Yes, Boatman, take us back. Mr. Granger! Mr. Granger! I'm aboard, ma'am. Oh. You too, young woman. You see, we'll start to have a second. Yeah, give me a hand, Lucy. Thanks, dear. Oh, did, didn't anybody else go to the Blue Grotto? Well, ma'am, no. Not after they saw you go. It's all right. We've just heard the story, Mr. Granger. Oh, I ought to have told you about it myself. All the way out here, I've been cussing myself and thinking what a nornery old badger I am for not telling you when I first met you in Naples. The girl did vanish, then. By a first-rate miracle, yes. In broad daylight and within 20 feet of her mother and sisters. You don't look like a man who'd believe in miracles, Mr. Granger. Oh, I'm not, son. I'm just telling you what happened. But why is everybody so excited? Somebody must have thrown her off the balcony. Josephine Adams was all alone on a balcony 40 feet up the cliff, smooth as glass. She didn't fall, she wasn't thrown because there was no sound of a splash, and she didn't come back from the balcony because her mother and sisters were in front of the only door. Yet, within 15 seconds, 15 seconds, mind you, she just vanished. You believe that? Sure, I believe it, son. Why, it's a fact. Did you know the girl's family? Oh, very well. We've got a real English-speaking colony here. Oh, by the way, in about a half a minute now, I'm going to show you your new home. Oh, can we see it here on the ship? Oh, sure you can, ma'am. It's on the edge of the cliff. Dr. Davis's house is on one side of it, and my shack's on the other. Uh, that's why I want to ask you a question. Of course. Ask anything you like. Well, I'm an old stager, ma'am, and not exactly up to the high-toned society around here, but do you... do you trust me? Yes, I think so. Well, then... Promise me something. Unless you're with somebody you do trust, keep away from that balcony. Do you honestly think there's danger or... I don't know, son. If I did, I wouldn't have to talk this way. Sounds like a dog barking. I thought I heard it before. What well, is a big police dog. And led by a very handsome woman, if you ask me. Oh, Lord, here she is again. Who? The Countess. She lives in our colony. She looks like an American. You take your eyes off her, Tom Courtney. <laughs> she is an American. Married a Count Parcheesi or something like that. <laughs> Just call her Nellie. My dear Mr. Granger. Hello, Nellie. It's true. Everybody told me so, but I couldn't believe it until I saw her. She does look exactly like poor Josephine Adams. Just as small, just as dainty. <laughs> Please, is, is everybody trying to give me the jitters? Nellie, I, I want you to meet some friends of mine. Oh, you don't need to introduce me. I know who they are. You're the nice young couple who've taken that villa. I'm Nellie LeCase. <laughs> oh, yes. This is my dog, Tiberius, named after the wicked Roman emperor. You know who used to live at Capri? I must confess I'm terribly fascinated by wicked things. <laughs> Aren't you, Mr. Courtney? Lucy, stop digging me in the ribs. I haven't done anything. No, and you're not going to. Tiberius seems to have taken quite a fancy to you, Mrs. Courtney. Oh. I've never known him to go to a stranger before. Well, I only wish I could borrow him. He might be a charm against... Oh, no, I don't know. We'll be at the harbor in a few minutes. Then you must let me drive you up to the villa. You won't be able to get any servants, I'm afraid, because they won't stay there. But you can camp out. Look, there's the villa. We're passing it now. Where? On the cliff, where I'm pointing. Wait a minute. Well, there must be some mistake. That's not the Villa Borghese. It sure is, son. That's a palace like all the other houses there. And I rented it furnished for about $25 a month. Can't you guess why you got it so cheap, son? If you take my advice, you'll turn around and go back to Naples by the next steamer. Harry Granger, don't be an idiot. Let's have some excitement. Let's have some excitement. Tom is beautiful. Too infernally beautiful, if you ask me. There, there's the balcony. It's all right by daylight, son. Marble and tapestries and whatnot. But at night, when you got to put out the lights, you start thinking what happened there.
The moon over Capri makes a deathly daylight. You could see to read on that balcony if anyone went out there. Frosted glass doors open out on it from a big room on the ground floor. Two determinedly calm persons and a dog sit looking at each other. Lucy, stop it. Stop what? Stop looking over at that balcony. I'm sorry, darling. Why are we sitting here anyway? There's an outer room that's much more comfortable. It's like having a toothache, a very little toothache. I may be dense, Angel, but I don't follow you. You put your tongue against the tooth to see if it'll hurt. You know it will hurt, but you go on doing it just the same. Well, that's us. <sighs> Maybe you're right. <laughs> oh, Tom, did you ever think we'd have a lovely house like this? Yeah, the house is all right, yes. Then they have to go and spoil everything. Our honeymoon with this blasted Tommy rot Why, about... Tom, you're as jittery now as I was this afternoon. Oh, even Tiberius is jittery. Yes, I guess I am. Easy, boy. Easy, easy. Well, there's whiskey on the table. <laughs> they call it Viki here. Make yourself a drink. Hmm? Oh, in a minute. Not just now. Lucy, there's nothing wrong with that balcony. Suppose you walked out there this minute. I've had a horrible longing to try it. Just because I know I shouldn't. Well, nothing could attack you. All you'd have to do would be to yell. That'd bring Mr. Granger out on his balcony like a shot. And the neighbor on the other side of us would... Well, who is on the other side, by the way? A loony doctor. A what? A specialist in brain diseases. Dr. Davis. He's English. Listen. It's somebody in the outer room. Easy, Tiberius. Easy. Tom, I'm afraid. It's all right, darling. You hold Tiberius' collar while I open the door. We don't want him to fly at anybody. We're going into the other room and stay there. Ready? Yes. Uh, uh, good evening, Mr. Courtney. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Courtney. I, I'm no ghost, though you appear to regard me as one. I'm merely your neighbor, Dr. Rutherford Davis. Oh, oh y y yes, of, of course. Mr. Granger mentioned you. I... Uh, I, I trust you will pardon this intrusion. Uh, no one answered my knock, so I, I ventured to come in. <laughs> it's no intrusion, Dr. Davis. We're a little uh, <laughs> disorganized here, that's all. Uh, naturally. Mr. Courtney, I, I wish I could say welcome to Capri, but I have a very different message. Well? If you value Mrs. Courtney's life, you'll go back to Naples immediately, sir. Not you, too. I do not say that as a ghost hunter, sir. I say it as a medical man. Um, um, may I sit down? Oh, of course. Please do. Oh, thank you. We seem to be forgetting our manners. Uh, Dr. Davis, will you, um, will you have a drink? Oh, uh, thank you. Perhaps a small whiskey? Uh, I'll get it, darling. You sit down and talk to Dr. Davis. You're not going back into that room alone. Oh, I'm only going to get the drinks, Tom. I promise to be good. And Tiberius can come with me. Can't you, Tiberius? Oh, I see you've borrowed Tiberius from the Countess Lucchese. <laughs> yes, she was kind enough to offer him. Excuse me, I'll be back in a minute. Come on, Tiberius. Hi. I hope this is all right, Doctor. No, sir. It is not all right. Your wife is in very great danger. But Why? Because of that balcony? Uh, no. Because she looks exactly like the late Josephine Adams. I don't get it. Uh, Mr. Courtney, did you ever hear of paranoia? It's some kind of mental disease, isn't it? The paranoic begins by imagining that he or she is being persecuted by someone. First, he hears things. A voice in his brain whispers, You'll be killed. You'll be killed. You'll be killed. He hears it in the tick of a clock, in the rattle of a train, in the footsteps on the street. There are holes in the walls through which his enemy is always watching. Invisible speaking tubes bring him messages. There are pains in his joints and nightmares of attempts to poison him. His brain bursts and he kills. He kills. He kills. <laughs> well, excuse me for speaking so strongly, but how does this affect us? Uh, Mr. Courtney, will you, uh, uh, will you examine this sheet of paper? 
What is it? The fragment of a typewritten diary. I found it on the cliffs months ago. Don't ask me who wrote it. But I know there's a criminal lunatic on this island. He imagined that poor, inoffensive Josephine Adams was his enemy. So he killed her. Killed her? How? I don't know. And what happened to the girl's body? <laughs> I'm not a detective, sir. The body was carried out to sea, perhaps, or washed along the cliffs and into the blue grotto to be lost. But don't you understand the danger to your wife? You're not suggesting that with somebody's cracked brain, your wife is Josephine Adams, created all over again. Kill Lucy? It couldn't be done. It was done, my friend. Listen. That sounded like a dog howling. Mrs. Courtney is rather a long time in getting that whiskey. She wouldn't go near the balcony. She promised not to go out on the balcony. People do very perverse things, my friend, when they know they shouldn't. Lucy! Lucy! That seems to be Tiberius out on the balcony. I, uh, I, I, I can't see anything else from here. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. <laughs> balcony, a howling dog, and a sea turned clear silver under the moon. Then, after the tumult and the shouting, there are other pictures. Don't you hear the noise of that motor launch with a half-demented young man at the wheel? Three other familiar figures are gathered around it. Don't you recognize the brunette prettiness of Nellie Lucasa? And the white ten-gallon hat of Harry Granger. And the neat, pointed beard of Dr. Davis. But what on earth is he going to do? Out here in this motorboat. I'd like to know that one myself. Listen, please. All of you. Now, take it easy, son. We're with you. What time is it? Time? Yes. What time is it? It's half past two in the morning. Going on for three. Twelve hours. And the tide ought to be just where it was this afternoon. What's the tide got to do with it? A whole lot. Somebody set a trap and made Lucy fall off that balcony. I know it. Oh, that's absurd. If Lucy's been carried out to sea, there's nothing we can do about it. But if she's been carried along with the current and into the blue grotto... Blue grotto? Uh, one moment, sir. You're not proposing to run this big launch under that arch after dark? Yes, Doctor. That's just exactly it. Go on. Do it. I'll back you up. Let's have some excitement. It'll be exciting enough, I assure you. Mr. Courtney, have you got some wild hope of recovering your wife's body? I've even got a wild hope she may be alive. Lucy's a very strong swimmer. You're acting like a nut, son. Get set, everybody. I'm going to swing around. We're in the current now. Better hold tight. I've got to duck my own head when we go through. Everybody else, squat down. I still protest against this. Don't you understand, Mr. Cotton? Get ready. Here we go. What on earth is wrong? There's no blue grotto. It's as black as pitch. My dear Nellie, I kept trying to tell all of you. The blue grotto effect is caused by the sun's rays. There never is one except when the sun is out. Uh, just how does our friend propose to find anything in here? Listen. Something got hold of the side of the boat. I, I felt it move. Not the dead girl, I trust. There's a hand here. A wet hand. Lucy. She's not... Alive. Mr. Granger, help me lift her up over the side. Easy, easy now. Don't tip the boat. Oh, Lucy. Lucy, are you all right? Are you all right, Lucy? Can you hear me? 
All right. I'm just exhausted. I got in here. And couldn't swim out against the current. Oh, don't try to talk. I've got to talk. I'm going to faint. Tom, who's with you? Only our friends. Who's with you? Is the murderer with you? I was just wondering the same thing. To be shut up in the dark at three o'clock in the morning with a criminal lunatic. Who spoke then? Now, Lucy, don't hold me so tight. Let go, dear. I'll get the boat started and have you out of here in a second. Who spoke then? Only Dr. Davis. Tom, I've got to tell you. I know how that, that girl, Josephine Adams, died. Almost killed me. Has anybody here got some brandy? Or a flashlight? I have a flashlight, my friend. Will you allow me, as a medical man, to examine Mrs. Courtney? You better keep back for just a second, Doctor. She's hysterical. Uh, give me the flashlight, please. I walked into the other room. Nobody with me. All alone except Tiberius. Yes, Lucy? Somebody called my name. From the balcony, I thought. Very softly. Mrs. Courtney said. Mrs. Courtney. Did you recognize the voice? Yes. That's why I went. Oh, hadn't you better start up this boat and get out of the oh, then... I Don't pay any attention to them, Lucy. Nobody can hurt you now. I went out in the balcony. The bright moonlight. Bright as day. But there was nobody there. Nobody on the balcony? No. I looked out over the sea. And then something came at me. Something flew out of the air and came at but me. Just one moment before Mrs. Courtney goes on. Is anybody in this boat carrying a revolver? Not that I know of. Excuse my mentioning it, but I felt something. Metal, like a revolver, uh, brush past my hand. Oh, it was only the flashlight. Excuse Probably. me, it was not a flashlight. Mr. Courtney's got the flashlight. Would you please let Lucy go on and finish? Lucy, you were on the balcony and something came at you. Yes, like a snake. Sideways, out of the air. It went over my head, fastened around my neck. It was a rope with a running noose in it. A rope? That's it, a rope. It was thrown from another balcony. I'm small and light, like Josephine Adams. But it pulled me sideways and over the rail. I fell. I think I begin to understand what... I couldn't see what happened to Josephine Adams. Frosted glass doors to the balcony, so they couldn't see. But take it easy now. You're perfectly safe. But is she perfectly safe? The murderer let her fall on the rope. But the rope was jerked tight long before she struck the water. That broke her neck. Then the murderer lowered her softly. So there wasn't any splash. And the current took her away, rope and all. That's it. It would have happened to me. Only the rope must have slipped through the murderer's fingers. Through whose fingers? <laughs> What did I tell you? Somebody in this boat has got a revolver. Who's overboard? Somebody went. A switch on that light, my friend, and shine it on the water. All right, Doctor. There's your light. Look at it. Turning over and over. The water in the blue grotto is red now. Tom, stay close to me. Oh, it's all right, Lucy. I swear you're safe enough now. Did he shoot himself? Yes. Did who shoot himself? Who had a balcony exactly like ours on the house next door? Who began life as a cowpuncher and would have known how to use a lasso? Yes, and knew Josephine Adams well. And got it into his maniac's head that Mrs. Courtney was Josephine Adams all over again. Harry Granger. Look. There's his ten-gallon hat floating away. <laughs> And so ends The Bride Vanishes, a story of mysterious doings in the Isle of Capri, and tonight's story of Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. 
William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Alexander Semler, the composer, conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, practitioner of the seventh oldest profession, storyteller. Spinner of tales, weaver of dreams, especially those that are dark and foreboding. An ancient poet wrote, Forgetfulness, sweet and blessed forgetfulness, is the most precious gift of the immortal gods. For the innocent to forget, and for the guilty to be forgotten, is to receive finally the benediction of of amnesia, the sweetest spirit of all. For amnesia sits patiently beside the never-ending stream of time, bestowing her largesse on the innocent and the guilty alike. Jerry? Jerry? Eric? What's wrong? Uh, I'm in trouble. Well, what kind of trouble? I'm scared. I'm scared stiff. Uh, now, now, whatever it is, kid, I'll stand by you. Now, wh- what did you do? I killed a man. Uh, all right, kid. Uh, now, who was it? A man named Jamie Parsons. Who? They said his name is Jamie Parsons. Oh, Eric. How, how could you kill Jamie Parsons? I did. I did. I shot him ten minutes ago. No, kid, you didn't. Now, how could you? Jamie Parsons has been dead for 50 years. Our mystery drama, A Bride for Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. We are still a young and boisterous country, filled with optimism and high spirits. At least we like to think we are. And we endorse positive thinking. We're convinced that the pot of gold lies at the end of the rainbow, and that sterling silver lines every cloud. And so, our language has no word to match one that is so familiar to the Germans, Weltschmerz, which means a melancholy weariness with the futility of life. Which is not to say that we don't encounter it here and there. We do. But it's not really what you could consider a mainstream affliction. Well, good morning, Martha. Oh, I'm just taking your pancakes off the griddle. (laughs) Well, that's life. You know what life is? Timing. Now, you'll be there at that exact split second. Now, that's enough, Jerry. Two philosophers in this house at one time is more than I can put up with. Uh, well, is Shakespeare down yet? And don't call him Shakespeare. Well, why not? He's a poet, ain't he? Oh, here. Feed your face and give us a rest. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, yeah. uh, you tell me. Now, here's a boy, 25 years old. He's been to college. Means he's got brains. He's good looking. Means he's got no problem with women. Jerry. Hmm? I'm worried about Eric. Worried? <laughs> For crying out loud. What's his problem? Oh, I don't know. Well, it doesn't help that he can come running to his big sister any time he needs it. It's just that, I don't know, he feels rejected. Rejected? Why, that boy is is welcome wherever he goes. No, Jerry. 
he's actually being rejected by the editors. He sends his poetry into a magazine, and back it comes with a rejection slip. Well, you know, <clears throat> I, uh... I read some of those poems, and, I, well, I couldn't make head or tail out of them. Oh, what do you know? Well, I know what I like. You know what he ought to do? He should get a job. He's trying to find himself. Oh, I pass. Good morning. Oh, Eric, you're just in time for breakfast. I only want some coffee. Yeah, you can tell that this is a city boy. Eric, you really ought to have a good breakfast. Uh, sugar and... Fresh cream, Eric? I'll take it black. I, I've got this headache. Oh, look, you better see a doctor. No, no, no. He doesn't need a doctor. He needs to have a good time, raise a little hell. Hey, why don't you come with us, Eric? Get into the dance at the Grange Hall tonight. Put your arm around a pretty girl. The whole world is different. <laughs> I wish the whole world could be different. Now, Eric, uh, you just can't get serious at this hour in the morning. <laughs> uh, he going out for a ride. Saddle up Duke or Admiral, and you just... Look at that sky, and you just breathe that air and enjoy that sun. And uh, you know how you feel? I remember that poem you once recited when you were a kid. And you'll say it again. God's in his heaven, and all's right with the world. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or... Oh, 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 do. Hold it. Hold it, boy. I can't be. It can't be. It's a mirage. Stay here, Duke. There's plenty of nice grass. Have your lunch. I have to find out about this. It's incredible. Out here? This type of architecture? Out here? Jamie! Jamie, darling, I knew you'd come... Oh. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, I'm not Jamie. Oh, I see. I, I've been waiting for Jamie to come back from the war. The war? Yes, the war. And now I know, now I know who you are. Well, uh, who am I? You are... You are Jamie's best friend, his... Buddy in the fight. And Jamie fell and he died in your arms. And with his dying breath, he made you swear to come and tell me I'm the only one he ever loved. But, uh, well, after I finish crying for Jamie, you and I will fall in love. Uh, I, I almost wish that were true, but uh, th that's not what happened. I was just riding by and I was struck by the look of the house. Were you? It's fantastic. This ornate, late Victorian architecture is so perfectly preserved. Do you like it? It's it's fascinating. Well, I think it's just too much gingerbread. <laughs> Granddad built it. I, I've never seen you around here. I'm visiting. Uh, Jerry Carraway's my brother-in-law. You can't mean Jerry. You mean Oscar. No. Oscar Carraway owns the farm over on Stillwell Creek. I think that's what they call it. Well, that's Oscar. <laughs> Jerry can't be anybody's brother-in-law. He's hardly a year old. <laughs> uh, I, well, I suppose we're talking about two different people. Now, if you're kin to the Caraways, I am going to invite you to come inside and have a nice cool glass of lemonade. Well, uh, thank you. Come on into the parlor, and we'll sit. I don't know what is the matter with me. My name is Julia Sanford. And I'm Eric Mills. I can't get over this. What? The um, way this place is furnished and that phonograph. Oh, yes. Everything is the latest from all the way over to Omaha. Everything is so authentic. <laughs> and I think the telephone is a great final touch. Well, it's just an ordinary old telephone. <laughs> old is right. Well, that's practically an antique. They used to have those uh, about the 1920s. I've seen them in the movies. Do you like movies? Well, some of them. What's your favorite? Well, um, I have my own taste. I, I mean, my favorite movie happens to be, uh, don't laugh, Birth of a Nation. <laughs> saw it at a retrospective in the museum. We saw that in town at the Bijou. Do you have a theater that shows old pictures? Old pictures, new pictures, any kind. Uh, everything here is, is so, uh... <laughs> so what? <laughs> 
that one word, it just covers everything. Authentic. Even your dress. Oh, this is just a silly old... Well, you know, nowadays there's no style, there's no set style. The girls dress any which way, but yours is definitely 1920-ish. Well, I should hope so. Dad's taking me shopping to Omaha as soon as he get back from Washington. Oh, do you like politics? No, no, definitely not. Oh, don't you ever say that in front of Dad. I told you Dad's in Washington visiting with President Wilson. And he... <laughs> but Wilson isn't the president. Oh, that's right, he isn't. <laughs> I can't get used to the idea of that new one, Mr. Hardin. Mr. Warren Gamaliel Hardin. <laughs> There's a mouthful for you. <laughs> but, uh... Dad was against him at the convention. The way you talk, I almost believe you. Why, you can read it in the newspapers. Dad is an important man. He's going to run for governor. You just ask Mr. Carraway if that's not so. No, no, no. What I mean oh, is... Oh, I hope it didn't sound like bragging on my part. Everything is so... You don't believe... You don't believe a word I say. All right, now here. Now just read it for yourself in yesterday's paper. Now what does that headline say? This is the... Rocky Mountain Advocate and Messenger, July 18th, 1921. Even the newspaper? It's so carefully preserved. <laughs> preserved? Why would anyone want to preserve a copy of the silly old ad mess? You can always get a fresh one the next day. Oh, if, if only this period had never passed away. You know, I don't understand half the things you say, but I love to listen. <laughs> Do you suppose that I could call on you again? Oh, uh, well, I... I understand. There's a... There's a dance at the Grange Hall. How would you like to go? I'd love it. Great. I'll pick you up. No. At... Oh, no. I... I better not. Why? Jamie. Jamie? We... We're engaged, and it wouldn't be right for me to go to a dance with another man. But... Jamie's been missing in action, you say, and... Yes, and everybody says he's dead. I'm sorry. And if I went to a dance with someone else, it would be my way of saying to the world that... that I thought he was dead, too, and I don't want to say that. I just don't want to say that. Julie, I don't think people would say that... You better not stay here any longer. Julie, if I said anything... Please go. I must ask you to leave. But, Julia... Please! Supper in a half hour, Jerry. Mm, mm, that smells great. Now, whatever do you put in your stew? <laughs> Cooking is my business. <laughs> <laughs> I have to hand it to you, Martha. It's a miracle business. Now, evidently, it's done wonders for Eric. He's chopping wood. He's humming a tune. Eric? Yeah, as happy as a jaybird. <laughs> What's got into him? You're cooking. Now, what else? Oh. Hello, folks. How's our happy little homestead? Oh, Eric, darling, I, are you all right? No, I'm not all right. I'm magnificent, spectacular. <laughs> What's gotten into you? Well, as the French say, Cherchy Le Fan. Oh, you be quiet. <laughs> oh, he's right. <laughs> Oh? Well, who is she? Well, there may be one or two little complications there, but it's nothing I can't handle. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> tell you what? Tell me you had a museum here. Museum? Oh, there ain't no it's museum. It's a wild place, and it's a gem. It's authentic to the tiniest detail. Eric, please tell us what you're talking about. It's dedicated to the 1920s. What is? This museum. Oh, but there isn't any museum. Yes, yes, there is. Uh, uh, where? Oh, come on now. Quit pretending. She works there. I suppose she's the curator. Who? Her name is Julia. Julia? Oh, you'd know who she is, Jerry, because she has to be the prettiest girl in town. Eric, this uh, museum, just just tell us where it is. Got us down the road from here. It can't be more than two miles. It has the most beautiful garden and lawn. And the house is a perfect example of late Victorian. I think it's called the Sanford House. It's the most beautifully kept... What, what are you looking at me like that for? Eric, the Sanford House is, is an old ruin. It's falling apart. Oh, but I was... Uh... And it's so overgrown that if you didn't know it was there, you, you couldn't even see it from the road. No, I was just inside, and it, it was... Eric... Are you sure that you... I was. 
I was inside the most beautiful... Ah, uh, now, you think you'd better see a doctor, Eric, huh? But I was. Eric, uh, do you want us to ride back there with you and and prove it? Are you saying that the girl, the house, that the... was all a dream? But I wasn't dreaming. I know I wasn't dreaming. And he wasn't, because we were there, too. Unless it's possible that we were dreaming also. Well, every young man should have a wonderful girl of his dreams. And it's just fine, if that's where she stays. It's when she materializes that you can run into a problem. I shall materialize again shortly with Act Two. What happens to the past? Or, put it this way, what is the past? Is it a record or an impression? Does it exist only as a rapidly receding and fading memory? Or does it maintain a solidity and a substance? Who has not remarked at least once, where has the time gone? Does this mean we really believe that time goes somewhere? If so, where? Eric Mills is convinced he has found the answer. I know I wasn't dreaming. Maybe you were, Eric. Everything was so real. All this is coming out of your head. It's your fantasy. But everything was so... I keep saying the word, authentic. She even knew your father's name, Jerry. Oscar. Well, it's like Martha says, Eric. Now, this is what you know. And... I never knew your father's name was Oscar. Of course you did. Not consciously, perhaps, but I can swear I saw... Yeah, the... yeah Eric, yeah. Now, now, you did see it. Now, you wanted to see it. You know what I mean? I mean, for some reason, you... You got a notion that life was better in the 20s. Wait a minute. Wait. 1920. Remember, Eric? Do you remember? Remember what? The Bartlesby Tavern and Inn. No, no. Oh, you do, you do. Up in Connecticut. Mom and Dad took us there every summer. What, what does this have to... There was that poem printed on the wall. What poem? About the year 1920. The year the tavern was built. Uh, I don't remember anything about oh, it. Oh, sure. Look, you weren't even four years old, and I, I recited the poem. And you were able to memorize it just from hearing me read it once. Oh, Mom thought you were a genius. I don't know what you're talking about, Martha. Listen, uh, let's see now. I was built in 1920 in a time of peace as a place of plenty. Let no care or trouble enter. Uh, oh, finish it for me, Eric. For love and joy are at my center. <laughs> you see... Well, what does that prove? I mean, that I could... That I could make up a whole thing about being back in the 20s? Ah, uh, you could do anything. Jerry. Uh, what I mean is, with his imagination, anything is possible. Yes, and, and you've talked about the 20s. Oh, maybe I have. Well, as a writer, as a poet, would you have rather lived then or now? Oh, hey, now, what kind of question is that? Uh, he'd be dead now if he lived back then. He knows what kind of question it is. Whatever you say, I know where I was this morning. Yes, Jerry. Where you always wanted to be, back in the 20s, when, when it was easier to be a poet. Martha, everything is relative to when you were alive. But you'd rather have been alive when Hemingway was young, with Fitzgerald. You'd, you'd want to be in Paris with Gertrude Stein and Picasso. You feel that people like them would be more, well, more apt to notice your worth than the people of today. Well, what if that's true? I, I... What if it's true? Yeah, sure. I mean, the... Twenties were a more exciting time to be alive, but does that mean that I could just conjure them up? It's real. It's real. I knew it was real. Julia. Oh, now, I said I could not go to that dance. May I come in? Uh, well. Just 
for a little while. All right, but just a little while. Julia, I had to come back to you. Eric, if you're going to start that kind of talk, I'll have to ask you to leave. Right now. After all. After all After all. I am an engaged girl. Oh, listen. Isn't that a swell number? Oh. Now, I promised Dad I wouldn't use that word. What word? Swell. Dad hates slang. Julia, may I ask you a question? Mm Hmm? What year is this? (laughs) What kind of a question is that? Please, Julia. Only this morning you saw the paper. What year is it? Is there a reason why you wouldn't know? Could you tell me? (sighs) It is July 19th, 1921. You sure of that? (laughs) Honestly, Eric. (laughs) What's that? What's what? Don't you hear us? Well, I hear the train. That's what I mean, the train. There hasn't been a train here and. Oh, what are you saying? That's the ODP. The ODP? The Omaha, Denver, and Pacific, silly. Everybody knows. Are you sure you're all right? Yes. Yes, I'm sure. You know, this afternoon I promise you a glass of lemonade. I think you could use some refreshment now. Excuse me. I heard it. I know I heard it. Wait a minute. Hello? Hello? Uh, information, please. I can give you any information you want. Do, uh, you have a number for, uh, Mr. Jerry Carraway? Jerry Carraway? Well, I know Oscar spoils that child something fierce, but he ain't about to give a year old baby a phone number of his own. Um, do you want Oscar's number? Uh, What's the number of the, uh, the the movie theater in town? Oh, why do you want to know? I, I want to find out what's playing. Well, ask me. I should know. There's a picture called Intolerance with just the greatest... Oh, no. No. Oh, what do you mean, no? I'm telling you what's playing at the movie theater. I mean, uh, I mean, it's wonderful. That's what I heard. But a lot of folks say it's a little too serious. Now, over at Council Forks, they got a funny comedy with that fatty Arbuckle. Now, he is a scream. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Anything else you, you want to know? I promise you won't laugh. Well, if it's funny, I can't promise. What year is this? Uh, you're a card, all right. What year is it? 1921. Everybody knows that. Thank you. Thank you. 1921. And here we have some of Amy's famous lemonade. Mm. Mm. Isn't it good? Mm. Mm. I never knew if the boys were coming over for me (laughs) or for the lemonade. (laughs) Julia. Julia. What is it? I'm so happy. Oh, now just excuse me. Hello. Julia? Oh, what is it called, Jean? Julia, are you all right? Sure. Uh, why? Well, some man placed a call from your home just before. Yes? And he sounded just a tiny bit peculiar to me. Oh, come on, call Jean. I was just, I was just wondering, should I call Goody, Sheriff Gates? Sometimes you are so silly. Well, better be silly than sorry. Good night. Eric, what did you say to scare call Jean? Or Jean. <laughs> the telephone operator. Oh, I admit, I, I sounded crazy. What did you say? I asked her what year it was. Well, why do you have to keep asking? Don't you know? Julia, I could never explain it. And you could never understand. Then why bother? I want to stay here, Julia. Here? Here. Well, how would it look? Well, we could get married. But I... You, you what? There's... There's Jamie. The World War One has been over for three years now. What'd you call it? World War One? If you haven't found him in those three Why years... Why did you call it World War One? He has got to be dead. Why did you call it World War One? Because in 20 years there's going to be World War Two. 
What? <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> Listen, there can't be any more wars. After all we went through, well, people aren't that stupid. <laughs> Do you believe that? Well, what else can you believe? <laughs> Julia, you have got to tell me. Do you love Jamie? Well, uh, w w the, what business is that of yours? I have to know. We, we kept company for a while, and and when he left for France, he asked me to wait for him, and and could I, could I say no? Are you in love with him? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Are you in love with him? Well, I, no, but I. You can't I... make that kind of promise. You can't give him what you don't have. And what you don't have for him is love. Well, how do you know? Because you love me. Well, what makes you think that I... You love me, Julia. You have to love me. Why? Because it's right. Because it makes sense. It simply has got to be. Oh, Eric. Don't waste time, I... Julia. There is so little time. But People I... don't realize how little time they really have. Come on. Where? For a walk. <laughs> well, there's no place to go. Oh, yes, there is. We'll go to town. Well, there's nothing doing. Yes, middle. yes, I'll show you. <laughs> you are having so much trouble with Dad's old car. I can't get used to the way these gears shift. Well, here we are. It's beautiful. Well, nothing ever happens here. There's the drugstore, and the hay and feed store, and the moving picture house. And they just took the sidewalks in for the night. <laughs> That's a local joke, Eric. <laughs> Oh, and the train. Well, let's stop at the station. <laughs> well, if somebody flags it down. <laughs> uh oh. What's the matter? Oh, it's old lady Haskins. I don't want her to see me out with a fella. It'll be all over town. Take me home, Eric. <laughs> late. No, no, just sit by me for a while. Why am I thinking of a certain poem? I don't know. Why do I see the words? From too much love of living, from fear and hope set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods there be, that no life lives forever. That dead men rise up never. That even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Oh, I like that. I believe it. That no life lives forever. That dead men rise up never. That even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Would you write that down for me, Eric? Of course, darling, Here's of course. Here's paper and a pencil. Mm -hmm. That, uh, no that no life lives pencil. forever. Mm. Oh, Eric. Eric, I know now, I know in my heart, that Jamie is... Jamie is dead, and I'm glad. I shouldn't have said that. But, but, but you see, now I know that our love, which is so sweet to us, will cause no one else pain. And even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Here. Oh, Eric. This is the first gift you ever gave me. We're safe. We're safe here. It's just as I dreamed it would be. Oh, oh, that must be Dad calling from Washington, D.C. He's probably going to tell me about his meeting with the President. Well, I'll have more important news for him. And I want you to say hello to Dad. <laughs> hello, Daddy? Daddy? Julia. Oh, who is... who is this? Julia. <gasps> Jamie! Yes, Julia. It's Jamie. 
And now, among the beautiful sounds of this beautiful world, we hear introduced a new note. And we know very well it must be a note of discord. And was the poet right? Is it true that dead men rise up never? Where has Jamie come from? And where is he going? I shall have the answers when I return shortly with Act Three. And suddenly, it's 1921 for Eric Mills, who wasn't even born then. 1921, a year of innocence and, most important, peace. Not just the absence of war, but peace. And Eric Mills has somehow sought it out as a refuge from the deceptions and the dejections of the jet age. He has even found Julia, but so has Jamie... Julia's doughboy fiancé, who evidently didn't die at Chateau Thierry. Jamie? They told me you were dead. They, they left me for dead. And for a long time, I, I, I didn't know who I was. And then I remembered. I remembered you. And I've come home. Jamie, I've got to... I just got off the train. Jamie, dear. I'm coming home, Julia. I'm coming home to you. And I'll run from the station. I'll run all the way. Jamie, wait. You remember how I can run all the way? I can run even faster. Jamie, there is something I must tell you. There is something I must tell you. I'll see you very soon. It's Jamie. And he's alive. Darling, you and I, we love each other. But... That was before... Uh, before what? Before I knew Jamie was alive. Our love has nothing to do with anyone else. But Jamie still believes... A lie. Oh, don't say it that way. Well, how else can I say it? If you love me, then Jamie believes a lie. Oh, Eric, please go. Go. Quickly. Why? Before I get here. No. I'm frightened. Don't be. I'm, I'm frightened. here. No, darling, I'm frightened. Not for me, for you. Julia, there is nothing to be frightened of. He is. You don't know him the way I do. It doesn't matter. He's got a violent temper. He'll be bad enough to, to kill you. Well, I'll have something to say about that. Who says he can kill me? Is it better if you kill him? It's better for me. Oh, Eric, Eric, I don't want you to... To what? To be hurt. What can I do? I won't give you up. Oh, I don't know what to do. I am... Julia, you love me. I love you. We have a right to be happy. And Jamie? Sometimes there's only one way to say something. The only way I can say it is it's just too bad about Jamie. But I don't want us to hurt him. If Jamie is reasonable and sensible, why should anyone be hurt? Eric, he's here. He's here. Yes, stop. Oh, I'm terribly frightened. Listen, Jamie is... Uh, Crazy. He's always been a little bit crazy, but now... Julia. Oh, Julia, darling, I've come back home. Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hello, ja Jamie. Is that all you can say? Jamie. Uh... Hey, hey, who's this? Jamie Parsons. Eric Mills. Uh, who are you? He's a friend. No, that's not exactly true. I am more than a friend. Julia and I plan to get married. It... You what? You heard what I said. Uh, n never mind. Never mind what you said. I want to hear what Julia says. Well? Come on now, is it true? Oh, Jamie. Oh, Jamie, what? Now, is it or isn't it true? Now, Jamie, you and me, we never were really formally no, engaged. I, I asked you to wait for me. And I, I, I... And you promised that you would. Because you were going away. Now, let's get this straight. You mean... You... You mean you are throwing me over for... Listen, thi why don't we just all sit down and talk intelligently? Oh, no, oh, no, no. No, you, you're... You aren't going to walk out on me. Now, never. Just a minute. Huh? Now, listen, I know you. You're slick and smart and smooth talking. And you hang around while a guy is off doing something important while, while he's fighting for his country. And you, you take advantage. That's not the way it happened at all. Why don't we talk about I, this? Huh? All right, all right, buddy. Now, look, I don't know who you are. But this is your lucky night. Now, you won't get hurt, provided you just 
provided you just walk out of here fast. Look, I know how you feel, but she doesn't love you. She's been in love with me since we we're both ten years old. Now, you tell him, Julia. Jamie, listen. But don't I'll... you see what she's trying to tell you? She doesn't love you. Julia! Julia, you, you can't tell me that. He is not going to have you. No. Jamie, don't. Please, put that ah, pistol no, no, away. No, 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 he won't have you. you please won't. don't kill him. Why not? Please. Who deserves killing please, more, huh? Jamie, please. What do, you, what do you think kept me alive all these, those months in the hospital thinking of you, dreaming of you, picturing how it would be but when I got back home? Well, I am home now, and I know what i got to do. I, I won't let you. Get away from him. No. no. Listen, listen, ain't that just your style, huh? Hiding behind a woman's skirts. I don't have to hide anywhere. <laughs> I better let go of that gun. I'm going to kill you. Let go. Stop it, both of you. Stop it. I... Jamie. Oh. Oh, is it Julia? Oh, it... It is... He's... He's dead. I didn't mean... You saw that? I... I didn't want... Who... Who are you? Eric. I'm Eric. Who... Are you? Eric. The man who loves you. Oh. Oh, yeah. I need someone to love me. I need someone to love me now. Now that Jamie's gone. What can we do about Jamie? <gasps> There's only one thing I can do. Give myself up. No, they'll put you in prison. I have to pay for Jamie. I'll turn myself in. No, Eric. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. I have to do it. Don't leave me. <laughs> wait, wait for me, Julia. Will you wait for me? I'm looking for the sheriff. Eric. Now, Eric, boy, you... The sheriff. Where's the sheriff? I killed a man. You didn't kill anybody. Eric. Where am I? Eric. Eric, did drink this. Now, 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 what has gotten into you? I killed a man. What are you saying? Who? His name is Jamie. Ja Jamie Parsons. We were having a fight over this girl I told you about, Julia Sanford. Eric, you have got to listen now. Jamie Parsons was killed... Way back in uh, 1920 or thereabouts. No! Please listen, Eric. Don't tell me I'm crazy. Eric, look, we found you wandering around on the road. I was looking for the sheriff. Eric, uh, now way back after the first war, Jamie Parsons came home. Now he was sweet on Julia Sanford. Now he was also crazy. Maybe it was what they call uh, shell shock in those days. But anyway, he tried to kill her, and somehow the, the gun went off and killed him. No, no, I was there. No, no, I no, 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 no. It was too much for Julia. After her father died, she she shut herself up all alone. That big house, it just went to ruin, you know. She kind of uh, lost her marble. Oh, you're uh, talking about someone else. Now, her dad, Big Jim, was my godfather. And so we go over there regular. Now, we bring her food and we'll, we'll see that she's still alive. Now, let me show you. No, Eric. I think the time has come for us to show you. <laughs> This can't be the place, the lawns, the gardens, flowers. It was, it was like a park. Eric, this is the Sanford place. But the house, it's falling apart. Now, you can see that... But the... it was so beautiful just yesterday. Oh, Eric, not yesterday. Fifty years ago. But I tell you, I... Eric, dear, when we meet her, smile. She gets very upset if people don't smile. Yeah, the bell. The doorbell. It's the same. Who is it? Morning, Miss Julie. Who, who are you? Uh, it's Jerry. You remember me, Miss Julie? I'm Jerry. Oscar Caraway's boy. Oh, Jerry. How, how's your dad? Why, just fine, Miss Julie, just fine. My dad is still in Washington. Uh-huh. 
I expect him home any time. <laughs> but the president keeps him there. Oh, come in. Come in. The uh, phonograph. Uh, Martha's here, too. Well, I am so glad. How are you, Martha? Just fine, Miss Julia. And uh, we brought a guest. Oh, you know I don't like to meet strangers unless I have a chance to dress up first. Martha, you should have told me. But he's not I a stranger. Don't... Now, he's kin. That's Martha's baby brother. Oh, well, that's different. His name is Eric. Well, how do you do, Eric? How d- do you do, Miss Julia? Amy? Amy, please bring a pitcher of lemonade and four glasses. Eric, Amy's been dead 50 years. Eric, Eric, Eric. Now, I knew an Eric once a sweet boy was home from the war. Uh, you mean uh, Jamie? No, 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 no. The name was Eric. We were in love. <laughs> so much in love. He didn't stay long. You all right, Miss Julia? I mean, is there anything you need? He, uh, I wrote down a poem for me. I look at it every day. Every day. Read it. Read it, Eric. It is so beautiful. Oh, be careful. That paper's old and falling apart. <laughs> Just like me. And the ink has faded. I, uh, Can you read it? From too much love of living. From hope and fear set free. We thank with brief thanksgiving... Whatever gods there be, that no life lives forever. That dead men rise up never. Never. That even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. To see. La vida es sueño. Life is a dream, as the Spanish poet said. And even dreams are dreams. In that case, when are we dreaming? When are we awake? If we can't tell for sure who we are, how can we possibly know who we were? But whether here or in a dream, I, at least, shall be back shortly. To complete our expedition into poetry, the greatest poet of them all said, All the world's a stage, and all of us are players. And so this raises the logical question, are we a permanent cast? Do we keep coming back to play the roles for which we are best suited? Have we led these lives before? Well, you just listen to us again. And for an hour, anyhow, you'll be able to lead a brand new life. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Bryna Rayburn, Marion Seldes, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
your blood runs cold at specters rising from the moss-grown grave or bloody murder of the innocent while the evil and the damned hold sway, now is the time to leave. All right, if you prefer to stay, come with me now to the strange and forbidding house that fades and reappears strangely in the mists of the moors where it is situated. The house of Cadmus Melchior, where the handsome Baron Mark Staunton is making a request which sounds more like a command. I want Melinda. Must you invade my privacy? This laboratory is open to no one but me. I am... I was your son-in-law. I have the right. I cannot live without your daughter. Melinda has been dead for seven years. But you can raise her from the grave. Uh, you must! Uh... It's true, I believe I am very close at last to the elixir of life. Then in God's name use it to bring Melinda back to me. No, not yet. Not yet. You were so close to death yourself, what are you afraid of? My fear is more for you. I warn you, my son. I warn you. Do not try to wake the dead. mystery drama, The Spectral Bride, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Wager and Joan Loring. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Never heard of beer on the rocks? No? Swell. <laughs> the people who brew Budweiser never have thought ice in your beer was such a cool idea anyway. If you only knew how ice cuts down the head and waters the taste. Oh, a chilling thought. A downright tragedy with Budweiser especially. Budweiser is the king of beers. The only beer in America that's beechwood aged. Naturally carbonated. Which means Bud brews its own bubbles. Tiny ones over a dense lattice of beechwood strips. The beer ages the best way. The right way. Naturally. But add an ice cube and bloop, there goes all that extra effort. So if you forget to cool enough bud, skip the cubes and put your Budweiser on ice for a while. On the coldest shelf in your refrigerator. Even if the weight does frost you a little, it'll be worth it. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. It's Frigidaire Factory Discount Days. Frigidaire Factory Discount Days? What do you get? What do you get? Get, get. Coupons for cash refunds. Cash refunds? That's right. Between September 22nd and October 12th, it's Frigidaire Factory Discount Days. And you can get cash refunds when you buy selected Frigidaire appliances. You get a $10 cash refund direct from Frigidaire when you buy an FPCI 170T refrigerator, an RSC 36 range, a WCD washer, or a DCD dryer. You get a $15 refund when you buy an LC2 or an LCT 120 Skinny Mini Home Laundry Center. And you get a $25 refund when you buy both the washer and dryer. To receive your refund, just mail the coupon provided by your Frigidaire dealer and proof of purchase direct to Frigidaire. Coupons for cash refunds, where are they at? Where are they at? At, at? at your nearest Frigidaire appliance dealer. So have a good day on Frigidaire. I warn you, do not try to wake the dead. And yet, who among us who truly believed that some power could restore a loved one could be strong enough to resist the temptation? Let us remember, too, that in other days, an alchemist was a man accorded most infinite respect. Quite apart from his search to transmute baser metal to gold, his basic interest was his humanistic effort to produce the cure-all, the elixir of life, which would alleviate and end all human pain. To a man like Baron Mark Staunton, the alchemist was a figure of total respect, almost adulation. And uh, as for his daughter, Melinda... <laughs> But uh, Mark can talk about her better than I. Oh, 
That's a handsome filly. A little short in the leg, I'd say. Hey, fat billowing skirt, how can you see? Oh, not the horse, cousin, the lady. Look at that, take that wall. Beautiful. Oh, I'll grant you the lady has a firm hand and an admirable seat. But she's a wild one and highly selective. Ah, so you've made your own advances and gotten your knuckles whacked? Cousin Mark, if I didn't have a natural fondness for you, I could resent that. Particularly since it's true. But it goes a little deeper than that. How so? I am scarcely a man to be ridden by superstition. I distrust all philosophers, dreamers, astrologers, and most of all, the alchemist. All right, I won't argue, but must the alchemist's daughter pattern herself on what her father thinks? I couldn't figure out what the alchemist's daughter thinks or believes. She is too much for me. And like a good soldier, I know when to retreat and when to accept defeat. But how am I to find out what she thinks or believes? Or what she's like? That's simple enough. I may not have measured up, but I am still welcome at their home. Can you take me there? Soon? When? I don't know why I retained any family fondness for you. Your insistence on not going home without a bag full of grouse has kept us so late, the afternoon mists are already clouding the moor. It might be best to ride to Mantra Manor till they blow away with the setting sun. Mantra Manor? The center of your heart's desire. If Professor Cadmus Melchior is out of his laboratory and in a good mood, we may even enjoy some good mulled wine. What about his daughter? Shall we meet her? That will be strictly up to the lady who has a mind of her own. Does she also have a name? <laughs> her name is Melinda. But if you'll forgive some friendly advice, she's as hard to gentle as your own stallion was. Melinda. Not the way the name sounds. What's in a name? But if it's your wish... It's more than my wish. I know it as well as my name. It's my fate! Let's go! <laughs> The alchemist was a tall, cadaverous man with piercing green eyes that gleamed like emeralds from the shadows beneath great tufted brows. But my own eyes had little time to spend on him. Instead, they followed Melinda as though controlled not by me, but by the spell of her presence. She had changed to a long, white, silken robe which clung to her body. Her face was impassive, but the long raven hair danced in curls against the white of her dress and her skin. And her eyes, so dark brown as to be nearly black, shone with excitement and mystery. You picked a fortunate hour, Baron Hayward, to visit with me again. Just at the evening meal, you and your friend will join me. After a day's hard riding, I would be honored to accept your invitation. And your friend? Mark? Mark? What? We have been invited to share the doctor's meal. Most gracious of you, Dr. Cadmus. First, some wine. Melinda? Bruce? Thank you, Melinda. Sir? From your hand. Even wormwood and gall. <laughs> I trust you will find my wine more to your palate than that. Sire? Thank you, daughter. You may leave us alone now. I could have killed him cheerfully. Naturally, I thought Melinda would be joining us. Here I was, already hopelessly in love, and instead of being able to feed my eyes on her, I... I had to face some strange gelatinous potion ladled from a steaming pot onto my plate. When Bruce first came calling, he used to look on these potpourris of mine as if they contained newt's eyes, bat wool, and dog's tongues. <laughs> I assure you, it is naught but the best of venison, flavored with some condiments my daughter and I favor. I've never tasted better. I speak for the wine also. Your taste, doctor, is impeccable in all things. But does your daughter not join us for the meal? My daughter leads her life like a cat. An untamed one, may I add. And especially with this visit, I 
think she feels there would be less strain with her absence. Mark is my cousin, Doctor. He knows Melinda did not choose to marry me. Does he also know that I was against the marriage? No, sir. Well, ask why my cousin comes of a long and honorable line and his wealth and position are secure. I know no finer man. I will not speak for Melinda. For myself. Ah... Write it off to the fact that no one else has a better grasp of my work. And I'm selfish enough to want to hold on to her just a few more years. Why just a few? Have you so little time left? My death is written in the stars. I'm not as selfish as you might think. But I am close, so close to the elixir of life that I hope I do not lose her help till that moment is here. And you will hold her till then? I will try. The end is all. At my age, I'm less concerned with ends than with beginnings. My remark in itself might have seemed harmless enough, but the professor or doctor was super sensitive to underlying meanings. And those searching eyes turned on me as if they could search out the uttermost meaning of my soul. I felt for a moment as though a ghost had crept across my grave. Thank you for your hospitality, sir. Uh, you are welcome, sir. I apologize only for having no household staff. All my slender resources go into my experiments. Uh, that's why I had to ask Bruce to go fetch your horses. I should have gone with him. I lingered only in the hope of bidding good evening to the Lady Melchior. And I held you only to suggest that you forget, Melinda. I'm afraid that would be an impossibility, Doctor. Uh, I was afraid of that. You object if I try to call on her? I doubt if it would do any good. But my daughter is her own mistress. I can only caution you caution that... Caution is for old men, Father, not for the young. Still, I am here in this name. What do you mean? The mist lies like a blanket on the moor. Even Bruce, as well as he knows the way, could not find it to the town, let alone Sir Mark. I have made up beds for both of them. They must stay and be our guests. For myself, I accept... Gladly, but perhaps Dr. Melchior... No, 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 no. Melinda is right. It's as dark as a witch's pocket abroad. And unseasonably cold for these old bones. And besides, who am I to stand in the way of fate? Go in, Father, dear. I shall see our guests settled and safe. Settled. But uh, safe? God's will be done. I shall see you in the morning. Good night, Father. Good night, Dr. Melchior. Well, Sir Mark, shall we walk together to the stables and tell Bruce he need not saddle the horses? Or to the end of the earth and beyond. Or to the end of the earth and beyond. But we should tell Bruce. Of course. If you'll lend me your hand to lead me the way. Come. It's beyond all reason, wild, improbable. But since I first saw you take your horse across that stone wall... <laughs> There's a gap in it not three feet away from where I went over, but I wanted to be sure you noticed me. How could I have missed you? Bruce might have wanted you to. I know about you and Bruce. But there never was anyone more honest and true-hearted, and he loves me like a brother. I think it would be very hard for anyone not to love you. Even you. It's scarcely seemly for the maid to make the first declaration. Does it have to be put in words? The moment our eyes crossed, you knew. I love you from the present dark to tomorrow's dawn. And all tomorrows. From this first moment to the last. To the grave and beyond. You don't even know me. And teach me to learn. It will not be hard. For I love you the same. Tomorrow we will say the word. 
The actual words that bind us. Forever. Will you love and protect me and never let me go, Mark? You know I will. Oh, I want time to stand still. I won't grow old. It will for us. You never will for me. Even if we're parted? We won't be. But should we be? I'd kill myself. No. No, never. I won't allow you to harm yourself. Just never stop loving me. Never. Promise me that. And I can never truly die. I promise you. And you will not die. We were married. And lived six months in such a state of bliss and absolute love that... Not one solitary thing, not even a vagrant thought of any world beyond us intruded on our paradise. And then, one day, out riding. I think your love is cooling. It needs reviving. Remember the first day you saw me? Feel this burn the blade? Before I could move... She clapped spur to her horse and headed for a high stone wall. The approach was too short and the horse could not clear the wall. His front legs crashed knee high against the stone and the horse and rider catapulted head over heels among a shower of rocks. By the time I got to Melinda, she was dead. No goodbye, just gone like a snuffed out candle. Dead. Up a broken neck. Father-in-law, in God's name. I've been waiting for you, my son. I know. You are the alchemist. Your elixir of life. Another six months. But I have not yet found the key. We are both to blame for her death. You knew it was coming? If I had known for sure. Uh, but second sight is not infallible. And I wanted her happiness even above my mission in life. We both gambled and lost. Or perhaps I should say, all three of us. Isn't there some hope that your elixir... For centuries, that has remained a dream. Linda is in the grave forever. No. No, I'll never accept that. I'll find a way. He cannot fly in the face of God, my son. From this day forth, because of what he has taken from me, I renounce him. And I damn him to take his place with Lucifer and all the other fallen angels. How easily in the heat of passion, of the agony of loss, the thoughtless words spring to our lips. How fortunate we are that so seldom are we held to account for them. But the Baron Mark Staunton was not to escape so easily, nor his unwilling partner, Dr. Cadmus Melchior, as we shall see when I return shortly with Act Two. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah? Uh, I would like to ask a deceptively simple question. Okay. I say deceptive because few people seem to know the answer. Oh, yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, ready as rain. Okay. No, no, wait, wait, wait. I think that should be uh, right as rain. Oh, well, no, I... you wait, wait. Make that, make that ready as I'll ever be, okay? Uh, <laughs> ready as I'll ever be. What, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, the question is this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what happens this time of year? Huh? Uh, the... That's it. Huh? That's the question. That's yeah. the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, yeah, I... that, that's the one. The one for all the marbles, uh, right? Well, I... hmm? that's the one that's on everybody's lips. Huh? Yes. That's the question. Well, oh, as everyone should know, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving great deals on nineteen seventy-four Buicks, which of course means that this time of year may very well be the best chance you'll ever have to buy a Buick. From the thrifty but surprisingly elegant Apollo to the dashing full-size LeSabre to the Electra, which surprisingly enough is the second largest selling luxury car in America. Know it all. Pretty soon it'll be time to go indoors and hibernate again. When you do, you'll start looking for ways to stay warm during those cold winter months. Frank Labor here with some help from True Value Hardware Stores. They have Arvin's Radiant Fan Forced Heater, for instance, to warm that hard-to-heat workshop laundry area or any room in your home. Has a big reflector to move heated air faster and a safety tip-over switch. It's just 1088. You'll stay warm on the inside, too, with the hearty meals you cook in Presto's six-quart pressure cooker. It cooks up to ten times faster, so foods retain their natural vitamins, minerals, and flavor. 
Made of sturdy cast aluminum, it costs just $14.88. True Value hardware stores have a General Electric Chronotil digital alarm clock, too, to help you get out of bed on those cold mornings. It's compact in size and has large, easy-to-read digits that rotate smoothly and quietly. And it's only $9.88. You'll find them all at your nearby participating True Value hardware store. particularly if one is in the early 20s. And loneliness was far from Baron Mark Staunton's natural estate. Indeed, the extent of his physical estate made it incumbent on him to be married and to produce heirs who would maintain the line. And so, within the year, he had married well, unlike his cousin Bruce, still a bachelor. Darling, why so pensive? Oh, oh I was just thinking of... Poor lonely Bruce. I swear he enjoys our children more almost than we do. I hope that isn't so with you. It certainly isn't with me, Mark. Oh, Anne. My lovely wife and mother. No man could ask for a fuller, richer life than I have. You find me a satisfactory wife? You have all the love I have to give. Why should you question it? It's foolish, I know, but... Every time Bruce comes to visit. What? Oh, I'm ashamed of myself, really. But it brings her to mind. And I ask God to forgive me for what I feel about a young girl who met a sad death so early. We have never talked about... about my first wife before. I must be growing older or more secure... Ah, oh, but I do love you so. Which makes us a pair of doves. Thank you, my love. And now I must go up to the children's room and be a bear. I know how they adore their Uncle Bruce. But he does get them so excited with his games and fun, and I can never get them off to sleep. I'll send him down. As I step to the fire to stir it up, somehow that simple exchange between a comfortably married man and wife had evoked another picture. That wild, tempestuous, selfish passion of seven years ago. From the glowing embers, the face of Melinda, dark eyes ablaze, hair flying in the wind. The face I had so long forced out of my mind suddenly faced me, accusing me, reminding me of all the irrevocable promises made in the heat of youth. I was glad to be interrupted as Bruce came to join me. You lucky old sinner. Two wives and kids like that. What? What's the matter? What ails you? Oh, memories. More and more they haunt me. First, it was only in my dreams, but now they invade my waking hours. What are you talking about? Melinda. What else? All those years ago and still not out of your mind. Is she out of yours? Bruce, how... How would you like a... A visitor by month's end? You? You know my hunting lodge is too small. Just your old hunting companion. And the grouse season is at its height. Anne and the children go to visit Milady and Earl, and I would go to greater lengths to miss that dull, dreary household. That's not fair to Anne. Oh, not Anne. Bless her. She's been the finest of wives and mothers. Just her... Her kin... Ah, oh, for the sake of old ties and friendship, Bruce, free me for once from this deadly annual visit or part of it. Invite me, when Anne returns, to shoot with you over old grounds. A man's retreat to his own company. Well, it would be good to ride along with you again across the moors. Selfishly, I would welcome the visit. <laughs> Would you miss me so much? Every second of every minute of every hour of every day. That's all. My gentle, kind, and loving Anne. Shall we split the difference? Two weeks away from your mother's patronizing me and your father's cold dislike. I'm sorry about my parents. (laughs) You more than I. You've had to suffer them all your life. I know how much you've taken from them, and I hate going just as much as you. I... 
go only for the children's sake and because I owe them some respect. But I don't blame you for not wanting to be there. So go with Bruce and be free for a little while. But meet me halfway, just two weeks. I may be longing for all three of you before that in return. I hope so. At least that you miss us. And no ghosts will haunt you from the past. Ghosts? Well, didn't... Didn't your first wife come from nearby Bruce's Lodge? She did. And after six years under the ground, she is surely dead enough. And you know me well enough by now to know I hold no traffic in ghosts. And so I went with Bruce back into the past. Did I really believe it had no hold on me? Was the tomb I had built in the darkest recesses of my heart from Melinda total recognition of her death? Or did some irrational hope still burn like a flame? That first night at Bruce's hunting lodge, we drank more than we should have and stayed up far too late. It was the darkest hour before the dawn when I was awakened by... Huh? Oh, God. Oh, well. Oh, sleep. Mark! Mark! You have come back. Melinda. Look. Melinda. Look to the window. Melinda. As you were. As I could be. It's the seventh year. And three nights from now, the moon is new. Go to my father. Make him bring me back. No. Melinda. Let me talk to you now. Melinda! What's going on? Melinda. Hmm? She was there just beyond the window. I could see her. Oh, you're as drunk as I am. Nobody outside that window. It's 30 feet to the... Ah, <laughs> uh, there'll be no hunting tomorrow. We're due for heavy rain. Oh, oh, my head is splitting. Let's both go to bed and sleep off our carousing. I shall ask for nothing better than that. But whatever sleep I had was fitful because... As Bruce had predicted, the rain came slanting down. The black clouds lay so low across the moors a man might have reached and touched them from the back of a tall horse. At last, I could stand it no longer. I had to face the magnet which had drawn me back to my past. I looked in on my snoring cousin, breakfasted on black bread and brandy, and sat being my horse. Rode for the alchemist's isolated home. Suddenly it was seven years ago and I almost expected Melinda to appear out of the fog. Yes? Who is it? You don't recognize your own flesh and blood? Oh, I have ever had a flesh and blood that's laid mouldering in the grave for seven years. I'm not so close then, I admit. But I was your daughter's husband. What? Why should you return at this particular moment? Oh, for first, come in, come in. It is foul weather. And chill enough in here. Uh, alone, I cannot tend the fires and watch my experiments. <laughs> uh, what brings you here? Melinda. You are married with a wife and children. What does Melinda mean to you anymore? My heart, my soul, my only real reason for being. What I was died with her. What I am is a dream I live. A dream no longer worth living, especially after last night. Come. Come into my laboratory. It's the only place where there is warmth. Ah, what do you mean by especially last night? 
I saw her. Where? Outside my window. It's a Bruce Hayward's lodge. The sleeping quarters are on the second floor. It was but a dream. I tell you, she or... Her spirit was there. She sent me here with a message. What message? That this was the seventh year. And in three nights, the moon is new. She bade me tell you... Bring her back. No. No. I cannot listen to her plea. Why not? What do you know of science, any of you? The weary hours, the years of failure, and the curse of failing hope. The need for direct experiment and the lack of subjects to try it on. And beyond and deeper than that, the right... Whether man has the right to meddle in the affairs of God. That means you have found the elixir. I didn't say that. You must be close. Close, yes. Close. Little hope of being closer. My age. And there is no more money. Why not try it on yourself? <laughs> How do you suppose I have existed these past years? On the elixir? One person doesn't create proof. I can make so little. But I think it has sustained me. And can't it do the same for Melinda? Well, oh, that is so different. She has been dead for seven years. But you can raise her from the grave. You must. I reflect on one thing. If she could be brought back from the beyond, you are hers forever. Be aware now that if I could bring Melinda back, you would never be rid of her. This marriage would be for eternity, forever, till the graves all open wide and the dead revive on Judgment Day. What you are risking here is your immortal soul. If I must, I must. So be it. The time will never be more advantageous. Meet me alone by the gallows tree, and I will transport you from there to the grave where Melinda waits for you. And me. But I warn you, if you value your life, do not keep our appointment. Do not try to wake the dead. <laughs> A woman moldering to dust in the fetid earth to be brought back to life? And if his first wife lives again, what happens to Mark's second? And his children? And most of all, himself? Could he live with both? Or must he make a choice? Will he be allowed a choice? In attempting to give life to Melinda, is he perhaps signing his own death warrant? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take Sinoff tablets, S-I-N-E-O-F-F, -F, the sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sinoff, the sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And Sinoff doesn't stop there. Have you tried Sinoff Sinus Spray, the fastest known form of sinus congestion relief? It works in seconds. That sign off sinus spray. When sinus flares up, use sign off tablets and spray only as directed. S I N E O F F. Sign off. Exactly. Sign off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. My daughter, the Dallas Times Herald carrier, has what she calls some good news and some bad news. The cost of home delivery of the Dallas Times Herald is going up. Starting October 1st, it's going to cost $3.40 to have the Dallas Times-Herald delivered in Dallas County. It costs more to deliver the paper because it costs more to produce it. For example, there's a worldwide shortage of newsprint. And costs have gone up 27% this year. There's also a shortage of printer's ink, and that cost has doubled. Okay, now for the good news. 
The Dallas Times Herald is still the best written, best read newspaper in town. This year it won more journalism awards than any other newspaper in Texas. And this year it's overtaken the morning paper in total Sunday circulation. So while you have to pay more to have Dallas's leading newspaper delivered to your home, it's still a bargain. And a bargain these days is good news. It was the poet Swinburne who said, We thank with brief thanksgiving whatever gods may be, that no man lives forever, and dead men rise up never. Certainly all of us could subscribe to that and believe in it. And yet, we could oppose that other famous quotation from Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Let's see which proves more apt this time in this tale. For two days I tried to find another world to escape to, but no amount of wine or liquor dulled my thoughts or dampened my hope. Fortunately, it had the opposite effect on Bruce, and so when I left on the night of the new moon for my rendezvous with the alchemist, he was out as if he'd been clubbed. Mark? Yes, Doctor? You are alone? Yes. Then follow me to the graveyard. Will, will the rain make any difference? There will be no rain there. We are expecting... right. From the moment we left the gallows tree, the rain had stopped. And high above the scudding clouds, the fingernail of the brand new moon appeared and disappeared as if pointing straight at us. Come with me to the grave. For the last time, I warn you, wake not the dead. Let her rest. I let her rest. But upon me. Reflect. She is six years dead. Who knows what awesome creature of loathing I am to resurrect? Then if it be so, I will join her now. It shall be as you wish. Step back. <laughs> Sorcerer's stick and drew three circles about the tomb. As he traced them, he muttered words of enchantment as he completed the third circle with a great flash of lightning. The stone rolled from the grave. And the coffin was revealed. Bats and owls rushed by. A rushing wind blew the earth scattering a mold of air. And of a sudden, with a rending sound, As the moonbeams go, streamed as bright as if it were the full. And from the skull which Cadmus had filled with the smoking liquid, he poured the elixir on the grave, crying, The heart beats once more with the blood of life. Thine eye is open to sight. Arise, Melinda, from the tomb. And suddenly, Rising from the rotting wood as fresh as though it had been yesterday, pale and cold from her long sleep with the black eyes flashing, and that glorious black hair tumbling about her shoulders was my Melinda, alive and breathing. Thank you, my beloved doctor, for restoring her to me. My last act, my last warning... We should have left the dead in peace. May God forgive me. The flood of torrential rain made anything but emergency action possible. I had scarce time to fold my chill and lovely bride in my arms before we had to drag her father to the tomb she had so recently risen from. Together we rolled the stone back into place. Melinda mounted my horse while I took the old man's. 
Darling, we'll write to Bruce's lodge and warm you. No, Mark, please. I want to go home. Miss Weather, chilled as you are already. My blood flows warmer every minute. And the longer ride will warm and bring me back to full life again. Is there any reason why we can't go home? No reason in the world. Beloved, you're so cold, so so cold. How could you expect the chill of the grave to melt so soon? Shall I take you to my bed and warm you with my body? Too soon for that. You're not my husband anymore. I am your lover. Who broke your pledge to me? Remember? Oh, Melinda, I... You left me to rot in the grave. I begged your father to try the elixir to raise you again. He said it was not ready. He told me he had foreseen your death if you married me. He felt it was God's will. So you married another woman. And with her you conceived the children who might have been mine. I did all that. But it was I who drove your father into bringing you back. And now? Anne and, and the children will not be back for three weeks. We have all that time together to renew our love. For three weeks? And then? Well, we, we will come to some arrangement, some place for you to stay, or part of the castle, or, or and back with her parents, whatever works best. No! I want that woman out of my life. Divorce. That would be next to impossible. The bishop I'm not ne- interested in divorce. You will be all mine. Or there is nothing between us. She would have to die before she... Before she'd give you up. Then let her die. Her time has come. There is only one way for me as what I was and will forever be your wife. Alone. I was warned. I should have known. Admitted it. And I was trapped. I loaded my pistols and mounting my horse rode for my father-in-law's house and Anne. I had no clear idea of what my intent was. I was mad, of course, and possessed. I had to have Melinda no matter the cost. And Anne was in the way. At her father's castle, I found Anne in the turret. It was a mild evening with a soft wind blowing, and I didn't know what I would have to do after I'd explained it to her, like everything else in our life. She resolved it. Hear the gulls cry in the distance, Mark. So strident when they are near. So mournful far away. It's like a sound I've heard faintly in my heart ever since we married. I gave you all the love I had to give. You said that once before. I should have read it more clearly. I thought Melinda could be forgotten vain thought now. Oh, and what can I say? Say? There's nothing to be said. What can you do? That's more to the point, isn't it? There are no half ways, and divorce would never be recognized. So what? Shall you shoot me? No, no. I wouldn't want to force you to do that. I used to come up here when I was a little girl, and I would think, how lovely if I could step from this turret, spread my skirts, and fly, fly like the seagulls, skimming downward to the sea. It's because I love you, you see. Go fast, for no one knows you're here. Take care of the children. Huh. No! Goodbye. I love you. She was gone before I could reach her. Her skirts spreading like wings, but too weak to hold her up against the crags below. How long do you decently mourn a wife? Certainly more than three short weeks. But Melinda could not shake her chill. And the roses, once so bright in her cheeks, seen fading, and the luster of her air and eyes dimming. To have her in my bed, she must be my wife. And I felt that only I could bring her life again. To save her anything was worth it. The censure of my neighbors, the sullen resistance from my servants, even the disgust for my old friend Bruce. Oh, I miss 
mad as you are to stand up with you at this wedding. I cannot live without her, Bruce. Was there ever such a wedding? At least don't take your pistols to the altar. I carry them everywhere I go. No one believes I did not push Anne to her death. There is no one, perhaps save you, who would not like to see me dead. You and Melinda. Oh, God. Look at her in that white veil and pure white dress. Was anything ever lovelier? I was drunk with love and undeserved happiness. The ceremony went by in a daze until at last I turned to put the ring on her finger. In sick horror, I gazed at her hand. A skeleton's hand. The jointed bones with their shreds of desiccated flesh disintegrating in my hand cry of agony, I stepped back and ripped the veil away from her face. Two socketless eyes looked blindly at me from the crumbling skull. Then, slowly, her whole frame collapsed inside the beaded dress to a pitiful heap of empty silk. Melinda was gone, and there was only one way I could join her. Mark! Take care of the children. It was all foretold the alchemist knew only way Melinda and I can be with each other. It was Cadmus Melchior the alchemist who knew it as a philosopher, and yet was as weak as Mark, who was only a man who loved too well. We cannot fly in the face of God. And, I warn you, do not try to wake the dead. Such is the story of the spectral bride. I'll be back shortly. How many things can your family do together? Go to a movie? Go to a circus? Go on a picnic? Go on a vacation? Face it, in today's America, family fun is hard to come by. And with busy schedules... Just getting the family together is not an easy thing to do. How would you like to have a little family fun every week? How would you like to learn together? How would you like to grow together? And how would you like to help your son get an edge on growing up? Cub Scouting is helping families like yours be a family. It's your help to ours. Today's Cub Scout program is just as much for families as it is for boys. So when your son wants to join a Cub Scout pack... Remember to take along the whole family. That's what Cub Scouting is all about. For the Cub Scout pack nearest you, call the Boy Scouts of America. They're in the white pages of your phone book. I don't know at what hour you heard this story, or what season of the year. For me... Whenever I tell it, even on a summer's evening, some hint of old age always creeps into my bones. The fingertips chill, and my wife complains of cold feet. Mine. It does chill the blood. No doubt of it. And I hope it isn't true. Our cast included Michael Wager, Joan Loring, Patricia Elliott, Robert Dryden, and Jordan Charney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You'll help, John. I've always helped him. I'll still help him after I'm dead. What? Oh, what? Mrs. Loomis, you, you must leave now. After I'm dead, I'll come back. But, George, Mrs. Loomis... Yes. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye for now. Doctor. I'm I'm sorry, but there isn't a chance in the world. He can hang on for minutes, days, but we can't save him. But I was just talking to him. You heard. I heard nothing. He he wasn't saying anything. But I heard him. I heard him. Mrs. Loomis, it's it's just your imagination. 
Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. based on a teaching in the greatest life ever lived. Our scene is a great house in Jerusalem where the master has been invited to eat the Sabbath meal. As they wait for their guests to arrive, the men eye each other expectantly till one of them says, uh, <clears throat> Well, it's on everyone's mind. We might as well talk about it. What could you possibly mean, Caleb? The way you're all looking at the seat at the head of the table, I can see that you each feel entitled to it. Am I right, Samuel? Well, now that you've mentioned the subject yourself, it's possible that I feel I'm entitled to sit in the chief place. Oh, oh, but you see, Samuel, there are others who feel the right is theirs. And if you look around, you'll notice that there is no man here who is inferior to the others. And um, since I did the inviting, I might as well allow you all to share my little joke. I don't joke about my standing in the community. Soon the master will arrive. At any moment. We shall present this question to him. We'll let him settle the matter of who shall have the place of honor. What's the... Oh. Master, we bid you welcome to the Sabbath meal. And uh, you've come at a propitious time, for we have a great problem which has come up. None of us seems able to settle it. Master, which man here shall be entitled to the chief seat at the table? Yes, Master. Which one of us? Hmm. No answer? Is it because you can't decide, Master? The Master will answer you. Don't worry about that. We didn't address you, whoever you are. My name is Peter. I follow the master. I am here to see that no harm comes to him. Can it harm him to answer a single question? Master, I want an answer. Who is entitled to the place of honor? Will you answer, master? Whosoever exalteth himself shall be a base. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Aha! Is that an answer? It's the master's answer. But if it's not clear to you, then perhaps you'll explain with a parable. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest place. say, Nathan? Well, well. I didn't mean to interrupt you during the business day, Boaz, but I wanted to give you as much notice as possible. Well, it isn't every day a young man gets married, is it, Nathan? <laughs> no, yeah. sir. And certainly not to any girl so lovely and fine as Ruth. Yes, and uh, you want me to attend? Yes, sir. Ruth's father, he said he would consider it a great honor if you, as my employer, would be there. Yeah, naturally. May I give him your answer this evening? Of course, of course. I should be delighted to attend, especially in view of the fact that I'm assured the place of honor. Assured the place of honor? Well, isn't that what you said, Nathan? What Ruth's father said? Or are you changing your mind? After all, as overseer of the greatest farm in this area, the honor should go to me. Shouldn't it? Well, sir, I, I don't know. Indeed. You see, I don't know what other plans have been made. I don't know who Benjamin has invited. How can I say the place of honor will be yours? I feel that I've been deceived, Nathan. 
Oh, but... First, you as much as promised me the place of honor, and now you seem to have changed your mind. You can understand that a man of my standing might feel he'd been insulted. You understand, Nathan, insulted. But, Boaz, all I said but was... But if you choose to insult me, Nathan, there's nothing I can do. So I don't have to attend your wedding, you know. Well, sir, I... Would you give me a chance to talk to Ruth's father about it? Of course, my boy. Talk it over. I'm sure you'll arrive at the right decision. Yes, sir. Darling, the way Boaz talked, it was almost a threat. What do you mean, a threat? He's my employer. It might mean I'd lose my place on the farm. After how hard you worked for so long? Oh, no, Nathan. We might as well face it. Boaz is a vain man. Anyone who insults him is open to retaliation. In my case, well... Might mean my job. And now, of all times, when we're just beginning to build our lives together, it's important. The most important thing there is. Then there's only one thing to do. Talk to my father. Oh, I don't want to bother him with this. It'll spoil everything for him. You know how he's looked forward to this time. You'd better talk to him, Nathan. If there's going to be trouble, we might as well face it. Come, he's at his blacksmith shop now. to keep talking as I work. After all, I can't allow the iron to grow cold. <coughs> well, Nathan, Ruth? We've told you everything, Father. Boaz won't come to the wedding unless he's guaranteed the place of honor. <coughs> I'll be finished here in just a moment. <coughs> now to throw it into the cooling vat. Here, Father, let me wipe your face. It's so wet, the sweat is running in streams. Thank you, dear. <laughs> when the Lord commanded that man would earn his bread by the sweat of his brow, he should have provided that blacksmiths would be the richest of men. For after all, who sweats more, eh? <laughs> oh, Benjamin, please. About Boaz. Boaz, yes. It's impossible, son. Impossible. There is at least one other man who comes before him. But, Father, Nathan's place on the farm, he may lose it. How would we live there now? Daughter, do you think that means nothing to me? I may be only a blacksmith, but I've got my pride. Your mother always wanted you to have a great wedding, to have all our friends there. It's going to be just as she would have arranged it herself if she were here. I know, Father, you did your best, but this... How could we ever expect that this would happen? Boaz. Ever since he's become overseer, he thinks he's better than anyone else. It wouldn't have been this way in Ezekiel's time. When he owned that farm, he supervised it himself. A fair man with no false pride. But when he died, he left the farm in Boaz's care so his own son could remain in Jerusalem to continue his studies. All that doesn't help us now. What can we do? You want me to insult my dearest friend? You mean Samson? A great scholar, a kindly man. Why, I couldn't even think of having my daughter married without having Samson there. I know you two have been friends a long time. A long time? All our lives. We grew up together in this very town. I always knew he'd grow up to be a scholar, and he did. One of the best. But he never forgot his friend Benjamin. <laughs> Yes, even now he invites me to his home, even when he has the most important guests. Should I insult him now at my own daughter's wedding by not offering him the place of honor that is due him? Your father's right, Ruth. Would I ask him to do this if it weren't so important to our future happiness? Ruth, I'm giving you the best I can. There'll be no final wedding in this town. 
But don't ask me to insult an old friend. Please don't ask me. You're right, sir. We shouldn't have troubled you about this thing. Here, now, now, now. I'm... I'm sorry, daughter, but... What you ask me to do, I can't. Believe me, I can't. Take her away, son. I... Well, I have work to do. Come, dear, please. All right, Nathan. Father, I don't blame you. Believe me, I don't. Come. Go, dear. Take my word for it. This won't seem so serious after a while. Ruth, please, don't worry about it too much. But if you lose your position now, the money you're saving up to buy a place of our own, it'll disappear little by little until there's nothing left. You'd have been better off if you'd never met me. Oh, don't say that, darling. And as for all the things I've wanted, they've been for you. Everything. The land to assure you that you'd never go hungry. The house to give you comfort and security. And if everything had worked as I'd planned it, we'd have it all in only a few years. Well, what if it takes longer? We can wait. It isn't right. How can everything we planned on be upset by something so small and petty? It isn't right. Maybe I was wrong about Boaz. Maybe I misinterpreted what he said. Let's wait. Let's see what happens. Nathan. Is that you, Nathan? Yes, Boaz. Well, you've come at a very opportune time, Nathan. Have I? Oh, come, come. You, you won't deny that the thing uppermost in your mind is your wedding. Of course I won't. Well, I want you to know that I haven't been forgetful either. Look at me. Sir? Well, this cloak I'm trying on, it's new, just made for me and finished this very day. It's a nice-looking cloak, boy. Oh, that's all you can say. I go to the trouble and expense of having this made just to appear at your wedding feast, and you don't seem to appreciate it. For the wedding feast? Of course. After all, how would it look if the guest who occupies the honored place were dressed in accordance with his station? What's the matter with you, Nathan? You seem dull today. Boaz. Boaz, I guess it's my fault. I, I should have told you before. Told me what? About the wedding. I, I, I don't understand you. You did tell me about the wedding. I've even had a new cloak made. What are you talking about? What you requested about the seat of honor. I request? You promised, you mean. Well, what about it? I spoke to Benjamin several days ago. He said... He said it couldn't be arranged. What? I talked to him. I asked him. But it would mean you would have to insult an old friend, Samson. Samson, eh? A useless man. They give him the place of honor over me. He's a scholar. The most famous in the history of our town. Such a man deserves honor. You understand? Understand? Of course I understand, Nathan. I understand that you invited me to your wedding. That you assured me that the place of honor would be mine at the feast. That on the strength of that promise, I went to the expense of having this fine cloak made. But now, now I find out that I can't depend on you. And if I can't trust a man, how can I have him working for me? You see, you, you placed me in a very embarrassing situation. Oh, please, Boaz, try to understand. I do understand. No, Boaz, you don't. Now you're contradicting me, too. What's the matter, Nathan? Why are you forcing me to do something I don't want to do? I assure you, I don't want to take your position from you. But, Boaz, I can't ask Benjamin to insult his old friend. But you can ask him to insult me. It wouldn't be an insult. Wouldn't it? Well, I'll decide that, Nathan. Oh, Boaz, please, can't you understand? I did the best I could. Now, when I need my job most, you're going to take it from me. Over such a small thing. A small thing? My honor? Well, I don't think so. And as for how much you need your position here, well, 
You can't need it very badly if you won't arrange this little matter. I'll see what can be done, boy. <laughs> See, Ruth, I wasn't mistaken. He came right out with it this time. Either he gets the place of honor, or I lose my job. Maybe if we talk to my father again. No, I wouldn't hurt your father. I know how he'd feel if he had to ask Samson to forego his place. But if he didn't... What do you mean? Suppose my father didn't have to ask Samson. How else could it be arranged? Leave that to me, Nathan. I can't tell you how flattered I am that such a lovely young girl could find time to visit a stodgy old man like myself. Please, Samson, it's something important. Well, what's more important than a wedding? Tell me that. <laughs> Why, well, I was there the day your father and mother were married. Now, ah, that was a wedding. But I'll, I'll let you in on a secret, my dear. I don't think your mother was quite as beautiful as you are. But we won't tell anyone that, uh, particularly not your father, eh? Oh, Samson. Oh, I'm sorry, my dear. I, I shouldn't have mentioned your mother. I can understand how you'd miss her most of all now. I do. But what I came to see you about, it, it's a great favor, something you must understand. Nathan's employer, Boaz, he won't come to the wedding unless he's given the place of honor. And if he doesn't attend, Nathan will lose his job. Hmm. Young man with the added responsibilities of a wife needs his job more now than ever. No, we can't let that happen. But my father believes that you're entitled to the place of honor, and we all do. Me? Is that what your father's planning on? After all, his best friend, the most noted scholar in our town. Isn't it only fair? Would it help if I didn't go at all? You wouldn't refuse to attend the wedding feast. My father would never forgive himself if that happened. Then I'll be there. But as for occupying the seat of honor, well, that's a matter I think I can work out. What do you mean, Samson? We'll see that things work out satisfactorily. Oh, thank you, Samson. Samson, I... I just have to kiss you. Well, such a gift is indeed an honor. Now, don't worry, Ruth. I'm going to try and arrange everything for you. But no matter what happens, when I see you next, you'll be a bride. So what may happen tomorrow, don't worry about it today. Boaz will take his place as I want it, not as he wants. But, but Let's I... not discuss it now. There's something Nathan has to do now. Something I have to do, Benjamin? Yes, Nathan. It's a tradition in my family. You see, each groom in my family always went out just before the wedding feast to invite the first three strangers he met to celebrate with us. So, Nathan... Go out and find three strangers. Invite them to the feast. Carry out our family tradition. Of course, Benjamin. I'll go. And now, Ruth, we'll gather the guests to the table. Quiet, everyone. Quiet. My dear guests, I want to thank you all for coming to my daughter's wedding. You do me honor by sharing this happy occasion with me. But the lambs are brown on the roasting spit. The bread is hot from the oven. The cups are filled. So let us all gather round the table. <laughs> but before we take our places, the guest of honor must be seated. 
Samson? Benjamin, you do me honor far greater than I deserve. When I attended your wedding, I sat with the others further down the table. Let me sit there again today. Give the honor to another man. Give it to, well, to Boaz. To Boaz? Please, Benjamin, as a favor to me. But Samson, my best friend. Benjamin, if a man gives me a gift, must I accept it? Of course not. Well, then, honor is such a gift. It must never be sought. Once offered, it need not be accepted. For reasons of my own, I cannot accept now. Let me take my place at the tables with the others, as I did at your wedding so many years ago, remember? Please, for old time's sake, Benjamin, give the place to Boaz. Samson, I... Well, I think I understand. And it's like you to do this. Boaz, I invite you to take the place of honor at the head of the table. Why, thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. It's so <laughs> totally unexpected, but if you force the honor on me, I shall accept. I understand. And uh, now all the others, take your places around the table. <laughs> And now, as soon as the three strangers are here, we can begin the feast. Benjamin, Benjamin, I've done what you asked. Three strangers. Here they are. Thank you, Nathan. Welcome to my daughter's wedding feast. Take places at the table, please. And now that you've seated yourselves, let us know who you are so that you are no longer strangers. You, sir. I'm Simon of Gabea. Thank you for your hospitality, and I wish the new bride and her husband a long and happy life together. Thank you, Simon of Gabea. And now you, sir? My name is Jeremiah of Biro. May I add my best wishes to those of the others here? Thank you, Jeremiah of Biro. And you, stranger, you who seated yourself at the foot of the table. Your name? My name is Gideon. From where, friend? From Bethel. Gideon of Bethel, of our own town. We have no one here named... Wait. Gideon. Ezekiel's son was named Gideon. Yes, Benjamin, I am Ezekiel's son. I see you don't recognize me. Well, I can hardly blame you. It's been a long time since I left here to study in Jerusalem. But now I've returned. What good fortune to find a wedding feast in progress. But I'm taking too much of your time. Please carry on with the feast. Carry on? Not until you've taken your rightful place at the table. After all, the owner of the largest estate, heir of the most noted family here, come, come, you can't sit at the foot of the table. Come up here. Take the seat of honor. Me? Am I more worthy than the man who occupies it now? Indeed. He's only your overseer, Boaz. Is this Boaz? <laughs> the last time I saw him, he wasn't dressed so well in such fine clothes. Well, Boaz occupying the seat of honor. You have worked yourself up. Well, I... I after all, Gideon, it, it, it was offered me. I can see that, but... There's another man I see at the table whom I would have thought more suitable as guest of honor. Another man? Yes. When I was in Jerusalem, there was only one man in our entire town I heard spoken of with reverence and respect. Even by the wisest men there. He is Samson. Uh, yes. Yes, Samson's fame as a scholar has spread far. I heard him quoted often in Jerusalem. I should think that he would deserve the place of honor. The choice is yours to make, Gideon. Then I insist. Samson, come up here. Take your rightful place. It isn't necessary, Gideon. Necessary? Has anyone said it was necessary? No, but it's fitting and proper. I couldn't occupy the seat of honor while a man like yourself sat in one of the lower seats. Please, Samson. If it will make you feel at ease. 
Boaz, get up. Get up. Give the seat of honor to a man who's more deserving than either of us. Yes, but where shall I sit? To have the others move. Have to make room. Disturb all the others just for one place. Why? Go on, Boaz. Take my place at the foot of the table. Take it. But, but after all, from the seat of honor to the very foot of the table... If you'd taken your right place at the table to begin with, you wouldn't have had to sit at the foot of the table. Go, Boaz. Now, Samson, take the place of honor you deserve. I'll take your place, and we'll have a wedding feast as I remember them from my younger days here. Come, Samson. Everyone, rise and do honor to a man who deserves honor. And now that everyone is in his rightful place, I wish to offer a gift to the newly married couple. To two people who begin their married life with so hospitable a gesture as to invite strangers to share their feast, I shall give a portion of my land large enough to allow them to start a farm of their own. Benjamin, Nathan, Ruth, we can really have a wedding feast now. of honor? I won't contest your right to it. But there are others here. Perhaps they feel they are entitled to it. We shall offer it to them. Who of you would sit in the chair of honor at this Sabbath meal? Caleb, it seems there is no one who would claim the honor. Then it seems that we have indeed learned the lesson the master sought to teach us. Am I right, Peter? Yes, Caleb. I think you've all learned the humility of which the Master spoke. It is not the man who seeks honor who gets it, but the man who is humble and doesn't demand honor. He is the man to whom people accord it freely and sincerely. Master, before we sit down to the Sabbath meal, tell us once more the words you spoke about humble men. Whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted.
the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are, about to enter Dr. Watson's familiar study. Hello, what's this? We find the good doctor hanging up his Christmas holly. Not getting a sprig of mistletoe, Mr. Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Hope springs eternal, as they say. But here, help me down from this chair. My old legs aren't as agile as they were in the days when I followed Holmes through the dungeons and up the tower stairs of old Pensdagen Castle. Here we are. Oh, thanks. That sounds suspiciously like the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes yarn, Dr. Watson. It is, Mr. Harris, it is. Holmes always called it the adventure of the Christmas bride. It concerns a ghostly lady in white who was supposed to have disappeared centuries ago. The honor of a noble family and a certain Father Christmas who suddenly sang bass. And now, while I fix us both a yuletide, Tori, suppose you'll tell our friends and listeners about a gift every man in our audience would welcome from Father Christmas, or as you Americans call him, Santa Claus. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. And not only from Santa Claus, a thrifty man can give himself a worthwhile gift any time if he insists on clipper craft. For Clippercraft clothes, keep on giving for a long, long time. First of all, you've never seen such truly fine clothes at such really low prices. That means you pocket the savings. That's the first gift to yourself. And they also give you superb styling, perfect fit, and long wear. Clippercraft clothes give you so very much because of the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. That means tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. And yours are the savings this brilliant plan makes possible. Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats only $40. And sport jackets only $26.50. Clippercraft values are so amazing, we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, how about that Christmas bride, Dr. Watson? Her name was Ginevra, and she was the heir and only child of Lord Robert Neville, 10th Earl and 54th Baron Pensdragon of Pensdragon Castle. Yes, I shall never forget my first glimpse of that ancient and somewhat forbidding edifice, the walls gray and bleak without their summer covering of ivy, the tower square and defiant with the red or rouge dragon pennant angrily defying the winter gales, well, as I was saying, a rather urgent message from Lord Neville on elegant embossed stationery had arrived at 221B Baker Street. Would Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson do him the honor of a visit to Penn's Dragon over the Christmas holidays? The visit to include the wedding of his daughter, Lady Ginevra, to the immensely wealthy but slightly middle-aged Wentworth Trimmingham, which was due to occur on the second day of the new year. Now, don't tell me the eminent Mr. Sherlock Holmes was called in to guard the wedding presents, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Hardly, Mr. Harris. At any rate, the day before Christmas found us alighting from our train at a small station in the Cumberland Hills, which, as you know, are situated in the north of England. There had been a slight fall of snow. An ancient carriage with red wheels and the Neville arms on the door was drawn up to the station platform while the anxious face of the Lord of the Manor himself, in top hat and earmuffs, peered through one of the steamy windows. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. That's right. Uh, this way, gentlemen. His lordship is expecting you in carriage. Quite a fall of snow you've had here. Aye, sir. More are coming. By rights, we should have brought the sleigh. Only his lordship loaned it to the vicar for tomorrow night. Vicar always plays by the Christmas at the hall on Christmas Eve, I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll hop in before you freeze to death. Thank you. Are you here, Mr. Holmes? Uh, your friend opposite. Ah. And now then, Dennis, back to Penn's Dragon as fast as you can. Aye, my lord. Ah, 
Mr. Holmes, you are doubtless curious as to why I've invited you and Dr. Watson to share our Yuletide celebrations at Penn's Dragon. To be quite honest, Lord Neville, I didn't think it was entirely for the pleasure of our society, although Watson is quite an asset when it comes to carol singing. Oh, tenor? No, certainly not, baritone. Oh, oh, that's good. The vicar who leads the Christmas singing is rather proud of his tenor voice, and I may say he's not too fond of competition. No, no. Uh, Mr. Holmes... I have invited you to Penn's Dragon to make sure that nothing, nothing occurs to prevent the marriage of my daughter to Mr. Wentworth Trillingham. Why is that marriage so imperative, Lord Neville? Well, to be brutally frank, Mr. Holmes, the Neville estates are mortgaged up to the ears. If the marriage does not go through on the second of next month, I shall be bankrupt, totally bankrupt. I see. Has anything occurred, Lord Neville, to make you fear that this marriage may not take place? Well, no. That is nothing definite. Perhaps the Lady Ginevra hasn't been able to hide her distaste for the match. Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. Well, I, I wouldn't say it was a passionate attachment on either side. But they, they like the same things. She laughs at all his jokes. What better foundation could one ask for a marriage, Jay Watson? Well, that's what I should have said. Well, everything was as smooth as silk until the Dowager Duchess of Turfs gave the engagement dinner last month. It was at her suggestion that I sent you the invitation to Penn's Dragon. She's been decidedly edgy ever since Percy returned in the midst of the betrothal dinner two weeks ago. Percy? Yes, Percy is my cousin, although he's only seven years older than Ginevra. He's our next of kin. See. As a matter of fact, he's an orphan and lived with us at Penn's Dragon until he went off to Canada to seek his fortune two years ago. If anything should happen to your daughter before she produced an heir, would Percy Devil inherit? Yes, Dr. Watson. Both the title and the estates. Percy Neville's return was unexpected, I gather. It was. Unexpected and melodramatic, to say the least. The betrothal dinner was being held in the great hall of Penn's Dragon Castle. My daughter had just risen to return the bridegroom's toast. As she lifted her glass, a casement window was thrown violently open, and Percy walked in out of the night. And now I should like to make a toast. To my future bridegroom. Percy! Good heavens, Percy. Is it really you? I'm sorry to make such an abrupt entrance, Lady Terse. But I came as soon as I received news of the engagement. Percy, why didn't you let us know you were coming? Let you know. Let you know when you never bothered to answer my letters. But, Percy, we never received any letters. We we thought you'd forgotten us. I have forgotten. As if that would have mattered. Percy, that's not true. You know how fond I... We are of you. How touching. Percy, this is Wentworth. Wentworth Trimingham, my future bridegroom. So, this is the little man they've sold you to. Stop that. Stop it at once. I'm very fond of Wentworth. How are you, my dear Ginevra? Percy, why do you look at me like that? To think you should so soon forget our family motto. Ne vile velis. The name Neville means that, you know. Ne vile velis. <laughs> Let it, I take it, eh, Holmes? Quite. It means stoop to nothing base, in case you've forgotten your Ovid, Watson. Oh, teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Tell me, Lord Neville, what happened after Percy quoted the family motto to your daughter? Uh, he stamped off to his old rooms in the tower and hasn't been out of them since. How does the Lady Ginevra react to this unfriendly behavior? Oh, she says let him sulk. It's no concern of hers. Lady Terse, on the other hand, is thoroughly unnerved by Percy's return. Oh? As she feels sure he'll do something outrageous the day of the wedding... Poor Wentworth is as edgy as a hen on a hot griddle. Well, of course, that may be due to his encounter with the white lady. White lady? Who's she? The ghost of the first Ginevra, you know. The bride who played hide-and-seek on her wedding night and was never seen alive again. Years later, her skeleton was found in her great dower chest, still dressed in her wedding gown. She'd hidden in there, and somehow the hat must have fallen down, and she was locked in and smothered to death. See, Mr. Me, I remember a rather famous poem on the subject. Oh, yes. So all the Ginevras and the Neville family have been named after her. She's supposed to walk through the halls of the castle whenever a misfortune is due to occur. Oh, cheerful, damsel, eh, Holmes? When and how did Wentworth Trimingham meet the lady? Well, Mr. Holmes, it seems it's his habit to knock on my daughter's door on his way to bed to wish her good night. Last night, the wind was rather high and he couldn't seem to make my daughter hear. Suddenly, he heard a strange creaking noise down the corridor behind him. Looking round, 
he saw the lid of the dower chest rise slowly. Ginevra. Ginevra, my dear, it's I, Wentworth. I've come to bid you good night. Ginevra, are you there? Ginevra! Who calls me? What was that? Good Lord, the, the lid of the chest is rising. There's something. A woman in white. She's rising out of the chest. Who, who, who are you? The fool Ginevra. You call to me. So I have come to warn you. Go away. Go away before it is too late. Then what happened, Lord Neville? For nothing, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the white figure glided past my daughter's fiancé and disappeared up the tower stairs. Hmm. What did the lady look like? Blonde, brunette? Uh, Wentworth says her features were hidden by the bridal veil. Yes. Interesting. I suppose anyone in the house would have access to that tower chest. On the contrary, Mr. Holmes. Too many people are possessed of insatiable curiosity. I keep the silly thing safely padlocked, I promise you. How many keys are there to that padlock? One which I keep by me here on my key ring. A very wise precaution. I say, Holmes, your bed is even larger than the one in my room. The butler tells me Queen Victoria slept there when she paid a visit in 1846. Don't look so superior, Watson. Queen Elizabeth, I'm told, slept here quite a few years before that. Oh. Come in. Oh, Lady Tuss, beautiful and charming as ever. Stop the nonsense. Glad to see you, both of you. Something's going on here. Don't like it. What sort of something are you referring to, Lady Tuss? Don't know. If I did, shouldn't have sent for you. Ginevra looks as if butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. Bad sign. Percy looks like a thundercloud. That's worse. I thought Percy had locked himself in his rooms and refused to see anyone. I'd like to see anyone refuse to see me. Oh, but I'm Gavin. Uh, you'll want to view the premises. Yes. First of all, I'd like to inspect that dour chest. It might be interesting to investigate how a lady in white can emerge from a carefully padlocked coffer. Then you don't think it was a ghost. Neither do I. Well, what was she up to? We should be able to answer those questions better, Lady Terse, after we've had a look inside that box. I wonder if you could persuade Lord Neville to lend us the key. Here's the key, Mr. Holmes. Lord Neville insists I bring it back the moment you're finished with it. Oh, suspicious old boy, eh, Holmes? Not suspicious, Dr. Watson. Fussy. Well, Mr. Holmes, why the delay? Open the silly chest. Let's see what's inside. So fast, Lady Turse, not so fast. First, let's have a look at the lock. Heavy old bit of machinery. Yes, yeah, almost impossible to pick it without showing signs. There are no signs. Then whoever opened it used that key. Not necessarily, Watson. But there's only one key. Lord Neville told us so. And if Robert says a thing, it's gospel. Yes. Interesting carving around the lock. The wood's very old. Mm, naturally. Open it up. I'm dying of curiosity. Very well. Lock is oiling. It hasn't been unlocked for some time. I'll remove the padlock. Here, Watson, hold it. Now, Lady Terse, if you'll help me raise the lid. Right. Good Lord, what's that? Oh, it's Thor, Ginevra Spaniel. Goes everywhere with her. Regular shadow. Oh, yes, here she comes. Hello there. I'm Ginevra. Why, you must be Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Delighted. Don't let me stop you, Mr. Holmes. You won't. Father told me what you're up to. I'm dying to see what's in the chest, too. Go ahead, open it up. Down, sword, down, boy. You see, it's a biggish box, isn't it? Yes, a woman could easily hide in there. Hmm, something uh, white and uh, satin lying on the bottom. Wonderful. It must be her wedding dress. I've always heard it was still in there. Remarkable to find it in such good condition after all these years. The remarkable thing about it, Lady Ginevra, is this dust and dirt on the hem. Watson, give me an envelope. I shall want to take a sample. But that's fascinating. I've heard simply fabulous things about you, Mr. Holmes. And now I believe them. Every one. Do you? Yes, I think we've seen everything there is to be seen here. Watson, you may close the lid. And lock it. Right. Uh-huh. 
So this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his famous deductions. They told me you were coming. They? Who's they? I understood you've let no one in here, not even the maid. You've overlooked Lady Terse. Try to keep her out of anything. I didn't mention Mr. Holmes, Percy. Or did I? Don't look so suspicious, Lady Terse. I've decided to be a good boy. I've even decided to come downstairs tonight and join in the Christmas Eve festivities. Percy, that gleam in your eye. I've known you too long. You're up to something. If you want to know what satisfying people really means, ask any man who wears Clippercraft clothes. He'll sing their praises, with good reason, too. For values like Clippercraft amaze even clothing experts. Until you see Clippercraft clothes and try them on, you won't believe such really superb suits are possible at only forty and forty-five dollars, and such rich, long-wearing top coats and overcoats at only forty dollars. Such very smart sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. For just a fraction of what you'd expect to pay, you get correct styling, perfect fit, and long-wearing materials. An ingenious plan makes this all possible. The Clippercraft Plan, which concentrates the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. You get the savings that result from this group buying at your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Selling inexpensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft Plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Yourself, Geneva. He'll be here. But, Percy, the snow's so deep. What if he can't get through? Now, don't worry. The sleigh is light, and he has Vixen, the best horse in the county. Nothing can pass her, you know. Oh, dear, I hope so. The snow fell down. What ails the dog? He may prove to be a bit of a problem, don't you think? Goodness, I hope not. To... Oh, Mr. Holmes, I didn't see you behind that chair. An ancient wing chair often provides a good listening post, my dear. Now, look here, you meddling busybody. Percy, please, you promised. Suppose you allow me to solve the problem of the dog, Lady Ginevra. Would you? I mean, listen, say, Bell, the vicar's driving up. He's here. Father Christmas has arrived. Open the door, Paddleford. Now then, everyone. Good King Wenceslas looked down on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round about. My right ears half frozen. Come along, Father Christmas. Percy will take you into the dining room. You can have a hot toddy while you get out of your wrath. That's a good idea. A good idea. And better disguise your voice, sir, or all the children will guess who you are. Uh, that's a good idea, too. Uh, 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 gather round, all. Uh, bring in the Yule log. <laughs> Father Christmas will be with you in a moment to give out the presents to all the good boys and girls. <laughs> there. Uh, how's that? Vicar, you're wonderful. Now go along. Take good care of him, Percy. Never fear, my dear. Oh, dear. Mr. Holmes, they're bringing in the Yule log. Come and help me set fire to it. Oh, a whole book, Dr. Watson, has caught Lady Curse under the mistletoe. I declare I've never had such a Christmas. Oh, come along, Ginevra. They're ready for you to light the fire. Oh, dear, where did I put the matches? Well, happy, Lady Ginevra. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. Oh, oh look at that. Oh, I say, I say, how's she burn, Oh, lovely. I do like to toast my feet in front of a Yule log. I beg your pardon, Lady Ginevra, but haven't you raised your skirts a bit too high? Oh, my goodness. 
I forgot. Oh, Ginevra, my dear, your fiancé is making quite an ass of himself. He runs into the library every other minute to see no one's listed one of the wedding presents. Well, all that silver and your present, Lady Terse, the diamond tiara. I'll admit that tiara is a temptation. You shouldn't have given it to me, Lady Terse. It's wonderful. Oh, not at all. A confounded nuisance. Given me a headache for years. Glad to be rid of it. Oh, well, here, here comes Father Christmas. Gather around the punch bowl, everyone. And we'll have a drink also before we give out the presents. Oh, I say, what? Oh, oh, no, we oh, should. Oh, 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 That's such a good... I say, no, because... Uh, Father Christmas, I mean. A start us off on a carol. Can't drink your eggnog without a song. Right you are, fair lady. Hey. God bless you, Mary. Nothing like a good old-fashioned English Christmas. Sweet out of Dickens, don't you know? Father Christmas, not leaving us so soon. Well, uh, that is uh, a long ride home. Must get going. Uh, don't tell the others. Uh, wouldn't want to disturb the party. Quite. How about a hot toddy before you leave? Still a cup, you know. No, I haven't time. I haven't time. I thought you might say that, so I prepared this jug full of grog. Keep it well wrapped. It'll keep you warm. It's a long, cold drive to Gretna Green, but... What, Mr. Holmes? No time to waste. On your way, Father Christmas. Think of me when you drink the grog. We will. Wassel! Wassel! Merry Christmas! And a happy new year. Hello, what's this? Is Vicar off so soon? Uh, yes, Lord Neville. He seemed in a hurry to get home. Oh, can't blame him. It's a cold night. Uh, let us get inside before we freeze to death. Good idea. Oh, I say, oh. they're ready to start the dancing. Uh, Wentworth's trying to find Ginevra so they can leave the dancer. Help! Help! Someone. Who's that calling? Oh, good heavens, what's what is that? Get me out! I'm locked Why, in. someone's got himself locked in the dungeon. This way, the entrance is through the dining room. I was hoping for more of a head start. What's that? Nothing, nothing at all. Ah, this is the door to the dungeon. Let me out! Let me out, I say! Yeah, the door is bolted. Just a moment. Ah. Get me out of here! Good Lord! It's the vicar down there in his underwear and trussed up like a New Year's goose. This is an outrage! Get me out of here! But if the vicar is here, who drove off in the sleigh? Presumably an imposter who stole the vicar's clothes. I thought it might be, you know, when I heard Father Christmas sing bass. Say, Holmes, Holmes, where are you? Lady Ginevra, her fiancée can't find her anywhere. She's disappeared, vanished into thin air. Great Scott, someone get the vicar out of the dungeon. I've got to find my daughter. Oh, Mr. Holmes, come quickly. Ginevra's disappeared. Her dog is crouched in front of the dower chest, howling. Oh, hurry, gentlemen. The same scoundrel that locked the vicar in the dungeon has undoubtedly put Ginevra in the dower chest. Oh, no, hope we're not too late, eh, Holmes? Wentworth <laughs> tried to break the chest open, but the dog won't let him near. There, I see. Easy, 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 thought my boy. Yes, 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 I know. I know what you're trying to say. We'll get her out. Oh, confound it, the key. Lady Terse, what did you do with the key? But I gave it back to you. No, you didn't. Oh, yes, you did too. Quite all right, you know. No key needed. The wood's so old and the staple's so loose, it's quite possible to lift the lock right out, like this. That's it, I'll raise the lid. Great oh, Scott, there's nothing in there but a roast of beef. Yes. Thor's made off with it, I'm afraid. That explains his interest in the chest. But if Ginevra isn't here, where is she? With Father Christmas, I imagine. They're heading for the Scottish border in the sleigh. You'll never catch them, I'm afraid. Oh, of course. She's eloped with Percy. So she did talk him round. Good for her. <laughs> so that's why she trailed off up the tower steps in that old bridal gown. I suspected as much when I discovered some of Percy's ashes on its hem. Ah, oh, but this is dreadful. I should be ruined. We'll have to return all the wedding presents. Fiddle-dee-dee. Personally, I'll make mine a much handsomer contribution. Ginevra shall have the tiara and my emeralds as well. They're worth a king's ransom. Lady Turf, you are an astounding female. All women are. Oh, but we're keeping the dancers waiting. You shall lead the dancers with me, Robert. Come along. Say, Holmes, you old fraud. I believe you knew you, what was going on all the time. I suspected, Watson. I suspected. 
But when I saw the Lady Ginevra raise her ball gown and display a pair of traveling boots, I was sure. But uh, come along, Watson. We shall have to go down to the kitchen and make peace with the cook. Oh, why that? For making off with Sunday's roast of beef. Something had to be done to keep the dog interested, or he'd have given the show away. Well, that certainly was a Christmas story with all the trimmings, Dr. Watson. Glad you liked it, Mr. Harris. And now, while I fill up our glasses, so we can drink a Christmas toast to our listeners and our sponsors. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, Dr. Watson. Ah, here's your glass, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And here's to our radio friends, young and old. Merry, merry Christmas and happiness, prosperity and peace in the new year. Indeed, Dr. Watson, and warm greetings to all the makers of Clippercraft clothes. And now, Dr. Watson, how about just a small hint about next week's story? Next week, I think I should tell you how Holmes and I spent New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. <laughs> New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles? That sounds amusing, Doctor. Hair-raising is the word, Mr. Harris. We were aboard the luxury liner Gigantic, expecting that any minute she would burst into flames. There's nothing more terrifying, we know, than a fire at sea. <laughs> Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clipper Craft dealer, write Clipper Craft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Christmas seals support the fight to prevent the spread of tuberculosis in this community. Buy and use Christmas seals on all your holiday mail, and be sure to mail your packages now. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. Lux presents Hollywood. Lux Radio Theater brings you Bride by Mistake, starring Lorraine Day, John Hodiak, and Marcia Hunt. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, and a happier New Year to all of you. I hesitate to go further and wish you a prosperous New Year because of what happens to a certain lady you're about to meet. Her name is Nora Hunter, and she's very prosperous indeed. But far from bringing her happiness, her wealth is the cause of many startling complications in tonight's play, RKO's new comedy hit, Bride by Mistake, which stars as Nora Hunter, the lovely Lorraine Day, who will soon be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mare picture, Keep Your Powder Dry. Also from the original cast of Bride by Mistake is Marsha Hunt, and we're fortunate in having with us John Hodiak, whom you may have seen in MGM's Marriage is a Private Affair. Together, they bring us the whirlwind adventures of a woman eager for marriage who finds that wealth is more often a handicap than an advantage. I think you'll agree that how she overcomes that handicap makes one of the screen's most entertaining comedies. Whether or not you believe that money is the root of all evil, it is certainly true that the value of any currency depends on the laws of supply and demand. From all reports, there seems to be a new kind of currency in use around the world. It isn't paper and it isn't coin. Can you guess what it is? You're right, it's soap. Lux toilet soap. In France, we are told that a cake of Lux toilet soap is worth the price of a beefsteak dinner. In North Africa, two cakes purchased a lovely handmade wallet from an Arab merchant. And to make the women in our audience envious, 
A USO hostess in Paris reports that by producing a cake of Lux toilet soap in a perfume shop, she came out with a bottle of Chanel No. 5. So it seems that uh, you're not only lovely looking when you travel with Lux toilet soap, but you're rich as well. Now, to another story of women and riches, as we bring you the first act of RKO's Bride by Mistake, starring Lorraine Day as Nora, John Hodiak as Tony, and Marsha Hunt as Sylvia. exclusive strip of the California coast stands one of the rest homes and redistribution centers of the Army Air Force. It's even more comfortable than most because it originally housed the glamorous and fabulously wealthy Nora Hunter, heiress to the Hunter shipyard fortune. As a patriotic gesture, Miss Hunter, for the duration, has moved to another smaller house with only two swimming pools, a house in a secluded part of her estate while the spacious Hunter Mansion is providing rest and recreation to officers returned from active duty. Among them is Captain Tony Travis, who is spending his first day in the solarium in sweet repose. Oh, boy. Oh, hey, you. Yes? Uh, what do they call you, hostesses? Well, they call me Harris. Oh, well, look, Harris, what's the idea of passing me with that tray? Well, I thought you were asleep. I was, but there's something about food that wakes me up. Uh, what is it this time? Cream puff. Again? Mm-hmm. How often do you serve those things? Every hour on the hour. I'll say. I'm beginning to look like a cream puff. <laughs> Don't mind, Lieutenant Corey. He's not used to gracious living. I'll, uh, I'll try a second one of those. <laughs> it's your fifth, but who's counting? Try your Corey, seriously, does this go on all the time? No. Nah. Sometimes they make you get up and play tennis or go swimming. And on Saturday night, a bunch of girls come over and you have to dance with them. Oh, gee, that's tough. Yeah. And two weeks ago, someone brought a general around and we all had to stand up. No, stand up? On your feet? Yeah, but you get used to that kind of inconvenience. Sorry, time for your orange juice. Oh, Harris, I wish you'd left me alone. I'm getting sick with health. Oh, Corey, don't you like it here? No, nope. well, don't be upset, Harris. I love it here. <laughs> just stick around a couple of weeks, Travis, and you'll feel just the way the rest of us do. Me? Never. This is a life for me. You like comfort? I certainly do. Say, Harris, do you think this would be too big a house for me when the war's over? Well, not if you close off 30 or 40 rooms. Oh, it's not just the house I'm interested in. You see, when the war's over, I don't expect to ride in anything but my own plane. And I'll need a nice big front lawn to land it on. Oh. Yeah, how to get that big front lawn is my post-war problem. Simplest way would be to marry the girl that owns this one. Nora Hunter? Mm, she could give you the biggest front lawn in America. That's right. And put a fleet of P-38s on it if you wanted them. And all the cream puffs you could eat, wrapped up in $1,000 bills. Mm, that's an idea. I wonder what she looks like. I hear she's plenty easy on the eyes. Ever seen a picture? Picture? Don't you know? Why, she's the girl that's never been photographed. Never been photographed? You mean one of the richest girls in America never gets her picture in the paper? When you're that rich, you don't have to have your picture in the paper. You can pay to keep it out. I wonder what a girl like that does all day. Uh, what do you suppose she's doing now, for instance? Right now? Well, let's see. 3.45 p.m. She's launching a ship. Huh? Sure. As owner of the Hunter Shipyard, she breaks 100 bottles of champagne a year on boats. How do you know that's what she's doing? Well, here. Read all about it. Nora Hunter launches 100 vessel at the Hunter Shipyards. Think of it. She's smashing a bottle of Piper Heidsick on the prow of a destroyer while we're sitting here in thirst. And while I'm playing solitary billiard, she's smashing a bottle of Piper Heidsick on the brow of a destroyer. No, no, Nora, there's no use getting all worked but up. But, Jonathan, I'm tired of being cooped up this this constant protection while somebody else impersonates me in public. We have to take precautions, Nora. I am your guardian, and I'd never forgive myself if anything should happen So to while you. Nora Hunter's secretary launches ships and talks to admirals, the real Nora Hunter stays at home and chalks up billiard cues. Well, wealth is a big responsibility. Maybe I've been too cautious, but I don't think so. You've been a wonderful guardian, darling. It's, it's just that... Oh, I guess I envy Sylvia. Leading my life, having all the fun and excitement even getting married. You'll have a husband soon yourself. And after you marry Donald, you can lead a lot more normal life. Jonathan, do you realize I haven't seen him in eight weeks? Well, he's been in camp. Uh, wait a minute. Here comes Sylvia and Philip. Hi. 
How did the launching go? Wonderfully, darling. That's the part of your life I like best. How did she act, Philip? Oh, she was fine. <laughs> it's so impressive to watch your wife knock a ship into the water with a bottle of champagne. <laughs> and the Secretary of the Navy hopes that I'll be happily married. He means you, of course, Nora. Well, it's nice to know that I have federal approval. Oh, has Donald phoned yet? Nope. A little late, isn't he? I guess so. Watch this. A five-cushion shot. Hmm. Hasn't seen you in eight weeks, and he's late. You ought to do something about that. What? Well, you might put on a different dress for one thing. If I hadn't seen my fiancé in eight weeks, I'd want her to be wearing something slinky with curves. A sarong, perhaps. Nora, while we're on the subject of marriage, yes, I'd like to give my notice. Sylvia, you notice? I want to go back to Washington with Philip. Oh, of course you do, dear, but... Well... I don't know what to say. I was afraid of this ever since you got married. When do you want to leave, darling? Phil has to be back in ten days. Oh, as soon as that? I'm going to miss you. But, darling, you're going to be married. You don't even want anyone else around. Oh, no, you'll see. You won't. Look, can't you wait until I'm married? Just until the wedding? Please, Philip. But, darling, you're so indefinite about the date. And I'm so definite about wanting my wife with me. All right. I'll get married right away. You fix everything, Jonathan. Fix everything? Fix what, young lady? This isn't a ship we're launching. You're Oh, sure, married. sure. I know I have to be there myself. But you take care of all the details, won't you, darling? You'll see, Sylvia, I'll be married in no time. But Donald has something to say about this, and he's not even here yet. Come in. Donald! Well? Oh, darling, I didn't think you'd knock. I thought you'd break the door down. Hello, Donald. How are you, Don? <laughs> Hello, Sylvia. Philip? How are you? Fine. Aren't you going to kiss the bride? How are you, honey? Oh, I get it. This is no time for an audience. Come on, Phil. Don't think we aren't glad to see you, Donald, but an engaged couple has a right to privacy. We'll see you later. Well, Nora, here we are, just where we said goodbye eight weeks ago, back in the billiard room. Mm-hmm. And you were losing 21 to 16. Whose turn was it? Yours. Shoot. Oh, terrible. Well, I can't help it. There's something about this place. I'm a champ at the officers' club. Don, mm-hmm. I was thinking. Yes? This idea about being a June bride, it, it's a little old-fashioned. Mm-hmm. How about another month? You mean later? I mean earlier. Suits me fine. What made you say later? Nothing. I just thought you meant later. Well, I want Sylvia to be at the wedding, but she's going back to Washington soon with Philip. Oh, sure, of course. Um, Connors doesn't have to go someplace, too, does he? Jonathan? No. Does it bother you having all these people around, Donald? Oh, I'm sorry. I suppose I'll get used to it. Donald. Yes? I'm going to try a long shot. It, it's a pretty long shot, but I'll try it. Shoot. I think that you came here to say that you don't want to marry me. And you lost your nerve. Nice shot. You're right. I'm sorry, Nora. Oh, never mind. It's better now than Reno later. What happened, Don? I'm in love with someone else. Who? No one you know. Do you mind if, if I ask you one more question? No. Why did you fall out of love with me? Do you want it straight? Mm-hmm. Straight. Well, marrying you, Nora, well, it would be like marrying a corporation. I'm sure Connors would expect us to produce dividends instead of babies. I'm sorry, Nora. What it really comes down to is this. I just can't live with so much money. It's like living in a goldfish bowl. I see. Well, I... I guess I'll have to find some poor fish who can. I'm afraid so. It'll either be a guy who loves you so much he can take it, or someone who loves your money so much he doesn't care. I'm neither one of those guys. How will I ever know which it is? I don't know. I don't know how you'll ever know. Well? (sighs) Well, what do you say we finish the game some other time, huh? Sure. Goodbye, Nora. Oh, we've known each other long enough to stand a goodbye kiss? Sure. You're a swell girl, Nora. Goodbye. Good luck. Goodbye. I hope you'll both be very happy. What was that? That was the eight ball in the corner window. Sylvia's diamonds trump the next three, and I fix yours. Yeah, nice going, Philip. Little slam that gives you rubber. I'm sorry, Jonathan. I, I'm not playing very well tonight. Nonsense, Nora. We had the cards. What do you say to turning on the radio and dancing? Good. I have a dance with Nora. No, really. I, I think I'll go upstairs now. But it's only nine. I know, but I've got a headache. Nora, 
Darling, don't worry about me. Good night, everybody. Jonathan, we've got to do something for her. Yeah, I know we do, but what? We've got to take her mind off Donald. Find another man and quick. Well, that's fine, but how? See, there are more than a hundred men right now at the other house. All officers. Certainly some of them could amuse her, take her out, and make her forget. Well, what do I do, go out and lasso one? It's simple. We'll give a party. A tea for all the officers at the other house. Well, how do you know they'll come? Well, their commanding officer will see to that. Mm, it might work, Sylvia. But the mood that Nora's in, I doubt if she'd agree to it. Well, we'll keep it a secret till the time comes. Then it'll be too late to object. Okay. I'll call the colonel and arrange it. So, Miss Nora Hunter condescends to step down from her pedestal and entertain the Air Force. Well, have a look, Travis. Ravishing, Lieutenant Corey. And don't accept her the first time she proposes. Make her ask you twice. Hmm. Say, you don't think I'm being unfaithful, do you? Unfaithful? Well, Janie's coming tomorrow. Do you think she'd mind my going to another girl's party the day before we get married? She won't mind the day before. What she'll mind is the day after. Oh. Besides, uh, did you ever go to a strictly social tea, me? I never even drank this stuff. And let me tell you what it's going to be like. You walk in and there she is, radiantly lovely in something shiny and white. Uh -huh. She looks just like an iceberg. In fact, she is an iceberg. She says, charmed, and you say, charmed. She shoves a cup of tea in your right hand, the butler shoves a piece of cake in your left, the footman shoves a chair under you, and you're down. A beautiful crash landing. Well, this time, everybody's deliriously happy, and the joint is jumping. No, Corey, none of that for me. I'll stay here and relax. Captain Travis, your pack is waiting. Uh-oh. Come right in. What did you say? Travis, your taxi's waiting. A uh, taxi for me? Yes, the one you ordered to take you to Miss Hunter's. Oh, no. He's going to stay here and relax. Oh, 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 taxi. Uh, I ordered that for you, Corey. Uh, the estate's two miles long by a half mile wide, and uh, knowing your love of comfort, I took the precaution of ordering a taxi. Oh, yeah? We'll be right there, Travis. <laughs> Stop to come downstairs. The men are beginning to arrive. It's no use, Sylvia. You're sweet, and I know you did it for my sake, but... Well, I can't go through with it. But they're the guests, and you're the hostess. Nora Hunter is the hostess, and they don't know Nora Hunter from Adam. I mean, Eve. Darling, you've taken my place so often, you can do it again. What is it, Nora? Are you frightened to go down there? Are you letting that break with Donald get you down so that you're scared to meet men? Scared to give yourself a chance to fall in love again? Love? That's what I said. That's what I thought. And it's easy for you to talk about it, Sylvia. You've got it. But you can have it, too. No, no. I, I'd never even know if someone loved me. Donald showed me that. All right. Let's rule out love. Let's call it entertainment. The man to talk to, to take you out. No, thanks. In the mood I'm in, I'd ruin everybody's fun. You go ahead. Nora, you say it's your money that's always stood between you and the men you've liked. If I go down and take your place at the party, will you do the same for me? How do you mean the same for you? I'll be Nora Hunter, as I've been so many times before, if you'll be my secretary, Sylvia Lockwood. But, darling, Why it's not? not? You said that you don't want to meet men as yourself, as Nora Hunter. You don't want them looking at you as a curiosity or an investment. You want to be like any other girl, and I don't blame you. Well, here's your chance. But that's a pretty shabby trick. Why is it? 5,000 people saw Nora Hunter launch a ship the other day. And where was Nora Hunter? Here at home. But this is different. This is in my own home. I just... How is it different? All we have to do is warn the servants. Wait a minute. How will Philip feel about this? You're his wife, and... And if some of those officers get attentive to we'll you... We'll be off to Washington in 10 days. Phil won't mind. Come on, Nora. You've always wanted to know how men would act toward you if you didn't have the Hunter million. But supposing they don't look at me... You aren't scared to find out, are you? No. All right, it's a deal. You go on down, tell Jonathan and Philip and the servants, and present yourself as Nora Hunter. You'll be down now. Promise. I'll be down, Nora. <laughs> Good luck, Sylvia. In a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars will be back with Act Two of Bride by Mistake. Why, hello, it's Sally. Looking very thoughtful, too. What's on your mind, Sally? New Year's, Mr. Kennedy, and resolutions. Now that the New Year is really underway, 
Isn't this my golden opportunity? Opportunity for what, Sally? Well, now is the time most every girl decides she's going to take better care of her looks and really do something about regular beauty care. So I want to remind those girls... Of a certain beauty soap, Sally? Of course. But just what is the best way to tell girls everywhere that daily active lather facials work like a charm, that they really make skin lovelier, and that they're so easy and quick any girl who hasn't tried them ought to start right away? My, my, Sally. Don't let your enthusiasm run away with you. Let's take it point by point. You know, the what, why, and how of Hollywood beauty care. Uh, you mentioned active lather facials. Active lather facials with what? Why, Mr. Kennedy, with the soap that has active lather, Lux Toilet Soap, of course. The soap nine out of ten screen stars use. And Sally, you said these facials work like a charm, really make skin lovelier. Naturally, women want to know why. Because, Mr. Kennedy, everyone who's compared the lather of Lux Toilet Soap with that of other soaps knows how extra rich and creamy it is. That wonderful active lather does a thorough job. Leaves the skin feeling so soft and smooth. Right, Sally. And now you ought to tell just how the Hollywood stars take their Lux Soap facials. You just cover your face generously with the creamy lather and work it in thoroughly. Rinse with warm water, splash with cold. Pat your face gently dry with a soft towel. That's all. <laughs> Easy, Mr. Kennedy, as I said before. <laughs> and this beauty care really works, as you also said, Sally. In recent tests of Lux Toilet Soap facials, actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time. When lovely screen stars trust their precious complexions to this gentle care, you know how good it must be. And now, Sally, let's suggest to our listeners everywhere what a fine resolution it is to get some Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Use it regularly. See how lovely, how appealing your skin can really be. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act Two of Bride by Mistake, starring Lorraine Day as Nora, John Hodiak as Tony, and Marsha Hunt as Sylvia. <laughs> tea time at the residence of Nora Hunter, and a score of army officers are crowded about their hostess in adoring admiration. Only the object of that admiration is not the real Nora Hunter. Nora and her secretary Sylvia have changed places so that Nora can mingle with the guests to see if men like her for herself and not for her millions. So far, however, the experiment has been a dismal failure. Nora stands neglected on the sidelines while Sylvia, posing as Miss Hunter, is the center of attraction. You flyers seem to have a language all your own. Girl hardly knows what to say to you. Well, Miss Hunter, the nicest thing a girl can say to a boy is, Roger Wilco. Roger Wilco? What does that mean? That means, yes. <laughs> Look at them, fawning over my wife. Yes, Sylvia's certainly a great success, does Nora. And I thought the idea of this party was to find a man for me. Excuse me. Yes? That tomato's sitting on the couch with all the officers around her. I suppose that's Nora Hunter. That's no tomato. That's my wife. Uh, uh, yes, that's Nora Hunter. How do you ever get her alone? I don't, and it's driving me crazy. I can see it, Mike. Uh, just a minute, Lieutenant. Uh, Lieutenant Wilson uh, is the name. Uh, Lieutenant Wilson. If your wife's in town, we wish she'd join us. Wife? I'm not married. Well, isn't that nice? I I'd like you to meet someone. Uh, oh, Miss Lockwood. May I present Lieutenant Wilson? This is Miss Sylvia Lockwood. How do you do, Lieutenant Wilson? How do you do? Miss Lockwood is Miss Hunter's closest friend. Oh. Oh, uh, Philip, uh, have you seen the garden? Seen it? I expect to be fair. Have you known Miss Hunter long, Miss Lockwood? All her life. You see, her mother and my father were very good friends. Nora Hunter, huh? Uh, how do you like California? Oh, I think it's beautiful. I love the warm days and the cool nights, and I don't even think you know what I'm talking about. It's just what I always say, especially when it comes to blondes. I wonder what she does with herself most of the time. In fact, I'm going to leave you, the whole bunch of you, and retire to a quiet little game of billiards. Yes, isn't it the truth, though? I wonder if she likes it. Oh, spoil my shot. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know anyone was here. <coughs> Say, sounds like you're catching cold. Well, I've just been exposed to a rather chilly experience. You play billiards? 25 points? Sure. $2 a point? Are you a general or something that you can afford to play for that? I'm not planning to lose. Oh, all right. You know what we're doing? Nearest one of this side of the table shoots first. And I use this funny old stick to hit the ball. Yes. <laughs> Fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, twenty-six dollars. 
Do you do this for a living? <laughs> I'll play you another. Double or nothing. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, you can put that funny old stick down. I'm not crazy. Well, uh, uh, how about a walk? I'd love to show you the ground. Fine. Uh, but we'll have to sneak out. Why? Nora Hunter. Nora Hunter? We were warned by the CO. No unseemly conduct, no wild times, no doing anything unless she starts it. I ought to tell you, I'm Miss Hunter's secretary. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I would have to shoot my mouth Oh, off. no, no, that's all right. You're absolutely right. She is pretty sticky. I wouldn't say that. Well, do you know her? No. Well, I do, and I'm tired of it. I'm going to ask for a raise, and if I don't get it, I quit. We're going for that walk, and we're not going to sneak out. Suit me. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Nora. We were uh, we were going for a walk. Nora, I'd like you to meet an old friend of mine. What's your name? Anthony Travis. Anthony Travis. Nora, may I present Captain Travis, Miss Nora Hunter. How do you do, Captain Travis? He's been dying to meet you. He's heard you're so much fun. Glad to know you, Miss Hunter. <laughs> no, uh, uh, Sylvia, you've got <laughs> Oh, no, it's nothing. Oh, you'd better get a sweater if you're going walking. Do I need one? Oh, I think it'd be a good idea. I'll keep Captain Travis company while you get one. All right, I'll only be a minute. Philip, where did he go? The captain? You mean the captain and my wife. Look, down the lawn. He's going off with him. He's going off with her. He's worse than the rest of them. Just grabbed her. Men. They ought to be deported, the whole lot of them. And I thought he was so nice. Yeah, good-looking, too. What if Sylvia goes for him? Oh, I don't think Sylvia likes good-looking men. No, maybe she does Huh? <laughs> well, maybe she does and maybe she doesn't. Now, look, let, let's call this masquerade off now. Let Sylvia go back to being what she is, my wife. It's too late. Everybody here would feel offended. Suppose that captain makes a pass at her. Pass? Once they cross the lawn and reach that willow grove, she'll probably be fighting for her life. Well, what can we do to stop them? I've got an idea. Turn on that lawn sprinkling system over there. This lawn is going to get the wettest watering it's ever had. Yeah, but, but wait a minute. That's my wife. If that's all right, turn it on and hurry. Sometimes you've got to sink the ship to drown the rat. Okay, here goes. Ah! That's this one. Turn on the other one for sale. Oh, sorry. Here goes the other. Ah! Hey, hey, turn that thing on. party's over. You better stay by this fire. You certainly got a soaking. So did you. And it serves you right. Why didn't you look what you were doing? Serves you right. Next time, Captain Travis, don't break dates. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I owe you an apology. Oh, it's all right. I understand. She swept you off your feet, straight on. Two army men took out a third and carried you off. Well, where's she now, by the way? Upstairs, getting dehydrated. Is she all right? Just a little mildewed. You seem quite concerned about her. Well, I feel sort of responsible. Oh, worried about Philip, too. Philip? No, no. Hey, by the way, what's his interest in Nora? Nora? Well, Miss Hunter, he seems to be awfully anxious about her, watches her like a house detective. Oh, he's just an... <laughs> an old friend of the family. Hey, that's getting worse. Maybe we ought to have a drink. Uh, medicinally, of course. I know just the thing to cure a cold. How do I go about getting service? That dictograph arrangement there. Push down the button that says P for pencil. D for den, calling P for pantry. D for den, calling P for pantry. Yes, sir. Have you any claret? Yes, sir. Juice of six lemons. Juice of six lemons. Cinnamon stick. Cinnamon stick. That is all. Roger. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you must have swiped that apparatus off a farmer. Now, the only other thing we need is a hot poker. Oh, this will do. I'll heat it in the fire. <clears throat> if you don't mind, I think I'll just take some aspirin. Well, if all you want to do is cure your cold, go ahead. I have something special in mind. Incidentally, you don't really think Miss Hunter's angry, do you? Why do you care if she is? Well, I'm a guest of hers, and I feel guilty. Although I don't know why I should. I still don't understand what you were doing watering the lawn. Well, uh, uh, you know how hard it is to get help these days. It's quite a job you've got. Secretary, companion, gardener. You're overworked. I told you she's a stinker. Come in. Excuse me, miss, from the pantry. Oh, uh, put it right here. That'll be fine. Thank you, Robert. Yes, miss. Now, uh, watch me carefully. First the lemon. 
Now the cinnamon sticks. Now the claret. One quick match of the stir. And now the hot poker. We plunge the poker into the pitcher. And you have a preview of paradise. Uh, you have to drink the first one right down. The first one? Before I put my life in your hands, where did you get this recipe? My Uncle Joe. Well, here's to Uncle Joe. <laughs> You mean you're dead, Uncle Joe. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're right. You know what his last words were? Nope. Pour me another glass. Uh, now, this one is to you. Well, that's very sweet of you. To me. The second one seems to go down easier. So, oh, bless you. You'd better have another. This one we drink to you. You know, you're a very nice boy. To me. That wasn't just an idle compliment. You're intelligent, good-looking, and you play a pretty good game of brilliant. By the way, you aren't married, are you? No. You see, I was right. You're really a very nice boy. I may get married someday. When the war's over, it'll be nice to have your own girl. Mm-hmm. Someone to talk to, like we're doing. Someone to rumble with. Somebody who doesn't mind a good scrap once in a while. Mm, sounds like a beautiful life. Now, if that girl should turn out to be somebody rich like Miss Nora Hunter, do you think I'd be upset? No. I should say not. What sort of a heel would I be not to marry the girl I love just because she happens to have a couple of million dollars? But I'd have to love her. Love a couple of million dollars that hard? No, no, I'm not talking about her money. I'd have to love her. Love her, understand? No. All right, I'll show you. Turn your cheek. Now, I don't want a lifetime of this. No. Now, as you were. What I want is a lifetime. Oh. See what I mean? I most certainly do, Tony. What, Sylvia? I'm going to see a lot of you. You certainly are, baby. I'm going to invite you over all the time. Maybe you and Nora Hunter can get together. Me and Miss Hunter? Don't be ridiculous. Tony, you're not only good-looking and intelligent and a pretty good billiards player, you're also a hypocrite. How? Well, didn't you say if it was honest to goodness up and down your spine, love, you'd marry her? Even if she was the richest girl in the world. Absolutely. What kind of a I know, I know. Then don't back down now. Are we going to have another medicinal drink? Sure, you want to cure your cold, don't you? <laughs> Tony, I'm drinking to your marrying Nora Hunter. Your cold is gone, and so is your mind, baby. <laughs> Hello, hello, Washington. Yes, of course, I'm waiting. Washington, Washington, D.C. Quiet. Jonathan, stop shouting. Do you want Nora to hear Hello, this? hello, Army personnel. Jonathan Connor is calling. Now, I want to speak with General H. Pinkerton Fitzgerald. Yeah, this will take an hour. Hello, Pinky. How are you? Fine, fine. You got your scissor handy? I want you to cut some red tape for me. Find out all you can about Captain Anthony Travis, Army Air Corps. Thanks, I'll hold on. I don't care what General Pinky says. I think this guy's the one for Nora. Well, I hope so, too, but we've said that before. That golf player and then Donald... I've never said it before. All those others were ones you wanted. This is one she wants. But how do you know he isn't attracted just by her money? That's exactly why Nora and I have made a plan. What plan? You won't be angry, Philip? Well, how do I know? Tell me what the plan is first. Well, Nora, posing, of course, as me, her secretary has promised Tony that she'd get him married to me. What? She's going to throw you to that wolf? Yes. She wants to test him completely. Oh, that's great. Let him think I'm Nora Hunter. Let him go with me. Let him fall in love with me if he can. And if he does, then he isn't the one for Nora either. Uh, that won't work. She'll break her heart because the boy is bound to fall in love with you. Oh, he is, is he? And what am I supposed to do while my wife is being pawed by some other guy? 
write my memoirs? You're supposed to try to understand, to try and help Nora. Understand. Yes, Pinky, go ahead. Six foot one, 180 pounds. Well, never mind that. I know what he looks like. Enlisted January 1st, 1942. 50 missions, nine fighters, two bombers, furloughed by command. What's going on? Who's Jonathan talking to? Shh, Nora. Jonathan's talking to Washington. About what? Philip. About Tony. I won't have it. Jonathan, who do you think you are asking those questions? The Army took him, didn't they? What about his record before he joined the uh, Army? This is perfectly ridiculous. Oh, it's, it's not as ridiculous as you think, young lady. Do you know that he was arrested once? So Don't, what? So what me? Might be serious. Uh, Pinky, what was he arrested for? Champagne, zoo, penguins, roller coaster, police, New Year's Eve. Oh. Thanks, Pinky. Goodbye. Jonathan, that's an outrageous thing to do. Darling, it's a big war. And all kinds of people get mixed up in it. But to ask the Army if one of their flyers, one of their best flyers, is good enough for me. I'm sorry, but I just have a blind spot when it comes to you. When an old bachelor has to take care of a girl from the time she's that big, I guess he gets to be an old fool. Oh, oh, Jonathan, how am I going to argue with you? Don't. Tell him who you are and marry him. Fine. Oh, only there's just the small matter of his falling in love with me. Or have you taken care of that, too? No, that's your job, darling. You love him, Nora. I think so. Then please tell him who you are. I can't tell him. I have to know if he'd care for me without my money. I think she's right. I think that Jonathan is right. Oh, but don't you see, Philip, if he falls in love with me as Sylvia, I'll always be sure. Pardon me, there's a Captain Travis on the phone for Miss Sylvia. Thank you. No, 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 that's for me. I'll take it on this extension of it. Hello, Tony? Sylvia, how are you? How's the cold? (laughs) Fine. Not even a sniffle this morning. Good. Can you get away this afternoon? I think it can be arranged. Fine. Why don't you come over here to the main Hunter Castle? We're having a wedding. A wedding? Yes. One of the boys named Corey. His girl just got in. They're getting married. Oh, I'd love it. Wonderful. 2 p.m. I'll send a passport. <laughs> oh, Tony. Shall I bring Nora Hunter? Nora Hunter? Say, do you think she'd come? That'd be wonderful. Yes, well, leave it to me. I'll fix everything. Bye-bye. Nora Hunter. He was so excited when I mentioned the name, you'd think I was bringing Cleopatra. Don't you see, Philip? We simply have to go through with this plan. Yes, but I... I know it's hard on all of you, but I've got to know where I stand with him. As me, a person, not as Nora Hunter. I've just got to know. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars will be back with Act Three of Bride by Mistake. And now, here's a young lady making the first entry in her 1945 diary. Happy, happy New Year's Day. Oh, last night was wonderful. Jim and I dance almost every dance, and at 12 o'clock... Goodbye, 1944. Oh, happy New Year, Jenny. And to you, Jim. It's bound to be a good year for me, Jenny, now I've met you. Gosh, you're pretty. You're adorable. Well, Diary, I'm going to see him next time he's home on leave. And we'll write every day. And here's something else. It's every day in the new year for my Luxo Beauty Facials. They've done wonders for my complexion. My Jim says it's smooth as peaches. Pretty girls, adorable girls, girls with lovely Lux complexions, girls everywhere who depend on the Screen Stars Beauty Facials find they do work wonders for the skin. Recent tests proved it. Three out of four complexions improved in a short time with this gentle daily care. So it's a good sound New Year's resolution for any girl to make. Regular active lather facials with Lux Toilet Soap. Don't miss out on the loveliness that should be yours. Try this fine white soap that's Hollywood's complexion care. Let Lux Toilet Soap facials with their creamy caressing lather care for your precious complexion. And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll have something very special for you in the way of a surprise. So be sure to join us at curtain call time. Now here's Act Three of Bride by Mistake. 
starring Lorraine Day as Nora, John Hodiak as Tony, and Marsha Hunt as Sylvia. At the rest home for army flyers on the Hunter estate, a soldier takes a bride. And now the ceremony's over and the reception is in progress. Among the guests are Nora Hunter and Sylvia. But Nora is still posing as her own secretary. And Sylvia still impersonates the heiress in the scheme to find out whether Captain Travis is in love with Nora or her fortune. Right now, she's in his arms, her cheek against his shoulder. But it isn't love, it's just a waltz. Kind of quiet, aren't you? Mm-hmm. I was thinking. What about? Oh, nothing much. The wedding ceremony and how happy they both look, starting out for what will be their first home together, even if it is only for two weeks. Funny, I was thinking the same thing. Remember my saying that I might get married someday? Yes. I have a feeling that day may not be quite as far off as I thought. What makes you think so? The Army's planning to turn a lot of us into flight instructors, keep us here at home. And if that happens, I want someone around to console me. <laughs> Tony, you know you've made quite an impression on Miss Hunter. On Nora? Don't be silly, she hardly oh, looks at me. Oh, just the same, she likes you. How do you know? She told me. No kidding. Yes, she said you were attractive and intelligent. In fact, she said you were the kind of a man a lot of girls would go for. Gosh, I never thought with all her money... What? Oh, oh, nothing. What else she said? Just a little thing. Enough to make me feel that if... Well, if ever you went after her in earnest, you, you might get somewhere. Still on the same campaign, huh? Look, uh, why are you so anxious to palm me off on Nora? Well, I'd say she was a pretty good catch. How do you know I like her? Well, you do, don't you? Well, yes. But when it comes to marriage, that takes L.U.V. love. You've got to make up your mind sometime. Oh, did you know that you're invited to the beach house with us? Nora asked me to tell you. We're all going down this weekend. Will you come? Sure. Oh, wonderful. It's settled then. It'll be heavenly at the beach this time. Look, Nora, all afternoon they've been together sunbathing, swimming, sailing. And remember, that's my wife he's squiring. We agreed to give him every chance to fall in love with her. Uh, but I'm beginning to wonder if he is the man for you. Maybe this is all a mistake. Why? Well, every time you leave him alone, he moves in on Sylvia. Oh, he doesn't move in on her. She moves in on him, according to agreement. But what girl in her right mind would test a man's feeling for her by throwing another girl at him? All right, if you're so smart, tell me why he enjoys her company so much. Well, he's a young man in uniform, and she's a pretty girl. If he didn't enjoy her company, I'd send for a doctor. Then what do you want me to do? Get him alone sometime tonight. Soft music. And give him a chance. It's nice out here on the balcony, isn't it? With the moonlight. Beautiful flying weather, night like this. Do you miss flying? Yeah. Up in the air, I'm clear-headed. I know what I'm doing and why. I know where I'm going. Down here, I'm sort of... Up in the air, you might say. I don't know anything. I know how you feel. Tony, they say that if if, if you tell someone else your troubles, it, it helps straighten them out. It's all right. Go ahead. I'm listening. You're listening? Yeah. Well, well, Tony, there's a war going on, and, and that changes a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You don't know anyone who has a long engagement anymore, do you? As a matter of fact, I don't know anybody who gets engaged. That's right. They just fall in love and get married. That's all there's time for. If, if you love someone, you ought to walk right up to him and say, My name is Mary Smith, and I love you. And I ought to say, My name is Anthony Travis, and I love you. Yes. But to say that to Nora Hunter doesn't seem right. It doesn't? No, it scares the pants off me. Now, if it were you, I'd say, Sylvia, I love you. That feels right. Feels natural. Does it? Yes. And I feel right, too. When I'm with her, I feel as if I were two men. One guy was pushing the other, saying, Go ahead, it's good for you. Well, wouldn't it be good for you? Good? Why, sure, it would be great. It'd be wonderful, but... But what? How do I know she'd have me? Well, there's only one way to find out. Propose to her tonight. Tonight? So soon? It seems almost... Oh, oh excuse me. I didn't mean to interrupt. You weren't interrupting. I was just about to go and dress for dinner. You'd better, dear. It's half past seven. I'll look after Tony. Thanks. 
See you all for cocktails. And Tony, don't forget, tonight. Jonathan, careful with those pins. Oh, why don't you get a dress that doesn't need pins? Ouch! Jonathan, I think you're sticking me on purpose. Yeah, I should. From what you've told me, you certainly messed up that balcony episode. Now what do you plan to do? Well, I, I thought that after dinner tonight, the rest of us could play bridge. Leave them together in the study. That'll give him a chance to propose and she'll turn him down. And it'll be over. You won't want him. Not if he proposes to her, but... But what? Perhaps he won't propose to her. Why shouldn't he? She's rich. At least he thinks she is. And she's pretty. And on top of all that, you've been egging him along. But if he loves somebody else, he won't propose to her. And you think he loves you? I don't know. That's what I've got to find out. Don't forget, after dinner we play bridge and leave them in the study. Nora, stop shuffling those cards. It's your deal. Can't. Samuel isn't here yet. What's he doing? In the kitchen, getting something Tony ordered. Well, Samuel's supposed to be the handyman around here. Least he can do is play a hand of bridge. What are we playing for, a tenth? Well, what do you say, Philip? What? A tenth of a cent? No, no, I'm not going to play for money, not the way my mind is wandering. <laughs> now, listen to her. How would you feel if your wife were closeted with another man who had designs on marriage? What are they doing? I can't see from here. That's what's driving me crazy. I'm going to peek. <laughs> well? They're sitting in front of the fire. I built that fire myself because Sylvia felt a cold coming on. A cold? Well, a nickel, I'd go in there and put it out right in his face. What was that? She sneezed. Sneezed, huh? So what? She sneezed. When's this bridge game going to start? Where's Samuel? Oh, stop fretting, Jonathan. Here he is now. Oh, it's about time, Samuel. And what in heaven's name have you got there? Claret, cinnamon stick. And the juice of six lemons. <coughs> Excuse me. Come in. What do you want that for? He's going to introduce Sylvia to Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe? Where'd he come oh, from? Oh, skip it. Samuel, leave the door open. Leave it open. Seems to me like something funny's going on here. Never mind. Deal, Samuel. Why, you're bold. Uh... He closed the door. Well, what do you expect? Whose deal is it? Mine. Oh, I, I think it should be my deal. For heaven's sake, Samuel, don't be so absent-minded. Steal him, Nora. What's that? Sounds like steam. A hissing noise. They call that a preview of paradise. Preview of paradise? I don't get it. Nora, there's still time to stop this nonsense. Jonathan, if I told him now, he'd, he'd be so humiliated, he'd never speak to me again. Did you say something, Samuel? I was about to bid. Three clubs. It's not your bid. It's Jonathan's. You dealt. Huh? One club. One club. I just said one club. Oh, did you? I'm sorry. Two clubs. Philip? Two clubs. I just said two clubs. Oh, oh, did you? Pardon me. Um, three clubs. Samuel, don't be so nervous. Go ahead and bid. Pardon me. Would you mind reviewing the bidding? Oh, all right. Pass. 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 Go ahead, Samuel. For heaven's sake, say something. Pass. Second rubber, we 1100 day zero. Nora, please go in there. He's not going to ask her, Jonathan. I know he's not going to ask he's her. He's been in there an hour and 15 minutes not asking her. Is that what you're going to make yourself believe? Well, if you're not going in there, I am. I can't stand it any longer. Hey, you all, what do you think's happened? What? Congratulate me, everybody. Congratulate me. Sylvia, Jonathan, I propose and I've been accepted. You've what? That's right. I don't wonder you're surprised. I've been accepted. Uh, congratulations. Thanks. Didn't think I had a chance in a million. How about drinking a toast to the bride and bridegroom, folks? Uh, I'm sorry, Tony. I'm afraid I'm awfully tired. You'll, you'll have to excuse me. Well, what's the matter with Sylvia? She isn't feeling very well. Oh, too bad. Well, you'll both join me in a drink, won't you? Well, it's a little late for me. I, I think I'll turn in. Uh, good night. Uh, Philip, I, uh... I suppose this has been kind of a surprise to you. There's no one I'd rather have lost her to than you, old man. <laughs> Good night. Well, where is everybody? Isn't anybody going to say congratulations? They all got tired all of a sudden. 
Oh, too bad. Just when I've learned I'm going to be a bride. <laughs> the chair bumped into me. You look a little tired yourself, young lady. I'd better see that you get to bed. Upstairs with you. Mm-hmm. You know, I still can't believe it. Neither can I. I proposed, and you accepted. I did, didn't I? Yep. <laughs> Boy, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, who was that relative of yours? Who, Uncle Joe? Mm-hmm. I like him. Oh, here we are. Good night, Tony. Good night, darling. Sleep tight. Oh, hi there, Samuel. Thought you'd gone to bed, too. I just came in to tidy up a bit. Well, how's for joining me in a drink? Thanks. I need one. Good. Didn't know you were drinking, man. I wasn't until tonight. Oh, not feeling well? There's something funny going on around here. There. A house for drinking to my marriage to Miss Nora. Huh? What's that? Looks like Mr. Phillips. Where's he going? Search me. Well, that's Nora's room. Hey, he's kissing her goodnight. Mm. Taking his time about it, too. Something funny is going on around here. Honestly, Nora, I didn't mean to say yes. But that recipe of his. Oh, my head's been aching ever since 5 o'clock this morning. That Uncle Joe special? I don't remember which relative, but he certainly had a happy life. Nora, give him a day or two, and if he's half the man that Pinky said he was, he'll back out. I'm sure he will, Nora. He never once said he loved me. No. So far as I'm concerned, it's all over. He shouldn't have proposed to you. We're going back to the house right after breakfast. You'll have to keep pretending to be me until then, and then he can find out. Come in. Good morning. I'm glad you're all together. I want you to hear this. Look, Nora, we aren't getting married. We're not... Why? What happened? Your house guests, they walk in their sleep. And one of them happened to walk up to your door last night. I saw him kiss you, and it wasn't a congratulations kiss either. Wait! That's no reason to break your engagement. I'm very funny. I always break my engagements for that reason. I'll call you at the house, Sylvia. Don't go. I, I, I don't make a habit of telling people, but... Nora and I changed rooms last night. And if you saw anybody being kissed, it was I. And now you might apologize to your fiancé. Oh, I'm sorry. Nora, I haven't even pity for you. I tried to understand when you wanted him to choose you in preference to whom he thought was Nora Hunter, but to give him another obstacle to overcome. I had to do it. I had to. In heaven's name, why? He'd still come to me as second choice. Well, you needn't fear now. Jonathan... Nora, darling, I understand your feelings, but we still have to go through breakfast with him. Come on, let's go down and get it over with. Hmm? Morning, Samuel. Samuel? Good morning. I got cereal, pancakes, eggs, bacon. Just coffee. Black. The same. By the way, Tony, we're leaving after breakfast. Thanks. Oh, a life on the ocean wave, a home on the rolling sea. Oh, that's the life for me. Good morning, good morning, everybody. And how are the lovely young ladies this morning? Did you rest well, Sylvia? Yes, I did, Philip. Thanks. And now, uh, you don't mind, Tony, if I uh, kiss your fiancé good morning? You're not married yet, you know. <sighs> oh, boy, have I an appetite. What a day. Great. Glorious. Oh, there you are, Samuel. I'll, uh, I'll have eggs, bacon, pancakes, more eggs. Oh, I feel so good, I don't know if I can sit still to eat it. Oh, a life on the ocean wave, a home on the rolling sea. Just a minute, uh, sailor. You're going to hit the deck. <laughs> you, Sylvia, get your coat. You're getting out of here. Huh? I don't know why I think you're worth saving any more than the rest of these people, but I do. Now, get out of this house. I will not. Don't argue with me. There's no telling who I might hit next. If you've one shred of decency, I'll find it if I have to beat it into you. Now, get up. Get out of that chair. Don't you talk to me like that. Don't you touch me. Let go of me. Put me down. Jonathan, stop him. Somebody save me. Samuel, let them let alone. Me go. Jonathan, save me all. <laughs> I thought something funny was going on around here. Six lemons, cinnamon sticks, and claret. All here. Now the poker in the fire. Tony. What is it, Sylvie, darling? Do you really love me? No, no, I just married you because I thought you'd be a good influence on our children. No, no, this is serious. Do you really love me? More than you know. Mmm, -hmm. smells good. And you remember saying that uh, that you'd be a heel not to marry the girl you love 
just because she happens to have a couple of million dollars? Oh, sure, sure. That was while I was introducing you to Uncle Joe. And you still mean it? Sure, I mean it. But you can't push me off on Nora now. I've got you. Just the same, you'd better take a good look at our marriage license. Well, you're not going to tell me now that it's not legal. Oh, it's legal, all right. Just read it. <laughs> What's the matter with you? It looks beautiful to me. It's the most beautiful... No. Tony, darling. Say something. Nora Hunter. So that's who you are. It was a trick. I had to do it, Tony. Really? Where's that poker? Tony, you're not angry. You're not going to... Here it is, and it's good and hot. Oh, oh, Tony, you're not going to do anything. Certainly I'm going to do something. Where's that picture of Claret? Ah. Ah. Preview of Paradise. Lorraine Day, John Hodiak, and Marsha Hunt come to the footlights for a well-deserved curtain call. You started the new year off for us with flying colors, all of you. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Marsha, I've just been reading the critics' reviews of your new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, Music for Millions. It looks as if you had a hit on your hands. Thank you. We hope so. You build me with two very talented young ladies, C.B. Mm, more than talented, John. Mm-hmm. Good-looking, too. <laughs> of course. They're both Lux girls. <laughs> well, I certainly am a Lux girl, Mr. DeMille. And to any girl who wants to look attractive and romantic, I'd suggest Lux Toilet Soap. Yes, you know the saying. While there's Lux, there's hope. There's who? Hope. Well, don't look now, but I think you're right. There is hope. How do you do? How are you? Sorry to butt in this, I guess. How do you do? How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob. Better to get in at the last minute than never hope. <laughs> Telling you girls that Lux Toilet Soap will give you a complexion that sends men into a delirium. Honestly, it's so good it must contain irium. <laughs> How are you? Lorraine. Well, Bob, thank you. Thank you. But uh, uh, just what brings you to our stage tonight? Oh, I just wanted to sell you a book, C.B. I never left home. You never left home to sell me a book. No. No, that's the title. I never left home. The author, Bob Hope. The price... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, surely, Bob, uh, you can afford to give me a copy. Huh? I'm with Paramount. I could get you into pictures. C.B., you're using my line. Look, I... <laughs> I can't give you a book because the profits from the sale of this book go to the National War Fund. Oh, well, that's different. I, I've read your book, Bob, and I think it's great. In fact, we're dramatizing it on the Lux Radio Theater next Monday night. I never left home next Monday night? Yes, with Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna, Tony Romano. Well, who are you getting to play the lead? Yes, that's what I was going to ask. You know, the part uh, of the comedian. <laughs> the comedian? Uh, me, Hope. Well, we, uh, we offered the part to Crosby, but he turned it down. <laughs> Not big enough. Bing Crosby? No, his brother Everett. Oh, the thin one. Well, you know, see, the I'm going to be free next Monday night. Yeah, yeah, I guess you are, Bob. Oh. <laughs> what I mean is available for employment if you get hired up for anything like that. Well, well I, I, I hate to see any actor out of work, Bob, so you're hired. Five bucks. <clears throat> Just a minute, and so, <laughs> our cast for next Monday night will be Bob Hope, the lovely singer Francis Langford, comedian Jerry Colonna, and guitar strumming Tony Romano in a dramatized version of Bob Hope's best-selling book, I Never Left Home. Really, Bob, I, I think it'll be a great show for our audience. So do I. I read the book and I thought it was a riot. We'll be hanging, <laughs> we'll be hanging on every line, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. And don't leave home next Monday night or you'll miss I Never Left Home. One New Year's Day, not very long ago, an American poetess wrote, I would rather walk with God through darkness than alone in light. 
She was looking ahead to the new year and seeing it as we do now, a year of trial and tribulation. Tonight, I can't wish you just a happy new year. There's too much pain in the world, too much suffering, too grim a task ahead of us. But I can wish you courage and hope and faith and abundance. With these in time, we can forge a new world in which freedom and human rights are guaranteed to every man and woman, and understanding will replace intolerance. Until that time, no one of us need despair if we can say, I would rather walk with God through darkness than alone in light. Now, our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, join me in wishing all of us a victorious 1945. And we invite you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Bob Hope, Francis Langford, Jerry Colono, and Tony Romano in I Never Left Home. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The 15th is an important date for millions of American taxpayers. It's the final date when you must file income tax declarations for 1944 or revise, if necessary, declarations previously filed. If you haven't received the necessary forms by mail, get them from your local collector of internal revenue or from your post office or bank. Remember, January 15th is the final date for filing or amending declarations. Ride by Mistake was presented through the courtesy of RKO Radio Pictures. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Tune in again next Monday night to hear I Never Left Home with Bob Hope, Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna, and Tony Romano. 24 points for butter, no points for spry. Let all-purpose spry shortening help solve your rationing problem, give you more delicious cakes, pies, and fried foods. Use spry instead of butter for white sauce and for vegetables, too. 24 points for butter, no points for spry. Tomorrow, ask your grocer for spry shortening. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of I Never Left Home with Bob Hope, Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna, and Tony Romano. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mystery Theater. Mystery Theater presents Inspector Mark Saber of Homicide in The Case of the Cancelled Bride. Don't let the need of a laxative make you feel logy and irritable when it's so easy to feel better with Phillips Milk of Magnesia. For 75 years, the best laxative money can buy, Phillips, is gentle enough for children and thorough enough for grown-ups. Countless people everywhere have found that Milk of Magnesia provides better relief, more complete relief, than laxatives which just act on irregularity alone. And Milk of Magnesia is able to do this because it's actually more than a laxative. It also relieves any accompanying acid indigestion. And what's more, three tablespoons of Phillips Milk of Magnesia, taken with water at bedtime when necessary, can be used without embarrassing urgency. For Phillips works leisurely. By morning, it should bring you the wonderfully effective, the wonderfully thorough relief you want, so that you can start your new day feeling fit and ready for whatever lies ahead. So get Phillips tomorrow. The 25-cent size, the 50-cent size, or the economical family size. And when you buy, make sure you ask for it by name. Phillips Milk of Magnesia, the best laxative money can buy. And now, the case of the canceled bride. In the main lounge at Bartley Sheridan's luxurious yacht, the Sinbad, moored at the Borden Dock, 
A beautiful and defiant woman, Melanie Cabot, rises to shock a strange ship's company with her news. To shock them and to enjoy the sensation she is about to create. Quiet, everybody, for just two minutes. What's all this about, Melanie? Oh, put the guitar down for a minute. Could you find out? All right. There's me, Lisa, Danny, all of you. Uh, Melanie, honey, uh, wouldn't it be better Pardon if we kind me, of... darling, this is my announcement, and not even you can keep me from making it my own way. You all may have wondered why Bobby asked you here for dinner on the yacht tonight. He did it because I asked him to. And I wanted each of you for a particular reason. I'm not sure any of you will be pleased at my news, and some of you may... Well, you can judge for yourselves. But I felt that each of you had a right to hear this directly. Get to it, Melanie. What's up? It's very simple, Danny. I'm very proud and happy to announce that Bartley Sheridan and I are to be married. What? Married? You're clowning, what Melanie. You say? You, you've been having some laughs with Bartley here, and nobody can kick on that, but if you're trying to tell us... You're not trying, I... Danny. I've told you. And you, Lisa, and Betsy and Kurt. Bart and I are to be married before the month is out. Isn't anyone going to congratulate us? Uh -oh. The lights. Who turned the lights off? Well, they've all blown. It must be a few. Oh, God, darling, I'm scared. It's pitch black in here. Easy, everybody. We got some flashlights in the locker here. It's all right. Remember that can of gas that was filled? Bart, where are you? Darling, I... <laughs> Melanie, honey, what is it? Where are you? Bart, there's something wrong. Terribly wrong. Melanie, faint or there's something... Yeah, Skipper? There's your lights coming back on. Something out of blue fuse, but... Well, here you are, all lighted up again. Oh, thanks, Alan. Betsy, what in the world? Luke! What? Crumbled up there by the table. Oh. Luke! It's Melanie. With a knife driven into her throat. Inspector Saber. Yes, this is Mark Saber. Inspector, it's Tim. Tim Maloney. Sorry to be after bothering you at this hour, but... It's all right, Tim. What is it? Well, I'm down at the office, and we've just had this flash from Barton. Homicide? Oh, with Belzon. Melanie Cabot on Bartley Sheridan's yacht. Melanie Cabot? When? Well, not half an hour ago. A knife in her throat. Tim. Yes, Inspector. Pick me up in a squad car, and you can fill me in on the way down. And, Tim. Yes, sir. Ask Borden to freeze onto it so we can get there. <laughs> Tim, mind your footing there. This ladder's slippery. Oh, don't fear, Inspector. I'm climbing with the care of a mountain goat. Can I give you a hand up, sir? No, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, well, here we are. Inspector Saber? That's right, and this is Sergeant Maloney. How do you do? I'm Myers from the boarding force here. Glad you could get down so soon. Say, so take a look at the brasswork, Inspector. If this isn't the fanciest yacht this side of... the people on the yacht we are interested in. Lounge now, waiting for you. Had your medical report yet? Preliminary. Death by stabbing. The body's been taken ashore, but we've got pictures, first statements, and all Miss Cabot's effects. If you'll follow me, sir, I'll be glad to... Just your... a moment, Myers. As I understand it, you've held five passengers aboard. That's right, sir. The five that were there when this thing happened. Uh, Bartley Sheridan, his sister, Lisa, uh, Miss Betty Taggart, a smoothie named Gert Lessing, and the gentleman you may have heard of, Danny Coles. Danny Coles? Not Big Danny! Big Danny Coles. Mr. Rackets himself. Uh-oh. Inspector, we've really stepped into one. Melanie Cabot's big enough news by herself. When she gets knocked off on a millionaire's yacht with Big Danny Coles mixed up in it... Our but... job isn't to write the headlines, Tim. It's still to find out who put this knife into Miss Cabot's throat. Myers, I think I'd rather examine the lounge on my own before seeing these five. Would there be cabins available where they could wait till I'm ready for them? I'd like to have as much space in my own house, Inspector. <laughs> sure, we can salt them away until you call for them. Yeah, thanks. I'll probably take them one more... A knife that could have been used by any one of five persons. A woman who couldn't have been murdered by anyone but one of these five. You've ruled out the skipper and the yacht's crew, Inspector. I have to, Tim. After hearing the accounts of these five, it's clear that no outsider would have had time to get in and get out during the minute or so of darkness. The knife that was there at hand from this weapons collection that Melanie herself had asked to see. With fingerprints wiped clean. Uh-huh. And, and a short circuit that could have been rigged by any of them. 
How do we get a handhold on this one, Inspector? Well, our murder is still aboard, Tim. That's the starting point, thanks to the local men. You were pretty easy on this crowd the first time around, Inspector. Can we get going on Danny Coles again? Mm, and more. Seven again. Have her on a second, Inspector. Uh-oh. Here we go for the chills again. This Sheridan girl isn't liking any part of this, Inspector. We're not trying to endear ourselves to anyone, Tim. We're here to find a murderer. You have to see me again, Inspector. If you'll be good enough to sit down. <sighs> Miss Sheridan, may I ask when you first began to hate Melanie Cabin? I beg your pardon, Inspector. Well, if you prefer, we'll say dislike. I first met Melanie on this yacht. A little over two years ago. I'm to take it your dislike dated from that first meeting. I never pretended to like her. The whole world knows what Melanie Cabot was. Mm, A sweeping statement, Miss Sheridan. She was notorious, Inspector. Twice married. In scandal after scandal. As I understand it, Miss Sheridan, your brother inherited the greater part of his money from his first wife, Joan Barrington. After nearly dying to save her, Inspector, did they remember to tell you that? Oh, I've seen records of the tragedy. The first Mrs. Sheridan was lost overboard from this yacht in a storm. Your brother Bartley dived over recklessly after her and was rescued himself only by the narrowest of margins. The yacht's rudder was damaged, Inspector. Bartley went in after Joan without waiting for a boat or a life preserver. And he spent eight hours swimming in the darkness before a coast guard kind of picked him up the morning after. Do you think Melanie Cabot could ever have understood, let's see, all of her husbands? I believe that includes Court de Lessing. Yes, he was the last one. Divorced about a year ago. But possibly still in love with her? I can't answer for what Court de Lessing uses for emotions. Four months ago, he let it be known that he and Melanie were planning to be remarried. When you heard that surprise announcement tonight, Miss Sheridan, was your greatest resentment at the disgrace to the Sheridan name or the possible diversion of Bartley's money? Inspector, if you're trying to establish that I hated Melanie Cabot, consider it established. Thank you. I did hate her and all she stood for, but I didn't kill her if that's what you're really asking. Well, of course, that's what I'm actually asking. Well, you have your answer then. I hope I have, Miss Sheridan. I hope I have. My sister never really understood Melanie, Inspector. Melanie had made her mistakes, as we all have, but underneath she could be as decent and generous and loyal as... Well, I, I would have been proud of her as my wife, but... I even think... Yes, Bartley? You even think what? Well, I I think even Lisa could have learned to like and respect Melanie if she'd been able to forget the gossip and pull off her own social blinders long enough to give Melanie half a chance. You knew yourself that Melanie, as Mrs. Bartley Sheridan, might draw social disapproval. However unfair... Wait a minute, Inspector. I loved Melanie. I didn't stop to weigh out how my sister or anyone else would take it. I loved her, and I wanted to marry her. And now... I'm sorry, Bartley, if you'd rather wait till... I want Melanie's killer discovered and punished, Inspector Saber. Whatever I can do to help you on that... You may be able to help us a great deal. I've written a request on this sheet of paper. Now, if you concur on it, would you be good enough to take this to Officer Myers and your Captain Adams? Well, of course, but what... Thank you, Bartley. For the moment, the request is confidential. When the lights went out, Bartley is the only one I could rule out with any certainty, Inspector. And your own position, Mr. DeLetting? Very naturally. I stood still and relaxed. There's always someone to rush around and correct such trifles as a blown fuse. But not Court DeLetting, naturally. <laughs> you say you've been invited on this yacht before? But of course. I've known Bartley for some years. I'm connected with one of his companies. I can't say that you look like a businessman. A technical specialist. The firm deals in women's handbags, gloves, and imported accessories. And you're an expert on... On women, Inspector. I give the company my best judgment as to what might attract my attention. I see. As I'm told, you hope to remarry Melanie yourself up to a few months ago. Melanie was unpredictable, Inspector. And I happen to be a man of the world. When she made clear that she was in love with Bartley, I very naturally stepped aside. With no ill will? Of course, with no ill will. As I told you, I am a man of the world. You, uh, doubt me, Inspector? 
That's putting it mildly, Delessing. But we'll talk again. <laughs> Miss Taggart, you're in no way obliged to answer. It would help me if I could know. I can only tell you that. All right, I'm not ashamed of it. Yes, I love Bartley. I guess I always have, ever since we were children together. So that you as well couldn't have been too pleased by Melanie's announcement tonight. The announcement that that led to her death? Well, let's say that preceded her death. Mr. Saber, I think Melanie made her announcement... To exactly the four people in the world who, who'd least want to hear it. The four. Yes. Now, it's Court de Lessing, Lisa Sheridan, yourself. And this gangster they call Danny Coles. The only man Melanie had ever been in love with. How's that again, but Betsy? I... We didn't call for you yet, Danny. I don't wait to be called, copper. Not when I know there's a fast one on. What are you trying to pull, Saber? We're looking for a murderer, Danny. Do you have to kidnap your witnesses to hang this on somebody? Kidnap? No. Oh. Well, how did you learn of the orders I gave Captain Adams? Listen for yourself. That ain't a dishwasher machine they're warming up down below. The ship's engines? Why, well, is that what you asked Captain Adams to do, Inspector? Take this yacht out to sea. The murderer's aboard, Tim. I think we'll see that he or she stays aboard so we can name the one who stabbed Melanie Cabot. Now, you don't object, Danny, if the Sinbad puts out to sea? Take you to the South Sea Islands if you want. If you can waste the time, I guess I can. And you, Miss Taggart? I'm not afraid of your investigation either, Inspector. We seem to have ample food and supplies aboard, and the others have already made clear that they have no objections to the plan. Now, wait a minute, Inspector. What about my objections? Yours, Tim. Well, not mine, but my wife's. What's Maggie going to think if she hears I've taken off on a fancy cruise to nowhere? The Borden men have phoned Mrs. Maloney already, Tim. They have? How'd Maggie take it? She had just one wifely word of warning. Tim, you're to keep your feet dry. My feet dry? Why, of all the... Hey... We're starting to move. For a cruise to what Tim calls nowhere, Danny Coles. What would you call it, Inspector Sable? One person aboard knows the destination, Miss Taggart. In California here, we call it the gas chamber. Inspector! Inspector, look at those waves out there. We've got a storm coming up. Storms inside and out, Tim. Right. Inside and out. If you suffer with ordinary headaches, remember this about genuine Bayer aspirin. You needn't accept anybody's word for its quick-acting properties, for your own eyes will show you one reason why Bayer aspirin means fast relief. Simply drop a Bayer aspirin tablet in a glass of water and watch how quickly it acts. You'll see it start to disintegrate before it reaches the bottom of the glass. And that's what it does in your stomach. It begins to disintegrate almost instantly. This amazingly fast disintegrating action is one reason, a reason you can actually see, why Bayer aspirin tablets give you relief with astonishing speed. Keep this in mind next time you have a headache and want fast relief. And remember, too, that Bayer aspirin also means dependable relief. No other pain reliever can match its record of use by millions of normal people without ill effect. When you buy, ask for it by name, Bayer aspirin not just for aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle, and you get Bayer aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. And now back to Mystery Theater and Inspector Mark Saber's duel at sea with the unknown murderer of Melanie Cabot. On the after deck of the yacht, Sergeant Tim Maloney finds Inspector Saber examining a square-shaped canvas-wrapped object he has just taken from one of the ship's lockers. Do you know what this is, Tim? Well, by the looks of it, it could be a life preserver. Well, let me have a heft of it. No. No, it's too heavy. The thing must be solid rubber. It's a self-inflating life raft, Tim. Navy airmen never fly without them. Watch. Now, I'll slip it out of this cover and touch it off. There's a cylinder of compressed air here... Now, that is something. The thing's blown up to make a regular little boat. But, but Inspector, how do you ever get it squeezed down again to fit back in that cover? I won't try, Tim. They've got five more there in case of emergency. It was this cover I'm interested in. Do you notice that it's different from the others there in the locker? Well, it's a shade off in color, but not enough to... It's off in color, and I think we'll find a different date of issue. 
Oh, now, begging your pardon, Inspector, and of course I'm glad to be learning about life at sea. But what's all this got to do with finding the twister who knifed poor Melanie Cabot? Poor Melanie Cabot? Well, since she's dead, rest her soul. We'll leave her to account for herself for what she was. But for the life of me, I don't see us any nearer her murderer. <laughs> you think we're at sea in more ways than one, Tim? It's, it's like trying to drive nails into a fog, Inspector. We've got four people who could have done it as easy as snuffing out a match. The knife there for anyone to grab. The wire in that could have been blown by any one of them. And not a match nor a lighter could be lit because... Because a can of gasoline had been tripped over by a steward in the lounge not an hour before. A can of gasoline that could have been placed there by any of them. Oh, Inspector, we've got too many who could have done it. And we've got too many with motives for doing it. Take big Danny Coles. Melanie's been his girl for years. Whatever the husband she had. But here she was moving up to a league where she'd never need Danny again. And throw in that smack in his face. You know, while you're at it, Tim, take Lisa Sheridan. You hurt her? I'm not sure she wouldn't rather see Bartley himself dead than married to Melanie. And Betsy Taggart? Oh, now that girl's been in love with Bartley all her life. The first marriage was hard enough for her to take. And here was Melanie going to slam the door on her for keeps. Court de Lessing. You heard him say he couldn't care less whether Melanie married Bartley or not. Now, look, Inspector, you wouldn't be after believing a word that I'm meant... afraid I share your prejudice against him, Tim. But at the moment, Court de Lessing's the one member of this ship's company I'm most interested in seeing again. Well, Meyer says he's down in his cabin, plunking away in that guitar of his. You want me to rub him out for you? No, no, I've got just two or three points of facts I'd like to clear up with Lisa first, and then I'll go find de Lessing myself. Yeah, mind your hat, Tim. The wind's picking up again. Well, well, hello. Come on in. I thought it was one of those cops again for more of that grilling. Uh, just a second. I got a bottle stuck away in this upper berth here. I think we can still find some ice in that bucket. Well, it's up here someplace. I put it... Well, I've been right out here on the deck, Inspector Sabre. I can't think why you didn't see me before. If you say you looked out here. You're leaning against the rail quietly enough now, Miss Sheridan, but you seem to be suffering from shortness of breath. May I ask if you've just been running? Since you ask, Inspector, perhaps I have been moving around. A little. To avoid me. If I possibly could. That's frank enough, Lisa. May I ask why? Isn't there an old shipboard rule, never pick up with strangers on the first night out? Or inspectors of the homicide division. I've answered all your questions, Inspector. And distinguished looking as you are, I'm certainly not in the mood for small talk. Or... Uh, Whatever else you had in mind. It wasn't shipboard romance, Lisa. I have some new questions, and I'd appreciate straight answers. You say you first met Melanie aboard this yacht. Yes, that's straight enough. It is. Can you remember the exact date? The newspapers could tell you. It was the night Bartley's first wife was lost overboard. Was Court de Lessing with her? Of course. They were still married then. And you and Betsy Taggart were on the cruise. You couldn't really call it a cruise. It was meant to be no more than a few hours' sail. For dinner, dancing... Until the storm came up and damaged the rudder and swept Joan Sheridan overboard. Uh, may I ask why you keep returning to... Could that have been more than an accident, Lisa? Could oh. Joan have been shoved over by Court or Melanie? Inspector Saber, I'm sure you're on the wrong track. Court and Melanie saw Bartley go over because he cried out to them. But... Bartley himself could tell you much more about all Inspector, that than I can. Inspector, could you come over here, please? Oh, excuse me, please, sir. Yes, what is it, Tim? Myers just went down to get Kurt DeLessing for you. And he didn't find him down in his cabin. Myers found him, all right, with a knife in his back. Dead? Still warm, but dead. 
Oh, but Tim DeLessing was no child. He couldn't have been stabbed without some kind of struggle or an outcry. Our murderer is no child either, Inspector. On this one, DeLessing was blackjacked first, then the knife to finish him. It could have been a man or a woman. The cabin's down this way, sir. We've taken chances enough, Tim. Lisa, get to the lounge and stay there. Tim, go with her and get Miles to collect the rest. There's one I'll go for myself, Inspector. Big Danny Cole. You're to stick there in the lounge, Tim, and see that no one gets near the lights or wiring. I'll have a look at DeLessing and then get Coles myself. Coles. Coles, open up in there. Coles, I want you up in the lounge with the rest. If you don't open up in there and come Run out... Come the party without me, Saber. I'm not coming out. Open up, Danny, or I'll shoot out the lock. I'll come out when this tub gets back to Port Saber, not before. Stand away from the line of fire, Danny. Here goes your lock. That's far enough in, copper. I've got a thirty-eight cover in the back of your neck. No, don't try to turn around. Just drop that gun of yours. You're making a mistake, Danny. A bad one. Just taking precautions, copper. Drop your gun. You were searched when we came aboard. Think I didn't expect that after Melanie got it? I parked this thirty-eight caliber insurance up in one of the lifeboats. I told you to drop your gun, Saber. Drop yours, Danny. I'm turning around. I'm warning you, Saber. I'm warning you, Danny. I'm turning around. Even if you fire, I'll get off shots before I go down, and they'll be right in your belt. All right, so you turned. Don't come any nearer, or I'm blasting off, cop or no cop. Why, you are scared, Danny. Really scared. Look, I'm not getting pulled out of here. If that killer could get two, Danny Coles isn't going to be number three. I'll have that gun now. Huh? Okay, you've got my gun. But if that killer has got me on the list, I... Panic me out here without your private army, Danny. Or is all this Look, just... Saber, I didn't get Melanie and I didn't have... I him. know that. You know I'm in the clear on this? This gun is what you rely on, Danny. You're not a knife man. What if you'd have told me that when I had you covered? I, I would... I, I don't bargain with criminals, Danny. Even when they're in the clear. Oh, but I can count on Get her. going up to the lounge. We've got a murderer there who may be getting restless again. All lined up for you, Inspector. Lisa, Betsy, and Danny Coles with Mr. Sheridan here and Myers to help keep them under control. Myers. Yes, Inspector. Take Danny Coles forward and ask Captain Adams to turn back for shore. You're what? sure of your murderer now, Inspector Saber? I think I am, Bartley. Myers. Yes. After you've told Captain Adams, hold Coles in that first starboard cabin. I'll be sending others to you in a moment. Right. The ones you still suspect, Inspector. The ones I'm clearing, Tim. Danny Coles had no part in our two murders. All right, Myers. You can cut along to Captain Adams and let Danny stick close to you. His nerves are showing. Yes, sir. Lisa and Betsy. Now, if it comes down to these two, Betsy... Inspector, I couldn't have killed Kurt DeLessing. I didn't like him, but can I Can you find your way him. alone to that starboard cabin, Betsy? I may be needing Tim here. Oh, oh you, you mean I... You're clear, Betsy. You've been in love with Bartley for a long time, but I doubt that you'd know where or how to put a man out with a blackjack. But then, you mean that Lisa... Run along, Betsy. And stick with Officer Myers when you get there. You think it is down to me, Inspector, that I do know how to use a blackjack. Or a knife. You're strong enough, Lisa. You've played tournament tennis for years. I'm glad Melanie Cabot's dead. I've admitted that, but I... Now, wait a minute, Ben Sheridan. The inspector will tell you you don't have to go making it any worse for yourself than it stands. If making a clean breast of it eases your mind, out with it and have done with the lies. But if you want to wait till you can see a lawyer... Tim. Um, Yes, Inspector. Well said, but Miss Sheridan won't be needing an attorney. But if you're after sending the other two out, it's clear. Quietly. Would you rather I sent Lisa off with the others or let her stay to hear this? Nope. Don't try for the deck. Yeah. This is one night you can't swim your way along. Coming to you. I got Tim, it. Tim, I've got his wrist. Knock that uh, knife loose. I got it, Inspector. And if this is our I double got. murderer, I've got him too. You can let go now. Our triple murderer, Tim. Bartley Sheridan started by blackjacking his first wife and pushing her overboard. You can't oh. prove that, Saber. Now with Not the witness. the witness is gone. True enough, Bartley. Thanks to you and their own greed, we don't have Melanie and Kurt to tell us how you shoved your wife overboard and then played the hero by going in after her. But we do know the insurance you took out that night. The insurance, Inspector? The inflatable life raft he threw over before diving, Tim. Our hero didn't risk staying alive by swimming. He used the missing life raft from that locker on the deck and didn't sink it till he sighted the Coast Guard cutter the following morning and knew he could be picked up. I've got the cover replacement raft, Bartley. It's close to the other five, but not 
close enough. A missing life raft isn't enough to prove murder. We may not have to try on that one, Bartley. You'll be convicted for your two murders tonight. But, Inspector, for a man to murder the girl he was in love with... Bartley was never in love with Melanie. Whatever he's done, Inspector, I'd swear to that. You'd swear correctly, Lisa. Melanie blackmailed your brother into the marriage plans. And court was in on it, as Bartley learned only after he thought he'd finished with Melanie. The man of the world wasn't looking to avenge Melanie just to collect double for the new situation. How much did he ask, Bartley? More than he got. And I'd kill him again if I had to. Put that in your notebook if you want, Sergeant. Inspector, do you mind if I go out on deck? The investigation's over, Lisa. Go out and get all the clean, fresh air you can. There won't be enough. After what I've learned of my brother... There won't be enough in all the winds of the Pacific. Good night, Inspector Safe. Good night, Lisa. Magnesia and Bayer Aspirin have just brought you Inspector Mark Saber in the case of the canceled bride on Mystery Theater. adventurer, The Shadow. Mystery man who strikes terror into the very hearts of shops, is lawbreakers, and criminals. Today, Blue Coal brings you The Shadow's latest adventure, The Bride of Death. The Shadow begins his exciting adventure in just a moment. Meanwhile, I'd like to make a suggestion to all you homeowners. To protect your family's health and save real money in the bargain, burn Blue Coal. For blue coal gives you uniform, helpful, economical heat all winter long. Its harmless blue coloring is your guarantee of better heat at less cost. So when you're buying fuel, insist on blue coal. It's Pennsylvania's finest hard coal. Order a trial turn from your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. Have the money at this hour of the night. May I come in? Oh, all right. I, uh, I'm the Reverend Colby from the fishing village below. I want to see Mrs. Ackley. She has retired. Come tomorrow. I must see her tonight. Why? My daughter, Isabel, is here. She's Mrs. Ackley's companion, but I've come to take her home. Ah, because Isabel, she does not wish to leave. I've come to fetch her. I'm a man of the cloth, a man of peace. I will not leave without her. Let me by. Parker, Matara, visitor, stop him. Yes, Master, a few commands. Let go of me. Take your hands off me, you heathen devils. Put him out. Keep him out. Wait. Mrs. Ackley. I will see him. How dare you break into my house this way, Reverend Colby. Because I will not have my daughter stay in a house that harbors evildoers, Mrs. Ackley. There's talk in the village of heathen rites performed by this man who calls himself prophet of the ancient one. This man you brought to a Christian place from some Asiatic sinkhole of the godless. Be careful how you speak in the presence of the prophet. You mean that man there? Yes, minister. I am the prophet. Prophet? Where is my daughter Isabel? She is leaving this house on the cliff tonight. Tell Reverend Colby she does not wish to go. I... Tell him, Mrs. Ackley. Your daughter Isabel does not wish to go. Good night, Reverend Colby. I I do not believe you. Let me see her. Let her tell me herself. She does not wish to see you. 
Get beyond the iron gates quickly, for in five minutes my servants will release my trained guardians. I'm not afraid of that unholy pack of black panthers of yours. They are dangerous, Minister. Trained in my native land. Trained to hunt and kill animals or men. Go now. Very well. I'm going, but I'll be back. I'll be back. Stop it. Why? Why do the panthers scream? It is an omen of death. Whose death? Tell me. The future is so plain to you. Tell me who is going to die. I see the minister, Reverend Colby, standing in the pulpit of his church, turning these simple fishing folks against you, Mrs. Ackley. Reverend Colby is going to die. But how? The wrath of the ancient one will strike him down with the voice of thunder and the tongue of fire. Mrs. Ackley's house on the cliff to bring my own daughter, Isabel Colby, home. But I could not see her, could not speak to her. She is lost to me, and therefore let my own sorrow be a warning to those of you in this village whose sons and daughters may go to that house of the devil, to this man who dares desecrate the name of prophet. Now, let us offer a prayer for the mistress of Casamani. So rich in worldly goods and worldly knowledge, and so long one of us. Kindly and generous until of late, and now ailing in mind and spirit, who hath turned from God to follow the pathway of a disciple of Satan. Let us pray. We beseech thee, have mercy on this poor lost one who has strayed from the fall. And so in the midst of those who perished with him and whom he loved so well, we return the body of our beloved minister, Reverend Colby. Return him to the earth, ashes unto ashes, dust unto dust. Yes, but where, Lamont? The fog's so thick I can't see a thing. This is the little village where the Reverend Colby and ten of his parishioners were killed by a mysterious explosion in his church. Oh, that was horrible. But, Lamont, it happened days ago. What can we do? Murder has been committed, Margot. Wholesale murder. And the killer or killers are still at large. But according to the newspaper report... Yes, I know. The paper said the authorities have been unable to uncover a possible motive. Investigation is hampered by the refusal of the fisher folk of this quaint little village to cooperate. Oh, perhaps they're afraid to talk, Lamont. Yes, it's surprising what superstition can do. What about this rich Mrs. Ackley you were talking about, Lamont? Where does she fit into the picture? I don't know, Margot. All I know is that about three months ago, she returned from the Far East with a man who calls himself the Prophet. This man claims to be the leader of a cult worshipping a deity known as the Ancient One. Is there such a cult? There was, but it was stamped out nearly five centuries ago because its ceremonies and rituals included... Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice? Yes. Oh, how horrible. Then you think there is a connection between this so-called prophet, the destruction of this Christian church, and the murder of Reverend Colby? Margot, I don't know. I'm going into that cottage down the road. There are some Christians. I'll wait in the car. 
Oh, oh, awful oh. foghorn. It gives me the creep. You'll be safe here, Margot, but don't get out of the car. All right. Now, Lamont Cranston and the Shadow are going to find out something more about this mystery of the house on the cliff. <laughs> Someone's at the door. Don't answer. And why not, Murphy? You think it's a ghost from the marshes or that devil from the cliff house? Yeah. Who's there? Don't open the door, sir. Stranger, I've lost my way in the fog. I'll tell him there's but one road back to the mainland. Well, leave this to me, Murphy. Where, uh, where are you heading for, stranger? Can you tell me how to get to Mrs. Ackley's place, Casa Mane? Yes, I could, but I won't. Wait, don't close the door. I'd like to ask a few questions. Uh, questions, huh? Well, ask them, but I'll not warrant an answer to anybody going to that house. You needn't be afraid of me. <laughs> I'm Captain Zeth. Uh, Fifty years I've sealed before the mast, and I'm not afraid of man, devil of the sea. Uh, who be you? I'll tell you this much, Captain Zeth. I'm yes? here to put an end to the thing that made your wife afraid to let you open this door. I can't see you out there in the dark, but... Uh, uh... Zeth! Huh? Those panthers! They've come down to the village again. What? Panthers? Who's are they? The prophets. Uh, step into the house, stranger. They'll tear a man to pieces. <laughs> well, what ails you, Marcy? The blue light. It's him coming in the gate. He always carries... <laughs> well, let him come. Get in the house, stranger. Well, Marcy, there's nobody here. Where is that fellow gone? He was here a second ago. Oh, I don't know. Maybe he ran for it. Death. What do you suppose that prophet fellow wants of us? Get away from the door, Martha. I'll deal with him. Good evening, my good captain. Stop where you be. I'll not have the likes of you in my house. A stranger came here. His car is down the road. The spirit of the ancient one told me of his coming. Who was the stranger? Where has he gone? To all your questions, I'll give you one answer. Get your howling beasts and your heathen godless self back to the house on the cliff, or I'll blow you to the very door of Hades. No man threatens the prophet and leave him. Get out! Very well, Captain. Since you will not tell me, I will find him. My servants are watching his car. We will find him. <laughs> He'll need all the unearthly powers you claim to find a man in this fog. Good night. I'll... Find him. He can't be far away. <laughs> no. Not far away, but close to you. In the dark shadows and the swirling mist. Who speaks? I am looking for a man with blood on his hands. The blood of a minister and ten innocent people he murdered. Are you a man hiding in the fog? Do not try so hard to pierce the fog. You cannot see me, for I am the shadow. The shadow? A voice without physical presence? Only a voice? No, my friend. In my native India, such things are known. But not here. The powers of mesmerism have spread beyond the gray monastic walls of the yogi priest. Modern science has advanced their ancient art. Perhaps. But I am still stronger than you. Strong enough to do what I have set out to and do. what is that? I will not tell you, Shadow. And no one, not even you with your borrowed powers, shall stand in my way. For I, I am the prophet. Prophet of the ancient one. Master, master, the stranger, he does not return to the automobile. But a young woman is there waiting for him. So, could it be, Shadow, that you are the stranger we seek, that your companion waits for you? Laka. Yes, Master. Go quickly, I will follow. Seek the girl. She will be useful to us. Very useful. If I cannot reach the Shadow, I can reach his companion. Yes, Master. Matau and the Panthers watch her. She will not escape. Do you hear, Shadow? Yes, I hear. Save her if you can. You say you are a man. If that is true, then my panthers will smell you out whether they can see you or not. There's the car. Aka, seize the girl. Matawa, the girl. Matanalo. Matanalo. Come here, Take her to the house on the cliff. 
We will keep her with Isabel Colby. She shall be tortured until she tells us what she knows. At the beginning of this program, I made you a suggestion. To protect your family's health and save real money in the bargain, burn blue coal. Now, here's the reason for blue coal's superiority. This fine home fuel is selected Pennsylvania anthracite, an American product mined by the Glen Alden Coal Company. And anthracite supplies clean, uniform, healthful heat from cellar to attic, burned steadily, completely, down to a fine, powdery ash. So you see, anthracite combines all of the essentials necessary for perfect heating results. What's more, anthracite is the fuel that furnaces parlor stoves and cooking ranges in this part of the country were especially designed to burn. And the cream of all anthracite is blue coal. No wonder it is the largest selling brand of solid fuel in America. No wonder blue coal sales in Auburn, New York this winter show a 15% increase over sales for the same period a year ago. Blue coal is especially prepared for home use. Every carload is laboratory tested for purity and uniform size before shipment from the mine. And every piece of blue coal is trademarked with an unmistakable blue tint so that you can identify it at a glance. So when you're buying Auburn, New York homeowner, ask for blue coal by name. You can get it in four popular home sizes, egg, stove, chest, oven, pea. Order a trial ton from your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You'll find him listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. servants bring you here to Mrs. Ashley's house? I don't know. But who are you and why are they keeping you locked up in this room? Oh, I'm Isabel Colby. My father was Reverend Colby, the minister of the little fishing village down the cove. He's dead. He's murdered him. Yes, I know. But you, why are you here? I used to be Mrs. Ashley's companion and secretary before she brought this man, the prophet, to the house. But now, that Hindu has some sort of hold over her, over her mind. He calls her a high priestess. And she let him lock me up in here. Oh, how terrible, Miss Colby. What is happening in this house to Mrs. Ackley and to you? Oh, I don't know. It has something to do with a, a ceremony that the prophet says he and Mrs. Ackley must perform. The climax of some strange religious ritual. They go through day after day in Mrs. Ackley's private chapel. He's changed it into a place he calls the Temple of the Ancient One. This morning, he came here and said, I'm to be what he calls the Bride of Death. They're going to take me to that temple tonight. Do you know why? Yes. To kill me. Oh, no. Mrs. Ackley is the high priestess who's going to sacrifice me to that horrible deity they worship. Oh, don't give up hope, Isabel. Oh. There's still a chance we'll get out of this place, both of us. Oh, Lamont, Lamont, why don't you come before it's too late? Maybe this is... I come. I knocked it off. Oh, don't let him take me. Don't. Isabel Colby, the time has come. The high priestess is waiting to perform her ceremony in the temple of the ancient. No, no. Masala. Yes, master. Take the girl Isabel to the shrine. Tell the high priestess to prepare the girl and herself for the wedding of death. Come. My master commands. No, no. I won't go. Get your hand off me, Colby. Jesus, wait, girl. Let go of me. Yes, master. I kill her now. No. Masala. Take the girl Isabel to the shrine. Wait there for me. Prepare the sacred fires. Purify the sword of the ancient one. The sacrificial altar is ready. And death is waiting for his bride. Yes, my father. No! No, you're going to murder me like you murdered my father! Now, strange girl, I will deal with you. <laughs> No, Prophet. You will deal with me. The shadow. Oh, thank heaven you've come. You, the shadow here? How? There are panthers chained at every door. It was easy, Prophet. Oh, I knew the shadow would come. I knew he couldn't be far away. Oh, you do know the shadow. This slinking coward who fears to show himself. Who hides himself in the shadows. Shadow. 
The prophet is going to kill Reverend Colby's daughter. He's going to make Mrs. Ackley kill her in some fantastic ceremony. Yes. In a few minutes, she will be dead and you cannot stop it. Clever scheme. You've numbed the failing mind of Mrs. Ackley with drugs. Made her do your will, sign a fortune over to you. Your knowledge will not help you now, Shadow. You plan to have Mrs. Ackley commit murder, turn her over to the police, blame her for the death of Reverend Colby, and with a fortune in your hands, discard your role of prophet and disappear. You are clever, Shadow. Yes, that is my plan. It is a pity such a mind as yours will soon be lost to the world. Within an hour... After Mrs. Ackley has obligingly murdered the girl, Isabel, this house will burn. A tank of gasoline in the cellar will explode. And this will be the funeral pyre of the shadow and his beautiful young companion. But I must go now. They are waiting for me. <laughs> you are not going through that door. It is locked. You lie. It is. Acker! They cannot hear you. They're waiting for you in the temple, and I have the key to the door. You are not too clever, Shadow. Give me the key to the door, and I shoot this girl. Take that gun away from her head. Throw the key upon that table, quick. Don't give him the key. I'm not afraid of him. I shall count to three, Shadow. If I don't get the key, it's a pity. But this beautiful girl shall die. One. You wouldn't. Two. Three. Ah. You are wise. Shadow. You fiendish devil. I'll show you the shadow can do more than warn, threaten. Take that! Oh, oh Lamont. Oh, Lamont, are you all right? Yes, but I'm afraid I knocked the prophet out cold. Margot, take that key. Get out of here. Down the hall. There's a door. Take the prophet's gun. Drive to that cottage I visited tonight. Get Captain Zeth to call the villagers. Tell them they can help to avenge the murder of their friends. What are you going to do? They may kill Isabel before I can get help. Never mind. You hurry and get help. All right. I'll go out. I'll get Captain Zest to round up the people of the village, and then I'll come back. Very well, Margot. I may need your help. Come back to this room. I'll be back in a few minutes. Lamont. Lamont. Yes, Margot? I saw Captain Zest. The people of the village are coming. He's calling them together. You can't wait for him, Margot. Beyond that door, at the head of the stairs, death is waiting for Isabel Colby. The prophet's followers are there awaiting his appearance. But the prophet's still lying here, unconscious on the floor. Nevertheless, he will not disappoint them. But, Mother, I, I don't understand. Margot, I'm going to ask you to do a very dangerous thing. I want you to put on the prophet's robe, cover your face with a hood, and walk in there as the prophet. Oh, very well, I'll do anything I can. You know that. Do not show your face till you reach the altar. Don't speak. Keep close to Isabel Colby. Watch Mrs. Ackley and leave the rest of me. Yes, Lamont, I, I understand. I'm ready. Metanalo, <laughs> O ancient one, vision of eternal life. Before of thy altar, the youthful maiden waits. Thy ancient sword, her spirit, to release unto thine own. Her blood is pledged. Her soul is thine. Metanalo etilasi, kalavara sadamor. All is in readiness, master. Metawa, look. The hood covers the master's face. The hour has come for the ritual to begin. See, Master. The girl Isabel is lashed to the altar of the Ancient One. The sacred fires burn in the jeweled torches. All is in readiness, Master. All as you have commanded. The tower, bring Mrs. Ackley. Prepare her to make the sacrifice. I, I am ready, ready to do the will of the prophet to plunge this sword into the girl's heart. But I am afraid. Give me the take, 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 drug to give me strength. The will to do the things you have told me I must do. If I am to be high, I be Look, look, Matawa, it is strange. The master does not speak, does not answer us. 
He goes to the shrine alone. Wait. He turns. He is lifting the hood of his robes. Akka, look. It is not the prophet. It is a beautiful girl. It is the strange girl. The one the master stayed below to... What has happened to our master? Why do you wear the robes of the prophet? Akka. Makawa. You have been tricked. The man you serve as a god is a rogue. A charlatan. A fake. The voice, Matawa. That is not the voice of the prophet. It is not the strange girl speaking. See, her lips have not moved. No. It is the voice of the shadow. The shadow. The master warned us to beware of the shadow, Akka. Matawa. The master must be dead. The shadow has killed him. Drop it. The time has come. I must drive this sword into the heart of the bride of death. I will not fail. Don't. Don't do it. They're tricking you, making you murder me. Then they'll kill you. No. They'll kill you. No, I shall be a high priestess. I shall live forever like the prophet, like the ancient one. Mrs. Ackley. Mrs. Ackley. Drop that sword. Drop that sword, Mrs. Ackley. Drop it, I say. Drop the sword. Yes. Drop the sword. Oh, I can't. I can't look. This shadow has broken the master's power over this woman. I am free now. Free of the spell. Oh, what have I done? He is stronger than the master. We must escape. We must get away. You will never get away. Never leave this house. Parker! Matawa! The prophet! The girl wearing my robes! Throw your knife! Kill her! Kill her, I command you! No! No, prophet! We obey you no more! Obey me! You'll take us! Make us kill! For you are the true prophet of the ancient one! You defy me! Stop! Drop the knife! See? The blood runs in his veins! He tells us he cannot die! Uh, now we shall see. The first. Now. Now the shadow will destroy you. She is dead. The shadow spoke the truth, Matawa. He was not the true prophet. The true prophet of the ancient one was blessed with life. Everlasting. You are right, Arka. Quick. We must get away. Away from this shadow. You cannot escape for long. Your sins will find you out. Oh, yes. Isabel! Isabel! Oh, yes. Oh, God. Be your yes, thanks. Oh, thank you. Your but won't you tell me who you are? I'm sorry. But I'm afraid I must remain anonymous until my work is finished. I will have to continue being known... Only as the shadow. Now here is John Barclay, Blue Coal's heating expert, with a few words of heating advice for you. Thank you, Ken Roberts. Good evening, friends. During the month of March, when the weather is very changeable, a cold spell and a warm spell, some homeowners get the impression that they're economizing on fuel by putting only a little coal on the furnace fire during milder days. As a matter of fact, that is one of the surest ways to actually waste fuel. Shallow fires burn coal quickly, have a tendency to go out easily, can deliver sufficient heat, and make repeated refueling necessary. The truly economical way to fire a furnace is to keep a deep fire bed at all times. It should always be up to a level with the bottom of the fire door. In mild weather, if you like, you can leave a little heavier layer of ash on the grate. This will keep the fire burning very slowly, yet keep enough coal burning to provide sufficient heat should the outside temperature drop suddenly. Let me impress you with this important point. After putting uh, fresh coal on the fire, be sure to leave an exposed spot of live coals directly in front of your fire door. The hot spot will act as a pilot light and ignite the gases that come up from fresh coal. Allow these gases to become ignited before checking the fire. If you follow this method of firing throughout the changeable March weather, you will get the utmost in efficiency and economy from your furnace. However, if you still have difficulty in properly heating your home, 
Call your nearest blue coal dealer and ask him to send a John Barkley serviceman to inspect your furnace. This service is free to blue coal customers. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barkley. And friends, don't fail to take advantage of the free John Barkley service. Phone your nearest blue coal dealer tomorrow. You have just heard a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow magazine. All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. And a similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Same time, same station, Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite, will again present another thrilling adventure of the shadow. Be sure to listen, and be sure to burn Blue Coal, the solid fuel for solid comfort. One Man's Family, winner of 47 national awards, a Carlton E. Morse creation. One Man's Family, now in its 27th year, is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Chapter 32, Book 133 of the Barber Family Saga. Day, wedding day in the afternoon. For well over an hour, the well-informed Mrs. Emily Stewart, with mother-of-pearl opera glasses ready for instant action, has been sitting beside her front window surveying Seacliff Drive as she chatters with an unexpected luncheon guest, one Ross Farnsworth. This incident, along with other complicating factors, has provided Jack Barber with the dreary period of acute frustration, broken at last by the ringing of the telephone in his living room. Yes, hello. Jack, Nikki's here now. Oh, thanks, Pa. I'll be right over. He hastens out the back door, hurtles into his car, and with a last look at Emily's window, drives swiftly six blocks straight down to his sister Claudia's, where he meets with another frustration and finds, as he goes in the front door, that he will be unable to speak freely. Yes, yes, I told your mother, Claudia. Oh, no. Claude, where's Nikki? After all, since it's a February wedding, it is better to have it over here. My garden couldn't have produced such an abundance of flowers if I'd planned a year. Pardon me, Dad. Jack? Oh, there you are. Hi, where's Nicky? I'll get him. He's bringing in the wedding gift. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Oh, your hair is on end. Well, it's not too surprising. Oh, anything wrong? Oh, the usual wedding day hassle with a few new ones added. Ross Farnsworth still sitting there in the window with Emily Stewart waiting for four o'clock? Yep, still there. On the stroke of four, he'll go over and harass Joan on her wedding day. Well, Dad, the court gave him rights of visitation. Nothing you can do about that. I'll tell you why he's at Emily's. He's consumed with curiosity about Raymond Borden. Emily will be a fountain of information. <laughs> Insanely jealous, that's what he is. I imagine any divorced man is jealous of his successor. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Claudia said you called over an hour ago. Hi, Nicky. Yeah, a couple items I'd like to go over. And, Dad, huh? may I have your advice out here? Will you come with me? Yes, yes. Uh, very well. Excuse me, please. Uh, surely. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll give you some advice right now, Claudia. When there's something I'm not to know, there's no need to work out elaborate stratagems to get me out of the room. Let's simplify it. Whistle, I'll go. <laughs> Dad, don't be ridiculous. Now, what do you think about blocking off this entrance? Let me close the door. I don't want to get people alarmed, but Ross Farnsworth has a gun with him. How do you know? Sharon. She was looking over the push buttons in Ross's car. There's a blue automatic in the glove compartment. Wouldn't that be carrying concealed weapons? Yeah. Well, then, the, the police... Oh, now, wait. Police, reporters, morning papers, and headlines. Oh. Ex-husband arrested with gun at scene of Seacliff wedding. You'd have a field day with that one. All right. Well, what do we do? Uh, steal it? Well, I'd have got it before now, but Ross and Emily are sitting right in the... Boy, with his hard car. Oh, hi, Uncle Nicky. Uncle Jack. Oh, Pinky, hello there. Came over to see if there's anything I can do. Where's Aunt Claudia? Wait a minute. Sir? Still looks young and nimble enough for a bit of thievery, wouldn't you say, Nicky? Hmm. Thievery. Oh, Pinky, I heard someone come in. 
Hello there. You're up early. You'll have to excuse him, Claude. I came over to see if there's something I can do, and I guess there is. Yeah, he's going into conference with me on the back porch. Oh, oh Dad, I didn't see you. Yeah, yes. Traffic is building up. Oh, oh, well, Pinky, you're up early. Hi, Grandfather. Well, what do you want, Uncle Jack? Let's find a sanctuary somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Dad, tell Nicky what you just told me. That wonderful phrase, paranoidal overtones, you know? Well, it sounds alarming. Oh, yes, yes, Nicholas. I quoted a phrase of Paul's which came back, popping back into my mind. At the time Ross first deserted Joan, Paul called him a borderline psychotic with paranoidal overtones. Isn't that descriptive? Takes care of everything. Well, it has a frighteningly clinical side. Well, as I say to Claudia, what other words could be used to describe a man who leers and boasts of his skill with pistols? I'd have him thrown in jail. Call it prime for it. And... Well, there's one difficulty, Father Barber. His traits are only by implication. The police can't arrest a man because his former in-laws consider him unstable and assume that he may go berserk. And as Jack points out, you, you call in officials and you also call in the press. And we've had more than enough of that. Uh, Nicky? Uh, yes, Jack, I'm right here. Ah, uh, Pinky will run that errand for us. Why not? I came over here looking for something to do. Uh, we'll see you later. Mm. You want a car? Oh, mine's out in front. Come on, Pink. See you. I'll go out with you. I'll, uh, I'll get the door. Yeah. Do you know what they're up to? No, I really don't, Dad. Curious? Are you? Certainly. So are you. They are trying not to worry us. Only makes it worse. Here is, I will match your $10 contribution to the community chest that I find out before you do. Do you think that's fair? You've had so much more practice. Bet, yes or no? Yes. Check hands. You're right. They have forced me into deductive reasoning. This has something to do with Russ Fonsworth and a gun. You mark my words. We'll return in just a moment to one man's family. There are many isms in the world of today. Some good, some bad. But there is one ism there can never be enough of. Humanitarianism. Here's a little episode illustrating how a United States Air Force sergeant and his wife combined a bit of humanitarianism with Americanism. And how, even though handicapped by a language barrier... Their efforts worked out very well. It all happened on a dingy street in Fukuoka, Japan. A Japanese couple suddenly dashed out into the street, the woman clutching a baby in her arms. The couple signaled frantically, but the traffic flowed by, ignoring their efforts for help. Finally, one car came to a stop. The occupants were Tech Sergeant Oliver A. Morris and his wife, out to enjoy a late afternoon and evening off duty. What moved Sergeant Morris to stop? Later he found that hard to explain, unless perhaps it just seemed the human thing to do, for neither he nor his wife knew any Japanese. Yet those pathetic figures in the street somehow conveyed great distress and urgency. Sergeant Morris sensed there was something to be done and in a hurry. Much later he learned the baby had been seized with convulsions. The parents had rushed to a small hospital nearby, and its only doctor was out. They knew of another physician a mile and a half away, and were trying to flag down a taxi when Sergeant Morris came along. The airman bundled them into his car and sped off in their search for a doctor, whom they finally succeeded in locating. When the spasms of the baby were finally checked, the woman looked up with brimming eyes and said, as an interpreter translated, My husband and I, we have been afraid of Americans before. Now we are glad to know such fine people. It cost the Morrises much of the carefree evening they had previously planned, but their unselfish actions towards that Japanese family brought a feeling of goodwillism that will never be forgotten. Sergeant Morris and his wife also gave all of us a thought to remember. We are Americans. As we go, so goes America. It's 40 minutes later. Ross Farnsworth's car is still parked at the curb outside Emily Stewart's. The front curtains, which had been drawn aside, are now back in place, but figures can be seen in the background. Jack and his brother-in-law, Nicholas Lacey, waiting in the front hall at the family home, are becoming impatient. Nicky glances at the grandfather clock. Where is the lad? I still can't see him. It's my guess he got into the car from this side while we were coming up the back steps. He's afraid to move. Uh, what would think his instructions? Hmm? Get the gun, that's all. Uh, I'll take full responsibility if anything goes wrong. Well, there'll be enough trouble to go around. We'll all be sharing it. Honey! Oh, Dad, she's not around. Let's go in the library. Here in the library, Nikki's with me. Come on in. 
I uh, once asked Claudia if she couldn't answer, why do you still keep things from the old gentleman, the force of habit? <laughs> well, he somehow adds to the general confusion. We'd be slowed down by a debate on ethics. Yes, I know. He's uh, thorough, but he's sound. Well, occasionally you don't have time to be thorough. What is Picky up to? Uh, where did you see him? He moved so fast I couldn't be sure. I thought I saw him leaping across the street from Emily Stewart's. Going where? Into your house, I thought. Does he know you're in here? I guess not. Look out the window, Nicky. Is he over there? Mm, no. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Here he comes, through the head. Here. Now, I'll go let him in. Uh, the door isn't locked, Jack. Jack? Sir? What is going on? Why don't you tell me? I'd like to help. Well, Dad, uh, you tell him, Nicky. Oh, Pinky. You're in the library. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Wow. How long was I over there? Uh, we were told Ross is carrying a weapon in his car. Yeah, no surprise to me. Well, they were both sitting in the front... Well, right right there in the front window. So I waited to duck across. Then, when I got in the car, I didn't dare move. I had to scrunch way down and, and wait. Brother, every time I peeked out, they were watching the street. Where's the gun? It wasn't there, Uncle Jack. Oh, I say. No, sir. Gloves and a box of bullets, but no gun. After Sharon saw it there, he probably remembered and went out and got it. So he must have it with him. And at four o'clock, he will call at Jones' house with a gun in his pocket. <laughs> Reporters be hanged. Jack, Nicholas, get on the phone. Let's call the police. Barbers in just a moment. This is Jim Amici. Are you from Alabama? In the year 1540, Hernando de Soto and his band of treasure seekers were the first white men to look upon the part of the New World which is now the state of Alabama. In the more than 400 years since de Soto and his men made their exploration, Alabama has grown to a state with a population of more than 3 million people. It's become the leading heavy industry state in the southern part of the United States. Birmingham, its principal manufacturing center, is called the Pittsburgh of the South. Alabama is a leading producer of lumber, marble, petroleum, and dolomite. Its farmlands produce cotton, corn, hay, and sweet potatoes. Alabama, the 22nd state to join the Union, has contributed much to the heritage of America. In the years ahead, Alabama will add much to America's future. In the library, Jack tosses a glance at Nicky as if to ask if he's satisfied. Minutes have slipped away and the situation has entered the predicted state of confusion. I say commit Ross for observation. At least you'd have him locked up during the wedding. And if he isn't psychotic, he can sue you for the gold fillings in your teeth. May I come in? Sure. Big debate. Everybody will. I want Ross locked up before he takes it into his head to harm the children. You're a little late, Dad. He's driving into Jones' driveway right this minute. Well, excuse me. I'll go with you. Hey, wait. I'm coming, too. Shut the door, Pinky. Huh? Well, what's all that? Why oh, don't you know? Certainly I do. Certainly I know. I'll collect later. You owe ten dollars to charity. Jack, Nicholas, I'll talk to Ross while you call the police. Yes, yes, wait, let me handle this. One Man's Family, which comes to you Monday through Friday, is written by Harlan Ware and directed by Carlton E. Morse. This program has been selected to be heard by our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. In Chapter 33, Book 133, Wedding Day at 4 p.m., Frank Barton speaking. One Man's Family, winner of 47 national awards, now in its 27th year, is a Carlton E. Morse production and comes to you from California. One Man's Family has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. <laughs> Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It had been some time since we'd had any real trouble. Anything more than throwing a few juiced-up cowboys in jail to sober up for a few hours. And I liked it peaceful for a change. And I hoped that it stayed that way. Well, that morning I'd gone to take a few catfish out of the Arkansas. When I got back to the office, I found a note from Chester. Saying he's at the Alifraganza having a beer. Hello, John. Over here, Mr. Dillon. Any luck, sir? Oh, about a dozen, Chester. We'll have them for supper. No, oh, that'll be fine. Oh, I, I, I've been telling Mr. Carter here about you, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Carter? Robert P. Carter. How do you do, Marshal? Hello, how are you? Buy your drink? Well, thank you. Yes, I, I believe I will. Uh, I think I'll have a beer. Bartender? A beer. Yes, Mr. Sir. Carter came in on the stage from Denver last Saturday. Oh, you live in Denver, Mr. Carter? Oh, heavens no. New York, Marshal. I've only been west a few months, investing money in gold mines and cattle and the like. Mr. Carter's very rich. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Chester, I will be if Mother Nature holds out. His girl is coming in on the stage today, Mr. Dillon. Oh, is that so? My fiancé, Marshal. He met her in Denver, but she couldn't get ready in time to come here when he did. Ah, I see. I had to come ahead on business. Couldn't wait. We'll take the Santa Fe to St. Louis from here. They're going to be married in St. Louis, Mr. Dillon. Wow. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but is the stage always this late? He's worried, Mr. Dillon, with his girl on the stage and all. <laughs> It'll be along, Mr. Carter. You talking about the stage? Oh, hello, Shiloh. Shiloh says he's been sitting there by himself all morning, Mr. Dillon. Since last night, Chester. You know something about the stage, Shiloh? Only that it's carrying 50000 in gold out of Leadville. So? Well, maybe that's why it's late. What do you mean, man? Well, if somebody wanted that gold, they'd have to stop the stage long enough to get it unloaded, wouldn't they? Bandits. He means bandits. Now, now hold it, Mr. Carter. You're already bleeding that nobody's shot you yet. Uh, what? But nothing, nothing, nothing. Just take it easy. The stage will get here, all right. It's off on a little uh, late. But this know. man says it might have been held up. Why, there may have been a shooting. Well, now, now, he's just daydreaming. That's all. Wait, wait a minute. Listen. Huh? Well, there it is now. Oh. <laughs> See, Mr. Carter, there was nothing to worry about. It got here all right. Yes. What is it, Jim? Uh, got held up, Marshal. Lost 50,000 gold. Where'd this happen? About 20 miles back near Cottonwood Draw. But Any the shot? Now they shot fire. They tricked it. But James! Marshall, uh, where's James? Driver! Where's the girl who was on this stage? What's happened to her? That's what it started. There's a tree across the road. We got down to move it. This rider got to drop on us. He's all alone. Never mind all that. Where's the girl? He took the gold. Took the girl, too. What? He took Jane? You mean to tell me you let him take Jane? There weren't much choice. He held a shotgun on us. And they're gone before we could do things. Oh, but this, this is impossible. Now, take it easy, Mr. Carter. We'll find it. You'll find it. We're off fishing when it happened. What kind of law is there around here anyway? Easy, Mr. Carter. I took one of the but I couldn't get near him. He had an extra saddle horse with him. Put her on that. I see. But I don't think he planned on kidnapping that girl. Where it was, he just looked at her and told her to come along. Did you recognize him, Jim? No. No, his horse. By heaven, Marshal, you'd better get her back here at once, or I'll take this up with Washington. I'll see you disgrace. Shut up, Carter. Chester, go get our horses and a couple of rifles. I'll get a few more details from Jim here. Well, don't you want a posse, Mr. No, there'd be too much shooting around that girl. Now, hurry. 
after I'll hurry, Mr. Dillon. Mark my words. You'd better have Jane back here by now, Paul Marshall. You care to ride along, Mr. Carter? No. No, I, I'm, I'm not equipped for that sort of thing. I, I'll take care of matters at this end. Yeah. All right, now, Jim, now tell me first exactly what happened. Well, we just come down into the draw about 100 yards from the creek. The blood-red sun was drooping over the edge of the prairie when Chester and I reached Cottonwood Draw. We rode hard, and we had to stop and wait for daylight. But with morning, we took a pain that washed out every track. We rode on anyway. For the next three days, we scouted a big piece of that country. But it was hopeless. Finally, we headed back to empty-handed. Bartender, bring me a bottle, will you? Sure, Matt. Where is she, Matt? Is she all right? Carter, I, I'm sorry. What? You mean you didn't find them? Rain washed out their trail first morning. We, we never picked it up again. Couldn't be anywhere. You came back without her. We did what we could, Carter. Now we'll just have to wait for word of some kind. You'll be seen sooner or later. Wait. Well, I won't wait. This will cost you your job, Marshal. Look, Carter, if it'd make you feel better, why don't you ride out yourself? It isn't my job to kill all around here, Marshal. It's yours. Yeah. <laughs> Say, Marshal. <clears throat> yeah, what is it, Shiloh? See you when you got back. Asked me to tell you. Big Kate? Oh, all right. Thank you. How'd you know, Kate? Looking at you. It's thousands and thousands of miles of prairie. It'd been just luck if we'd found them. Nobody's blaming you, Matt. No. Hey, Carter is, is... And I suppose it's hard on him. His fiance and all that. Carter's no good, Matt. Well, I never liked him, but I suppose that doesn't matter. And I'll tell you why he's no good. You know something, Kate? Hmm. Carter's been drunk a lot while you were out. He was bragging to one of the girls last night. Bragging? What? About what? Not much, to my way of thinking. Well, go on. Well, to make it short, seems Jane's father got into a big deal with Carter up in Denver. Yeah? Carter got him tied up good and then threatened to ruin him. Oh, well, so what happened? He didn't ruin him. He took Jane instead. Yeah. Well, maybe she likes him. <laughs> you don't know much about women, do you, Matt? You think a boughten bride is likely to be in love with the man? So that's what I have to bring her back to. Well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> what can I do, Kate? You just have to wait and see what turns up. <laughs> I waited. I waited a week. Carter was drunk the whole time, telling everybody how he was going to fix me good. I'm not doing much about it, except stay out of my way. And things were fairly quiet. Chester and I spent most of our time in the office. Well, he sure fooled me, Mr. Dillon. Oh, Carter? Yes, sir. He seemed like such a nice fellow. And so rich. He's rich, all right. But poor in spirit. <laughs> You've been going to church again, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon, last Sunday. Oh, last Sunday. Uh, didn't it uh, rain last Sunday? Oh, I like church, Mr. Dillon. But I sure do hate to get all dressed up. <laughs> you the marshal? Yeah, I am. Here you've been looking for a man and a woman. You know anything, mister? 
My name's Chad Brown. Just rode in from Satana. Yeah? There was a man and a woman about 80 miles back on the trail. What color horses were they on? Well, as soon as they saw me, they rode off, so I didn't get very close. But both horses were the same color. I guess maybe so. You willing to ride back with me, Mr. Brown? I don't know, Marshal. I've got an awful thirst. That woman's out there against her will. I'll go. Uh, no, 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 Chester. Uh, be better if you wait here this time. We'll be back in a few days. With luck. Let's go, Mr. Brown. We will return for the second act of in just a moment. But first, Frank Fontaine now brings to comedy four members of Frank Fontaine family, guest stars, and a delightful cast of entertainers. Sunday nights on CBS Radio. Listen in for the Frank Fontaine show tonight. It's refreshing summer listening. So, just for fun, try the Frank Fontaine show tomorrow night on CBS Radio. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Brown and I covered the eighth day and a half. The outlaw's trail headed south for a few miles and then turned northeast back in the general direction of Dodge. It was hot and still. On the horizon, flashes of heat lightning. And then in the distance, we saw the long, low cloud of yellow dust that spelled cattle. The Texas herd trailing north. The kidnapper tracks led an hour later. We pulled up not far from the swing of the herd. A line along home stretched for several miles across our trail. We watched him looking for a lag to ride through. All of a sudden, a rider came hallooing down. Oh! You ain't aiming to cross that herd, are you? Have you seen anything of a man and a woman? Was they mounted? Yeah, a couple of sorrels. It don't matter. I ain't seen nothing but cattle and cowboy for six weeks. Besides, these cattle are plenty uneasy. It was dry since yesterday morning. And that heat lightning ain't soothing to them. This herd's an outlaw and a kidnapped woman, mister. That's so. Well, you just have to wait. You can ride around a drog back there. But you can't cut through this herd, mister. Look, I'm a U.S. Marshal out of Dodge, and I haven't got any time to waste. You think we well, can... I'm sure a priest, Marshal, but I can't help you. I'm trail boss of this outfit, and I got 3,000 head of cattle here worth maybe $20 a head of Dodge. They're too nervy now, and I sure can't since you're touching them off by riding through there. I guess he's right, Marshal. Lucky from the look of them. They're moving too fast now. Yeah, I know. Just that I hate to lose the time. Well, you got more time than I got cattle, Marshal. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But I won't have to stampede, Mr. Will. Right around the track. We'll see you in Dodge. The Alifraganza still running? Yeah, it is. Mostly Texas money. Adios. <laughs> We picked up the trail again, followed it till dark. Next morning, we found the outlaw still headed straight for Dodge, and the figure was that he must be new to the country and just plain lost. Naturally, he'd want to avoid asking questions of anybody. But soon, we were in sight of town, and during the last hour, neither Brown nor I. Finally, we rode up front street and got down at the table. We got him, Mr. Dillon. They rode right in here early this morning. Gave himself up, huh? Yes, sir. 
I got them back, and the money is over at the bank. Oh, good. How's the girl, Chester? Oh, she's fine. A little tired, but fine. <laughs> well, what's his story? Who is he? He calls himself Scott Cooley, but he won't say anything more at all. Mr. Dill gave up on him. I thought I'd better wait for you. Uh, all right. I'll talk to him first, and then I want to see the girl. Where is she? I didn't like it, Miss Dillon, but I didn't see what I could rightly do about it. What do you mean? What happened? Well, she sure didn't want to go with him, but that came here, and just the same as dragged her off. She went finally, but I sure don't like it. Well, they didn't leave Dodge, did they? Oh, no. There's no train till tomorrow. They're at the hotel. Oh, all right. I'll go over there later, Chip. Yeah, so you're Scott Cooley, huh? You're new around here, aren't you? No, anyways, I never saw you before, Marshal. Well, I've tried hard enough to meet up with you, Cooley. What do you know? Bad trouble. Marshal, if you've got anything to say, just say it right out. I got nothing to say. I'm just curious why you rode into Dodge, that's all. What do you care? I'm here. Money back and. Uh, and what? Oh, leave me alone, Marshal. Just leave me alone. You gotta talk sometime. Now listen, Marshal. I'm ready to serve my time. That's why I gave myself up. But talk? No. I don't have to talk. Not for you. Not for anybody else. Mm-hmm. All right, Cooley. That's your way. Marshal. Marshal, you... You going to see Jane? Yeah. Fine. Oh. What are you going to see? Find out what happened? Yeah. Marshal, I don't suppose you'd let me out of here just long enough to kill Carter. You mean the girl told you about it? I wouldn't care if I hanged for it. It'd be worth it for him. Hmm. Tell me something. What makes you think what you did's any better? What? Well, you wouldn't understand, Marshal. But you... Uh, you do what you can for her, will you? Anything else you want to tell me? No, that's all. <laughs> Matt Dillon. What do you want? Open the door, Carter. I want to talk to the girl. Some other time, Marshal. You want me to kick the door open? <coughs> You're asking for trouble, Carter. Uh, how do you do, miss? I'm Marshal Dillon. How do you do, Marshal? I, uh... You've been through a lot, miss. I get the whole story from you so that I can file the proper charges against this outlaw, Scott Cooley. Want to use me to put in prison. Is that it? Well, he's committed two crimes, robbery and kidnapping. We'll want him up for both. Well, does he himself up and, and return the money help at all? I, I'm afraid you don't gather your drift. Then let go of that, Marshal. We're leaving Dodge on the next train. So Jane won't be here to testify anyway. No? You have in mind, Jane? Oh, no. I mean, I don't know. Oh, please. She's upset enough. Marshal, leave her alone. If I want anything out of you, Carter, I'll knock it out. Now, shut up. You can't talk to me like that. Wait. Marshal, I'll tell you all about it, but first... Yeah? Well, not in front of him. Make him go out, and then I'll tell you. All right, Carter. Outside. You order me around. This is my... I'll throw you. If I open the door, find you around, I'll throw you all the way downstairs. Now get it! All right, now, Jane, you can talk. Can I trust you, Marshal? Really trust you? Well, that's up to you. But I'll tell you this. I know about Carter. About... 
You and Carter, that is. Thank you. You know how I hate him. Yeah? But right now, I'm curious about this kidnapping. What happened? Why did Cooley give himself up? Because we decided we... We couldn't live being hunted by lives. Oh. So you were in on it with him, huh? Oh, Marshal. First time I ever saw Scott Cooley was when he held up the stage. I'd like to believe that. I love Scott Cooley. What? Jane, girls like you just don't go around falling in love with outlaws. Don't, Marshal. No, don't. I did. Then either you're crazy or you're lying to me. And if you weren't a woman, I'd throw you in jail right along with you. I'm a woman, Marshal. And are going to jail with Scott. Oh, then you admit you're his accomplice. No. I suppose hard for you to understand, Marshal. It is. Well... I'll try to make it simple. You see, Scott does it with him when he held up the stage. He's never done anything like that before. It just seemed perfectly natural to him. He saw something he wanted and he took it. That's all. I'm afraid the court will look at it. Well, I, I suppose he'll go to prison for the holdup, but, but not for kidnapping. Why not? Because I'll testify that I went with him of my own free will. I almost wish you two hadn't ridden back to Duck. Marsh. Yeah. You said you know about Bob Carter and me. Yeah. Well, Scott's been wild and, and he's done wrong, but but he's never done anything really easy. Well, maybe you're better off with Cooley. If he straightens out. You no, know I am. Don't you, Marshal? It's no business of mine. I, I, I'm a peace officer, not a matchmaker. My job's to keep Cooley under arrest and get him up for trial. Now, that's all. Now, what you do is your own business. You can testify any way you like. I, I can't stop that. Oh, please. Marshal, help me. There's no one else who can. Yeah, who is it? It's Carter. From his door. Well, gentlemen, there are four of us here, Marshal. I figure you've talked to Jane long enough. Yeah, yeah, I think I have, Mr. Carter. You're leaving. Yeah. Are you ready, Jane? Oh, thank you, Marshal. Yes, I'm ready. Jane isn't going with you. I've just put her under arrest. Under arrest? I arrest anybody I think needs Mr. Carter, and I'm not in the head of explaining why. There's a lot about that, You're Marshall. in Dodge, Mr. Carter. Come along, Jane. You can't do this, Dylan. We won't stand for Ah, it. you're a fool, Carter. I know these three bums you got with you, and they don't want to draw on me any more than you do. You fed them some liquor and promised them more. For that, they'll do anything, anything but face me in a gunfight. Am I right, boys? Huh? I take it I am. All right, now get out of my way. Uh, you go first, Jane. You stay here, Jane. Take your hands off her. <laughs> Just step over him, Jane. I don't like to say anything. Well, then don't, Chester. But I can't help it, Mr. Dillon. This is the first time you've ever jailed a woman, and I just don't like it. <laughs> Good. What? I don't like it either, Chester. What's this all about, Mr. Dillon? Chester, Jane and Cooley are in love. My. <laughs> don't look so joy eyed Cool, got to stand trial. I want no part of this, Marshal. Now what, Shiloh? I never did like that, Carter. Well, what's he up to? Oh, uh, sir, he's drunk and he's buying liquor for everyone. He's making a lot of talk. There's about 20 men with him now. Where? Texas Trail. Nobody likes it about this girl. 
Looks like they'll come over here and try to bust her out of jail. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? The horses fought back. Yes, sir. I was going to put them away later. No, leave them. Leave them. Uh, now, will you get over to the Texas Trail and stall those men for a while? Huh? All right, Mr. Dillon. Come on, Shiloh. Not me. I'm going to bed. I got two guns left now. Cooley? Mm -hmm. Come on up. What is this? Just Martin? hurry it up, will you? Let's go, Jane. Oh, no, no. Stay where you are, Jane. I don't You'll like do what this. I tell you, Cooley. It's all right, Scott. We can trust him. Yeah, but I don't know what he's Scott. got. Scott. Well. All right, Jane, if you say so. All right, now, I'll back. Here, that way. Now, come on, let's move. All right, you take the gray horse, Jane. He's gentle enough. But hurry, will you? Sir, come here. Come on, boy. Where are we going, Marshal? Going to Hayes City. Cooley's going to stand trial there. Yeah. They got the money back, Scott. They can't do much to you. I know. But there's that, that kidnapping, too. I won't testify. That's all. Jane, you're going to have to testify. You'll be in contempt of court if you... Refuse. Then I'll lie. Anyway, I did go of my own free will. After a while, anyway. That's perjury. But you don't have to do that either. There's an easier way. How? Oh. Well, before I depart Cooley in the Hayes City Jail, we might just make a little stop. What do you mean, Marshal? Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were John Stevenson, Larry Dowden, and Patricia Walter, with Mary Lansing, Herb Ellis, John... Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were John Stevenson, Larry Dobkin, and Patricia Walter, with Mary Lansing, Herb Ellis, Jonathan Hole, Jim Nusser, and Frank Gerstle. Parley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order. supernatural. Any dictionary will give you several definitions. Supernatural, above and beyond the natural order of events, of or related to ghosts. Behavior caused by the intervention or by the action of a god on earthly affairs. Choose your own definition for this tale we are about to relate.
mystery drama, Here Goes the Bride, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Ruby Dee and Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. supernatural doesn't always have to presuppose something totally beyond this earth. There are those among us who hover somewhere between earth and sky. The stars who light up our theater marquees or movie screens. All the human beings who have become, by extension, a little larger than life. This is the shocking tale about two of those. Richard. Yes, Jenny. It's such a lovely day. Can't we put the top down? Well, I don't want to take a chance on being recognized. Nobody will recognize me. Just do as I say, please. I'm oh, sorry to make you do the driving, darling, but that's why I had Juan leave my sister Lisa's car in Monterey. The damn snoop should know by now not to pay any attention to us. Does your sister look like me, Richard? Enough from a distance. Same colored hair. But not really. He's attractive enough, I suppose. No, actually, she is very plain, and you. <laughs> yes. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever known. <laughs> and I thought you only married me for my money. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> but darling, I was only joking. Did you really mean what you said about me? Every word. But she was so beautiful. How could you... April was April. She isn't in my world or anyone else's anymore. She's dead. I'm sorry, darling. I shouldn't have brought her up. I... Oh, we're here already. So, I'm about to see Richard Morgan's folly at last. Don't let the wall spoil it for you. Ooh, but it's like a fortress, Bob. Wire, broken glass. And the gate looks as though you borrowed it from the best thing. Does it all have to be so high? The price of privacy. What little we could ever get. The fans considered April and myself public property. But we could forget that once we're inside. From there, looking out, you can't even see the walls. Open the gate. <laughs> I don't think I could even budget it if I knew how. <laughs> <laughs> Not manually. You see the little box on the visor? It's an electric gizmo. Just press the button on it. It's a magic castle. Enter your majesty and long live the queen. Pull over to the gatehouse. Stop a minute. Well, what are those, the hounds of the Baskerville? They are guardian angels. They patrol the grounds at night. Juan, amigo. Que pasa con los perros? They know you are back in casa, mi patron. They will not be tranquil till they see you for themselves. Bienvenida en casa, señor Morgan. Muchas gracias, viejo amigo. Darling, this is Juan. El señor Aguilar. Juan, permíteme presentarte con nueva señora. Mi esposa. Señor Morgan. Juan, well, put the top down for the señora. I'll get the dog quiet. Could you get some fresh air? Well, my husband didn't have any trouble quieting down the dogs. They're not really as savage as they sound. Are they one? They are trained to kill, senora. Anyone who does not belong here. Oh, goodness. I hope they get to know me soon, then. If they learn to know you belong, you have nothing to fear. You've been here a long time? Since the house was first built. Then you were here from the beginning with Richard's... With Richard's first wife, April. See, si. A terrible tragedy for all of you. You must have loved her. She was. La Senora de la Casa. I hope you won't blame me for trying to take her place. There is no one to take her place. Si, senorita. Here in the hall. Yes, senorita Morgan. You didn't take her portrait down. 
La Senora? April? That is her place. I don't think my brother is going to agree with you. He is bringing home a new bride, you know. I know. Didn't he suggest it might be a sensible idea to clear away all the portraits and memories of April from around the house? The portrait here in the hall is painted on plaster. It cannot be removed. Any more than her memory can be removed. So it stays. This is her place. No one can take it. A fresco. Funny, I never realized that. Because it's framed, I suppose. It was El Patron's idea for the wedding present. His way of saying, here is my love, which will never die. As it will never die for any of us. Except for my brother, Richard. <sighs> Maybe he thinks so. Maybe not. But once he returns again, I think he will know. There is only one, La Senora. <laughs> You're really going to see what Bon Repos is all about. I'm going to drive slow so you can drink it in. Look. Oh, it's breathtaking. That's Bon Repos. Not only the house, but the cliffs. And that wild leap off into the Pacific and all the way to the horizon. Oh, I love it. I hope you'll be able to. But I do already. Except... Except what? The rest of it is all so vast that suddenly the house seems small. Now, the closer we get, I realize how huge it is. Well, it's, it's rambling. Started from small beginnings and then just kept on growing. Looking at that main house, it wasn't all that small. Well, for its day it was. Big families then. All that's left of mine I see clustered on the porch. My sister. And the lady with her? Cat's our housekeeper. Conchita Aguila. She's Juan's wife. I have no one, but at least you have a sister. It makes me feel a lot less like an orphan. And the house is so lovely. I hope I've come home. I told you when we came back to America that would be your decision. Jenny, for many reasons it... Well, it's not going to be an easy one. But just give it a chance. I welcome it, Richard. If only it will welcome me. We flew straight from Japan to San Francisco Then drove down to Monterey to pick up the car Oh, it's so good to see you Your bride is lovely But you could have let us know about the wedding Lisa, I wanted to keep it private So we just sneaked off <laughs> uh, More coffee, Jenny? Mm -mm. Richard? No, I think I'll have some brandy how about you girls? Not for me. I pass. Oh, it's a magnificent night. There's going to be a full moon. Damn, dogs are all stirred up again. Jenny? Yes, Richard? Want to walk down with me and start making friends with them? Well, I'm a little tired tonight. I, I bet I'd make a better dog pal by daylight. Well, why don't you go ahead while I go up and get ready for bed? Well, you're the one they're calling for anyway. I've missed them. And it's... Nice to be missed. Would you mind? I, I won't be over a half hour. I'll be waiting for you when you get back. I'll close the French windows. Don't forget to lock them, Lisa. No, no, leave them open. The breeze is wonderful. I'll see they get closed, Richie. I've been taking care of that for the last year. Take care of my bride, too, Lisa. Good night to you, Lisa. I'll see you later, Jenny. Well, a very sexy goodbye. <laughs> Your brother is a very sexy man. Why hadn't you noticed? Well, why should I be the only woman in the Northern Hemisphere to have it escape me? Oh, Lisa. It's what makes my blood run cold sometimes. That and April. She can scarcely run you much competition anymore. Because she's dead? She is? Well, not really. In so many ways, I'm, I'm terribly naive growing up in Japan, knowing so little of my native country. I was always aware that Richard Morgan was a star. After all, he was in Japan to make a movie. And I knew he'd been married for many years to April Sanders. It, it was only after I'd married Richard and come back to America that I began to realize I'd married into royalty. Not only that, but I'd rushed blindly into marrying the king without seeing that the queen is not dead. Oh, Jenny, don't be silly. The queen is very dead. Not in most people's memories. 
How did it happen, Lisa? How could that vibrant, overwhelmingly wonderful woman have met her death? Want to take a little walk, Jenny? I could use some air. Which way do we go? Oh, towards the sea. There's enough moonlight to light the way. Are you cold? Lord, no. I welcome the breeze. Well, where are you taking me? To the end of the world. What? Well, where April ended hers. You wanted to know how it happened, didn't you? I think I've gone far enough, Lisa. Only a few steps. What? What is this path? I mean, somebody cut it out of solid rock. It's called the Seven Steps to Heaven. More like 70. Richard had them cut for April on their seventh anniversary. You'll see why now if we come out on the ledge. It's windier tonight than I thought. Those days it's calm up here. The sun pours down. You can lie out here on the ledge with the sea 400 feet below and drench in the sun as though you were the only person in the world. April treated this as a shrine. She was an inveterate sun worshiper. But it's sheer heaven bathed in moonlight. If you look up. Well, I, I can't see too much of the shadows looking down. The rocks are as jagged as teeth. 400 feet straight down. This is right where she fell. Spread eagled on the rocks, broken and mangled, but speared by the sharp edges so even the restless sea couldn't wash her away. Oh, my God. How, how could she have gone close enough to fall? She didn't fall. But the paper that the story that was given out, Conchita believes that Richie claims he does. Others are not so sure. Come on, this place gives me the heebie-jeebies. Let's get back to the house before Richie sets those damn dogs loose. Oh, excuse me, I was just turning down the bed. Which I'm sure you're quite ready to roll into, Jenny. Good night, dear. Welcome home, such as it is. Good night, Lisa. See you whenever. Don't feel there's anything to get up for. Will there be anything else, madame? No, thanks, Conchita. Then I will say buenas noches, madame. Uh, wait a minute. Si, sí, madame. Madame is not a Spanish word. Why do you call me that? What would you have me call you? Uh, well, since I, I am Richard's wife, shouldn't it be senora? In this house, there was only one senora. But she's dead. Jamás en el corazón. Never in the heart for anyone who knew her. Buenas noches, madame. <gasps> Richard? Uh, Richard, are you awake? Huh? It's her. It's, it's April. of the French is sweet dreams. But there will be few sweet dreams for Jenny, at least this night. As for others, we'll find out when we return shortly with Act Two.
by the fresh light of a clear morning, with the wind stilled and the sunlight flooding all the dark corners, Bon Repos is a little more worthy of its name. But Richard Morgan is having a difficult time selling that to his still shaken bride. Let a little light in. You'll feel better, Jenny. Um, no, no, Richard. I, I'm still not over last night. Who was it? Darling, it wasn't anybody. You still say you didn't hear it, that awful sobbing. It was it was nothing but the wind. Sometimes it sighs and moans all around the house, and you'd, you'd swear it was a human voice. But, but look. Not a whisper this morning. Even the ocean's like glass. Today you'll understand why I love this house so much. Richard, come here. Beside me on the bed. All right, darling. I know you love Bon Rapport, but... But what? Richard, please. I... I don't want to live here. Why not? Darling, try to understand. I, 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 I don't feel I belong here. I know one and Conchita seem to resent me. Have they said anything? No, no, not in so many words. It's just a feeling I get. I, I'm not wanted. That isn't true. Richard, don't you see? It's her house. It was her family's house to begin with. She's here still. She'll never leave it. She'll haunt me every minute I'm in it. Please take me away from here. All right. If that's what you want, I'll sell the damn place. Tear it apart stone by stone. Richard. Oh. Oh, Jenny, my darling. Look, it's... It's just a time lag. The long flight from Japan. Days and nights turned upside down. I'm going to have Conchita bring us a breakfast up to the room. We'll, we'll have it out on the veranda. Give you a chance to get a good look at Juan's landscaping. All that riot of color, bougainvillea, poinsettia, camellia against the green. Maybe that'll change your mind about poor old Borapo. Darling, I know how much you love it, but... Oh, come on, Jenny. Give it a chance. A few more days, a week. Give it a chance to cast its own peculiar spell. All right, darling. Go get us some breakfast. I'll wash up and, and brush my teeth and get rid of some cobwebs while you're gone. Jenny. Yes? I love you, Mrs. Morgan. Mm -hmm. That's who I am, and I love you, my husband. Conchita. Si, patron. Come over here in the alcove. What the hell happened last night? I couldn't help it. She woke up, started to scream, and then to sob. You heard? No, House must have heard. Why didn't you stop her? I did as soon as I could. You know I don't want my wife to know about her being here. I know. Then keep her quiet. Got sedatives. That's your job. And I want my new wife made welcome. That is not my job. Then I'll find someone else for it. You would drive Juan and me from this house? We'll, uh... We'll talk about this later. For now, bring breakfast to the veranda for the senor and me. Si, senor. Where's my sister? In her room, I think. Muy bien. Open. Richard, I didn't expect to see you this morning. Why not? <laughs> well, after all, brother mine, a new bridegroom? I'm an old bridegroom by now. Yes, maybe she is a touch young for you. Damn you, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean what I said either. I was only teasing you. She's a lovely girl. She's sunny and free and unspoiled. And I want to keep her that way. What the devil am I going to do about her? There. You heard her last night. Well, you know my feelings on the subject. Get rid of her. For good. I can't. After all, it's, it's partly her house. God, why won't she die? It would be a neat solution to it all, wouldn't it? But it seems she just won't. I'm afraid you're stuck with her as long as your conscience holds you back. Please, for God's sake, don't tell Jenny about her. Just how long do you think you can keep her secret? Oh. I don't know. All I need is a, a few days, a week. By then, one way or another, it won't matter. Oh. 
Are you going to start country hopping again, or are you going to stay home and make some nice, solid American movies? <laughs> well, that depends on my negotiations for the next week or ten days. Jenny, you're not eating your steak. Want it on the fire a little more? No, thanks. I, I, I really ate too much of that wonderful salad. I, I don't think I could eat another thing. Conchita? Si, senor. I think you can clear the table. You want dessert, dear? I don't think so. Lisa, please forgive me, but I'm so full of sand, sea, air, and scouting the property that I'm really bushed. Would you excuse me? Of course, Jenny. Get a good sleep. I'll see you upstairs, darling. Shall I have Conchita bring us some coffee? Oh, no, no. I just want to sleep and sleep and make up for the last few days. You don't have to come up. Try and keep me away. Good night, Lisa. Good night. I'll see you tomorrow. I, I feel like such a party pooper. Please, oh, forgive us. I'm bushed myself. Charlie, you're, you're positively weaving. But I feel I, I feel a little high or low or something. I, well, here, how about my arm for support? I'd love it. No good? No, fine. I, I was just... She was so lovely, Richard. Huh? Oh, oh. April, the, the fresco. That damn thing, I wish I'd never dreamed it up. I promise you it'll be removed or covered or something. Oh, no, darling, it's too, it's too lovely to destroy. Besides, no matter what you do or, or anyone tries to do, the memory of April Sanders in our time can never be wiped out or erased. It's, it's something we both have to live with. Well, she was like Jean Harlow, Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor... She belonged to the public. But you had her painted to endure forever. But are you sure the dog was poisoned? That's enough, you two silencio. Uh, what was all that arguing about? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Trouble with one of the dogs. Come on, Jenny. Let's have some morning coffee and juice and get back to normal. Please. Well, what's the matter with the dog? Here's your juice. Oh, it's uh, what I've been trying to steal myself to weed out. He's a maverick, or was. What do you mean? Well, some dogs take to training, some don't. This one, well, just never did. He's unpredictable, a, a natural-born scavenger. He picked up something from the garbage with a botulism, I guess. Anyway, he died this morning. But what could a dog... Now, look, don't take on about it. I'm going down to bring up some eggs and bacon. Why don't you set the table for us on the veranda? Of course, darling. The steak. I didn't... Is that what poisoned him? Oh, God, help me to know what to do. I love my husband, but every instinct in me tells me to run. Run for my life. Yeah. Yeah, sure, J.B., no, I don't like it, but if it's the only way, I'll be there. Yes, yes, right away. No, no, I'll, I'll... I'll drive down. It's almost dark already, so I'm not taking much of a chance. What? Well, yes, thanks, yes. I'll stay with you overnight and come right back. You're going to Los Angeles? Well, just overnight, darling. But take me with you. Oh, Jenny, I can't. This is... All strictly business. And I stay here alone? I'm not alone. Lisa's with you. Oh, thank God for that. You have nothing to worry about. Of course I haven't. Uh, go, do what you have to do, and, and come back to me safe. And you stay safe for me to come back to. Well, wouldn't you know, the moment my brother cuts out, the local electricity has to fail... Here's your candle, Jenny. Want me to come in with you? No, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, there are plenty of others in the candelabra. They can burn all night. I won't need them. That good night drink we had has curdled my brain. <laughs> no, me too. I know about you, but I'm sailing. Maybe there was something in Conchita's Aros Confolio, but I'm positively lightheaded. Well, whatever it was, thank God for small favors. I'll sleep sound tonight. If I can just find the bed. Whew, I'm really high as a kite. And no reason for it. Whatever it is, don't let Conchita see me like this. See me to bed, Lisa. No. No. I don't want 
want me here. Someone, something. But who? Conchita, Juan, Richard. Oh, please, Conchita, Richard. But April, April is still in his mind. April. No, no. I don't believe. under the covers, stands as still as the girl lies in the bed. Is her presence as malign as Jenny deems it to be, or as benign as it seems to be? Hush, child, hush. I mean you no harm. But you, uh, how you must hate me, her. April, his wife. Oh, no. No, I'm not April. April is dead. She died, you know. I thought I did. Then who... I'm her mother. April was my daughter. You live here? Yes. Up there. Then you're the one I heard the other night, sobbing. Was I? Perhaps I was. I'm... Very sad, you know. Because your daughter died. Because my daughter was killed. Killed? What did April have to die for? She had everything to live for. She'd, she'd never commit suicide. But, but, but it was an accident, wasn't it? Oh, April was as graceful as a fawn. She was a dancer, you know. She had an incredible sense of balance. She could never have lost it. Are you suggesting she, she was pushed? Oh. Why do you think I'm locked up there in my room on the third floor with Conchita as my jailer? The housekeeper. Oh, Conchita is a practical nurse. And I am a, a prisoner half the time under sedation. Living in limbo, the, the shut-in to end all shut-in. But why? To keep me from crying into the skies. To keep the truth buried like, like me and my daughter. Except that I am on the third floor in April of six deep. Oh, he, he was jealous of her. He couldn't stand the fact that she was the talent. She held it all together. She made the oh. legends. And when the truth was coming out that he meant nothing, that she was the star, oh, he had to drag her out of the skies, destroy her, kill her. Who? Oh. Your new husband, Richard Morgan. That's why I came to warn you. Oh, get out while you can. Senora, tell me what right. What is it he wants to take from you? Senora Morgan, open the door. I I'm coming, Juan. What, what do you want? Are you rich? Yes. Are you coming, Senora? Then run like the wind. He will kill you. Just as he did April. Are you all right, Jenny? Are you all right? Uh, I'll do. The, the lights are on again. Yes. What happened to to April's mother? Juan has taken her back to her room. She's mad, you know. She's quite mad. She she accused Richard of killing April. It's her obsession. She should be institutionalized, but Richie, well, he could never hurt a fly. But I don't understand why. 
Now what? Headlights coming up the drive. Must be Richie. I better go down and let him in. For God's sake, don't be terrified of me, Jenny. Well, I, I don't mean to be. I, I, I don't know what's the matter with me. Look, April's mother must have shaken you. Well, why would you have kept it a secret? Look, I'm... I'm, I'm exhausted, and you... You're tired. Must we go through it tonight? I don't think we can go through any other night if we don't. Okay. It all has to do with... Well, living a legend. April was a... A star, a sex symbol developed by the studios. I was a stage actor with a gift of reasonable looks and an unusual voice. Separately, we had great success. But together, when we did get together, and particularly after our marriage, we became something not only wildly larger than life, but larger than even just plain stardom. Our own lives disappeared. Replaced by a storybook romance that our careers had to conform to. Despite the fact that we had learned, oh well, not to hate each other, but that we had no love left. You didn't love April. Jenny, I couldn't stand her. She was selfish, avaricious, demanding, petty. An impossible woman. So you... So you got rid of her? You don't believe that? No. Oh, no, Richard. But, but how did April really die? I wasn't asking no, that. you I... don't have to. Half the world has speculated on that. Her mother thought I killed her. Still think so. Conchita and Juan know it was an accident. Lisa... Lisa has her own theory. Something to do with April's star complex and the wild winds that sometimes blow across the headlands. And you? I think she committed suicide. Buenos dias, Conchita. Buenos dias, senor. You can serve breakfast for all of us, and... Where's Juan? In the South Garden. Will you tell my wife when she comes down where I am? Si, senor. Patron? Yes? Will you close up the house? If I'm going to save my new marriage, I think I must. I'm not going to argue the facts. But it's quite clear that Jenny doesn't fit here. I'll have some juice and coffee, Conchita. Si, senorita. Oh, and for Senora Morgan, too. Si, senorita. Morning, Jenny. Good morning, Lisa. Oh, heavenly day. Breakfast is on the way. Where's Richard? Oh, off on the ground somewhere. Want to go look for him? I would like to get some air. Well, then let's go. Did you uh, finally get some sleep? Yes. Well, with the new day, if you're smart, you'll make up your mind to get out of here and have Richard all to yourself. But what will you and Conchita and Juan and Mrs... Isn't that terrible? I don't even know April's mother's name. Oh, what will all of you do? Oh, life goes on. We'll manage and adjust. We might even be able to do it here in time. Oh, no, Lisa, I never could. This isn't my place. It's April. It wasn't hers either. But I thought it was originally her family's. That's why her mother is still... It was a run-down, no-account mess. The stucco peeling, the plumbing, and a diluvian, the gardens, a shamble. Richie cured all that. He's marvelous with his hands. And his imagination knows no bounds. He made Borapo what it is. It's all his. I can appreciate that, Lisa, and I know how beautiful it is, but it's dark and sinister to me. Nothing will ever change that. I remember that first evening when you took me to Seventh Heaven. Yes. That was the mark of what was wrong here. Such free, wild beauty, but somehow it was evil and destructive. Oh, Jenny, that's not fair. You went by moonlight. You knew a tragedy had occurred there, but Seventh Heaven is just what its name implies. Especially on a day like today, with no wind and the sun riding high. Come on. 
Let me show you. No, thanks. Jenny, you hold a lot of fates in your hand. Among them mine. I don't want to leave here. Give me a chance to show you. Cobwebs cleared away. It's not such a bad place to live. Conchita? Si, senor. Where is the senorita? They went out in the garden towards the water. They? Your sister and your wife. <laughs> Didn't they know breakfast was ready? I think. But the senorita Morgan seemed to want to take the senora to the water. I should not say this, but I have a, a, a sensation. You, you should go quickly after them. I really don't know why you insisted on me coming up here. I, I won't change my mind, Lisa. Even now, looking out here at that incredible view? I told you, I, I didn't like heights. You know, Jenny, you're a little person. With no stature. Well, I wouldn't quite as Like April, really, for all her cheap beauty. She just couldn't measure up. And I had to sit by and take the fact that she had cheated and stolen Richie away from me. What? My brother? Oh, does that shock you? I've loved Richie longer and deeper than all of you. How much have I gotten in return? Do you have any notion how I hated that smug, superior, super-adulated April? very surprised to find out that she didn't fall or stumble or take her life when she blew off here into eternity. She was hastened, Jenny, pushed, shoved by me, just as you're going to be. Why? Even along for what you can say. How can you hate me? Because you are far worse than April. He really didn't love her. They were a team. He was trapped. He had to stick with her. But you... No, you're different. Because he loves me? Because with you, there's no chance for me. There's no chance at all. How could there ever be? I don't have to share his bed, only his life. I could have been the one to care for him, to console him, to love him. Love him, damn you. It'll never be you. Never anyone. Please, wait, wait. You, even... you can't stand against me any more than April could. You are going over. Down the rock. Look, put that grass break no, down. the marvelous weapon. Hang on to it if you want to. Take it with you. But you're going. Then you are going. Oh, oh, oh. It's too late. It's too If I cannot have you, nobody cares. Oh, for God's sake, Lisa, what are you doing? No. Give me that. again, the old house lives up to its name. I'll be back shortly. So again.
again we return full circle to our definition of the supernatural as it applies to tonight's tale of or related to ghosts. Behavior caused by the intervention or by the action of a god on earthly affairs. Well, April Sanders was both ghost and by our modern standards, goddess. But her reign is over. And so is our up-to-date fable of Richard and Jenny. Our cast included Ruby D, Michael Wager, Terry Keene, Bryna Rayburn, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>